Chapter 76, Death by a Thousand Cuts Spatial Chi felt odd to use, but was it really that much different from the other affinities? Ashlock had made a few observations recently through his demonic eye that could see the color of the ambient Chi. He had always wondered why the Winter Wrath cultivators appeared weaker than the Evergreens even when their cultivation realm and stage were equal the same could go for the Red Claws Larry had been able to subjugate them with little effort. But he had already discovered the answer to his question when he'd learned how to create portals. He had needed an anchor of spatial chi somewhere to open the tunnel and used Stella's ambient chi the first time and then switched to his roots. He had assumed this was just for portals, but it was for almost everything to do with chi. He couldn't command earth chi to form a portal, for example. That was like commanding a fish to fly. But if he was surrounded by spatial chi, he could make portals wherever he wanted. His star core produced spatial chi on its own which had been a massive boon to his chi generation as his soul core had previously taken in the turbulent untamed chi from outside and forcefully converted it into spatial chi. Basically, what Ashlock concluded was if a cultivator fought in an environment that was abundant in their chi affinity, then they would be able to regenerate chi faster as their soul core wouldn't need to do any conversion, and their techniques would have more reach and power as they could manipulate the chi tune to their affinity all around them. If the evergreens fought within a forest, they would be surrounded by nature chi and wouldn't need to form roots out of pure chi but could command the existing roots instead. Another example could be a water chi cultivator fighting near an ocean or stream compared to in a desert. That is why the winter wraths were so weak in this warm southern climate they had to expend a lot of chi to wastefully convert their surroundings into frost chi basically turning themselves into an air conditioning unit. The red claws had been the same when they fought Larry. They were surrounded by lush forest and rivers, so the area was abundant in nature and water chi rather than fire. So what did all of this mean? Ashlock was a spatial chi user, and to make the most of being a spatial cultivator, he should stay near an area of spatial chi. Diana had previously mentioned that there were few spatial cultivators at the time, he believed she was referring to the fact that learning spatial techniques was too dangerous. However, he now knew she was referring to the fact that spatial techniques had to be cast so near the cultivator's body due to the lack of ambient spatial chi in the natural environment. Where would there even be natural spatial chi? Near a black hole? Or near those rifts that the merchants delved into? Luckily, Ashlock could get around this nonsense with his abnormal body. Short-range portals became as long as his roots spread out as wherever he could generate some spatial chi, he could cast spatial techniques. For Stella, telekinesis would be rather useless. She could use it to shoot a pebble out of her hand like a railgun, or maybe have a shield orbiting her body and blocking attacks from blind spots. But the second the item she was trying to control left her area of altered chi almost like an aura around her body it was out of her control. Ashlock got rid of these thoughts and focused on his meditation. Step one of learning a new technique was to convey to the heavens what he wanted to achieve. Hours went by as he focused on the stick in the courtyard. He felt like he was back on earth as a bored kid in class, glaring at a pencil and trying to make it move with his mind except in this world of chi, it was possible. The sun set and Ashlock began to feel sleepy so he allowed the slumber to overtake him and woke up to the chirping birds the following day. Meditating was much easier when his mind was sharp, and the sun warmed his leaves. It wasn't until midday that Ashlock almost freaked out as the stick wobbled. It hadn't been a gust, wind, or a creature trying to break out of the ground beneath the stick. He had done that with his mind. Ashlock couldn't tell if managing to make a stick wobble after only a day of meditation was good or not. Without hand gestures, it seemed harder to convey to the heavens what exactly he wanted to happen. Are hand gestures just sign language cultivators invented to talk with heaven? Ashlock mused to himself as he felt happy with his progress. He made the stick wobble but was distracted as Stella walked into the central courtyard while stretching a massive smile was plastered on her face. Tree. Stella was ecstatic as she summoned a light purple flame to her hand, the truffle worked. She then strode over and sat on the bench clearly no longer mad at him for interrupting her enlightenment. Senior Lee was right. She began as she leaned back and rested her head on his trunk, the degradation of my spirit root happened so slowly throughout my life that I didn't notice. I should have been smart enough to take cultivation more slowly and solidify my foundation. Stella watched the lighter shade of purple flame flickering in her hand with a fondness that was hard to describe. But the chi flows so smoothly throughout my body now. And I can already feel my soul core growing faster than usual. So reaching the star core will be a breeze now. Ashlock was also thrilled that the truffle worked for Stella's sake and also for his plans to build up the Ash Fallen sect. Since everyone around him was already part of the Blood Lotus sect, he would need to raise new disciples from the mortal population. 
After seeing what happened with Diana, he also wanted to avoid demonic cultivators. The spirit root improving truffle was the key to his sex future. Now all he needed was for the Red Claws to learn how to read the ancient runic text, and then he could command them to go out and source him new disciples. Stella's eyes then drifted across the central courtyard and naturally noticed the wobbling stick due to her supernatural senses. Tree, are you trying to learn telekinesis? Ashlock flashed his leaf once to convey yes. Stella nodded to herself, that's a great idea. Of all the spatial techniques, I feel telekinesis would be perfect for you. She trailed off at the end with a slight frown forming on her face. Say, Tree, you will still need me around even if you could speak, right? Ashlock wished Stella would discard her silly insecurity, but it made some sense in retrospect. He was a man-eating tree, and although he had shown intelligence, in her eyes, he was likely still just a very smart tree that lacked human emotions. He flashed his leaf to show his answer was yes. Now, he was even more determined to learn telekinesis to write a message on the wall without using a corpse's blood. No matter how desensitized a person was to death, Ashlock doubted he could convey his affection through words written in the blood of others on a wall. Stella seemed very content with his answer and decided to lie back down on the bench, and with a flash of gold, a leather-bound book engraved with the golden text Spatial Techniques of the Azure Clan once again appeared in her hand. To Ashlock's surprise, she seemed engaged in the book this time, mouthing the words to herself with far less confusion. So, even though her enlightenment had been interrupted, had she gained some greater understanding of those flowery words? She then reached the chapter about telekinesis and read aloud, likely for his benefit. Chapter 2 Basic Technique, Telekinesis, Stella said with far more confidence than last time. Once a spatial cultivator has manifested their ego in the form of a soul core under a particular domain, and the heavens have acknowledged the chosen path, they are ready to enforce their will upon the world and the easiest way to achieve that is through telekinesis. Ashlock felt silly being told telekinesis was the beginner technique when he had jumped straight to portals. Telekinesis is the ability to manipulate an object's relation to the spatial plane. Stella continued, first, the cultivator must isolate and detach the object from the world by wrapping it in spatial chi. Only then can the object be manipulated according to the cultivator's will. The leather-bound book slammed shut as Stella set it aside and found a pebble nestled in the purple grass at her feet. She picked it up and then sat cross-legged on the bench. She rotated the pebble in her hand and glared at it as spatial chi flowed around her. Ashlock was surprised the book had given him a vital clue. Honestly, he had been lost on how to move the stick with his chi. He hadn't been some astrophysicist back on Earth just an average guy with good grades. So when faced with the problem of conveying to heaven how exactly he wanted to move a stick with his mind, the first solution he tried was getting his root close enough and shoving a lot of spatial chi at it. That had made the stick wobble but not float like he wanted. However, the wobbling had given him a false sense of progress, making him think he was on the correct path. I should have just waited and asked Stella to read me the book somehow, everything makes a lot more sense now. Ashlock felt dumb, but to be fair, spatial magic was a lot less intuitive than a more straightforward element like Earth. The book had once again reminded him of the spatial plane's existence, something he had heard about before. His portals utilized the spatial plane by connecting two locations and tearing a rift through the spatial plane to connect them. Why he hadn't thought that the spatial plane was responsible for more than just portals and could be applied to everything was an oversight on his part. Focusing on his meditation, he channeled spatial chi through his root near the stick, making an area of dense spatial chi. Of course, the stick began to wobble as its spatial anchor in this world was tested as dense spatial chi world around it Ashlock had thought if he pushed enough spatial chi at the stick like a gust of air, he would be able to make it float but what he was supposed to do was wrap the stick in a vacuum seal of spatial chi to cut it off from this world. It took some time, as he had to convey his will to the heavens, but with a lot more of a plan in mind, it only took an hour until the stick had been successfully sealed off from the world and with its new anchor linked to the spatial plane that was under Ashlock's control anywhere his body was. At this point, it felt as easy as dragging the object across a phone screen and watching it move. You did it. Stella shouted as her eyes snapped open to see a stick flying around the courtyard like a witchless broomstick. As the stick was coated in his spatial chi, Ashlock used it to create a portal right in front of it, and before long, he had the stick popping in and out of tiny portals across the central courtyard with pops of air. He brought the stick up to the wall and tried to mirror writing, but his control over telekinesis was a bit lacking it felt like trying to write on a whiteboard with a pen duct taped onto the end of a mop. However, with some effort, he wrote with the stick's sap you are family to me. But the writing was sloppy. 
Stella was clapping and cheering for him despite his poor control, which he found rather sweet. He needed a little more practice, so Ashlock thought about what to do. While he mused to himself, Stella carefully translated his sloppy words, and he saw a tear run down her cheek and over her light smile. Thank you, Tree. You are family to me too. She said and ran over and hugged him. But your writing is so crappy. She giggled to herself as she broke the hug and wiped the tear, I almost couldn't translate it. Ashlock patted her on the shoulder with the stick in an attempt to return the hug. His control may need some work, but it was the little steps that mattered. A while passed, and eventually, Stella calmed down. All of her self-doubts seemed to have vanished, which made Ashlock happy. But he still felt frustrated about his lack of control with telekinesis. He looked around for something other than the stick which could allow him to practice. What about leaves? Ashlock had the idea of turning his leaves into flying blades to kill the birds long ago, and now it could be made a reality. He could use spatial magic to sever his leaves from his body and use them, but cutting off his body parts to hurl at people seemed counterproductive. Casting eye of the tree god, he zoomed away from the mountain and into the forest. Despite being late afternoon, it was mid-July, so summer was full swing. He searched the forest near the stairway to the mountain peak but couldn't find much wildlife. Did the sudden surge of demonic trees scare off all the wildlife? Ashlock wondered as he continued to fail to find anything other than birds. Deciding to search the forests east of the mountain with all the small villages and where Larry had hunted the now eradicated Winterrath and Evergreen families. He passed over a few villages, and much like Dark Light City, people were cooped up in their houses and refusing to venture outside. Once the Red Claws move in, I will have them return life to normal well, at least close to normal, Ashlock thought as he continued searching for prey. Eventually, near the border wall that lacked any guards, Ashlock found a monster. It was a weird insectoid thing that looked like a mantis and stood over eight feet tall. It seemed to be hunting something slashing away at a hole in the ground covered with a stone. Ashlock could tell something was alive under the rock through the mycelium network, but his roots weren't quite close enough to describe it. Might be a squirrel or something. Ashlock didn't really care. He had found a mid-stage Chi Realm beast to practice his flying leaves technique. Ashlock returned his sights to Red Vine Peak, opened a portal in the central courtyard, and used the stick to point at it. You want me to go through? Stella asked, and the stick moved as if nodding. All right. Stella shrugged and made her way through. She popped through and gasped as she saw the monster standing before the wall. She glanced over her shoulder and saw the eastern side of Red Vine Peak. A monster over the walls? Do you want me to kill it? Thankfully Stella didn't rush in and kill the monster, even when it slowly turned as it noticed her. It was rather funny how calm Stella looked, with her relaxed posture while facing a monster that towered over her. If this mantis existed back on Earth, Stella wouldn't stand a chance even with a gun, but in a world of cultivation, a big body or lethal blade for arms didn't matter when Stella could kill the oversized insect with a GM-powered flick. Ashlock's crackle of spatial power severed hundreds of leaves from a nearby tree by opening and collapsing a portal. Ashlock watched in amusement as the insect backed up toward the wall after detecting his star core realm chi. He wrapped the leaves one by one as quickly as possible the insect was on the run, but it didn't matter. It began to scale the wall with its large wings beating wildly, but it was useless it hadn't even gotten a tenth of the way up the wall before leaves coated in lilac flames shot through the air causing sonic booms and ripping its body apart. Dark green blood stained the grey stone wall as the insectoid body pinned by leaves slowly fell and crumpled on the forest floor below with a thump. Feeling proud of himself, Ashlock looked back at Stella, expecting to see her surprise at his new capabilities, but she hadn't even seen it. She was too busy crouching down near the hole covered with a rock. Ashlock could hear some wailing from within and was just as curious as Stella about what was inside. She pushed the rock to the side and revealed one of the last things Ashlock expected to see so close to the wall and far from civilization. How the hell did he even get here? Chapter 77, Annoying Mortals Stella detected with her spiritual sense that Tree had dealt with the monster, so she focused wholeheartedly on the stone that had drawn her interest. Other than hearing a soft sobbing sound from beneath the stone, she could detect something alive below it. Removing the stone was a trivial affair it was lighter than she had initially thought from its looks, and the fact the soil around it had already been partially dug out from the insect monster allowed her to get some grip. As she pushed the stone to the side, the wailing stopped for a second, and Stella came face to face with a human child the boy was deathly pale, gaunt from lack of food, and his lips were cracked from no water. He was shaking and caked in mud as if he had been buried alive. 
Hey! Stella said as softly as she could, the monster is gone. Are you all right? The child blinked, more from the sudden sunlight than her words. She moved her body a bit to the side to shade the poor boy and tried to carefully pull him from the damp hole. He resisted at first, trying to look past her to see if the monster was really gone. It's already dead, see. Stella gestured to the insect's corpse and maintained her gentle tone. Honestly, this was the first time she had ever interacted with a child, so she wasn't sure how to proceed. Should I look for his parents somehow? Stella thought as she scanned the treeline but couldn't see anything. Miss, did you kill the M monster? The child's mumblings brought Stella out of her stupor, and she offered the child a reassuring smile of course, she hadn't actually killed the insect herself, but explaining to the boy that a spirit tree had killed it with leaves from a mountain away seemed like more of a pain than it was worth. I did. Stella nodded and swore she felt an intense gaze on her neck. It's all safe now, so there's no need to be scared, where are your parents? Are you a cultivator, miss? The boy gripped her clothing and sounded far too excited, a real one. Yes, but... Can you teach me? The boy wouldn't even let her finish a single sentence. Stella held back the urge to push the child back into the hole and walk off. Listen. Stella placed a finger on the boy's lips to stop his blabbering, what is your name? Sam. He shouted as he shoved her hand aside with his feeble strength. I want to be strong too and kill scary monsters like you. And protect Papa and my little sisters. As much as Stella appreciated the child's enthusiasm, she had no interest in taking on a disciple she paused, and her eyes widened as the realization hit her she was supposed to be running a sect. What use was a sect without disciples? If anything, this was a heaven-given opportunity. Well Sam, let me check if you have the potential for cultivation, Stella said with a light smile and she could practically see the stars of excitement in the half-dead boy's eyes that were reddened from tears. Stella put two fingers around the boy's bony wrist and closed her eyes to avoid looking at Sam's expectant expression. She injected a tiny bit of chi, and she could feel the boy shiver in her grasp. As she cycled the chi through the boy's body, she couldn't help but frown. His spiritual roots were non-existent, so his chance of becoming a cultivator was, zero. Well, almost zero. Of course, there were ways to forcefully create spirit roots within a person's body, but it was never worth the effort. The boy had lacked the potential to be a cultivator since birth he could still absorb some ambient chi, but there was no hope for him to cultivate enough chi to form a soul core. Stella released the boy's grasp with a sigh, but her heart tightened seeing his childlike excitement and hope. It's better to lie to him now while he's in such a weak state and then clarify what I mean later. I mean, Sam technically can still cultivate. He just won't get very far. You can cultivate, Stella said with a weak smile, and Sam practically flew out of her arms in excitement but immediately fell flat on his face with a groan as his frail body failed him. Stella shook her head as she retrieved a fruit and water skin from her spatial ring placing them both beside the groaning boy's head. She then looked around. Hey tree, what should I do? She whispered to a random nearby tree but then felt silly. There was no answer. She crossed her arms and drummed her fingers as she sighed. This was annoying she felt responsible for the child now, but she had no idea which village to ask first or where the nearest one was. Also, the idea of speaking to people she had never spoken with before felt, daunting. Was she scared of talking to mortals? Would they find her weird? Sam. Where are you Sam? Stella's head snapped toward the shouting, and with her enhanced senses, she could see a group of mortals moving toward her, following a floating, stick. She couldn't help but roll her eyes at Tree's nonsense. Then, feeling a bit skittish, she got herself together by slapping her cheek. Just act aloof and move on quickly, Stella muttered as she walked back toward the boy and assumed a leaning against Tree pose with her eyes closed. Moments later, the group of mortals broke the tree lean. Sam. The same voice she had heard before shouted with far more gusto, and then Stella heard running. Barry, get back. A woman shouted likely this berry fellow's wife by her tone. Stella slowly opened her eyes and looked at four middle-aged villagers one by one. They were all holding farming equipment. A wooden-handled scythe, two rusting pitchforks, and one heavily used spade. The man she quickly identified as Barry had paused mid-stride and was eyeing her as if she were some monster the battered spade trembling in his grip. There was a moment of awkward silence as they stared at each other, and Stella hated to admit it, but her mind had gone blank. She had no idea what to say. Papa. Sam croaked from the ground, 
but Barry didn't dare to break eye contact, much to Stella's growing anxiety. To be fair, the entire situation did look bad now that Stella thought about it from their point of view, they couldn't see the dead monster off to the side, nor the fruit and water skin she had placed beside Sam. Stella could only huff in annoyance and rolled her eyes again as Barry shrank back while eyeing her cautiously. Sick of the silence and seeing that Barry's wife was about to try and speak, Stella decided to wisen up and take charge of the situation. Took you long enough. I have matters to attend to back at the sect, so now that you're here, I can leave the child in your care. Stella then nodded toward the wall dyed with green blood in the distance, the monster that had almost eaten the child has been disposed of. If there is nothing else, I shall be on my way. Stella then tried very hard to keep her straight face as all the villages turned to look at the dead monster, let out shocked gasps, and then snapped back to look at her with or rather than fear. Barry walked forward and bowed deeply, which was awkward considering the size difference, Miss Cultivator, may I please ask what happened to the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families? Without their protection, we have suffered greatly. His voice was stained with nerves, and his hands were clenched at his sides. Stella surveyed the other villagers' reactions, but they also seemed worried. Again, she decided to lie for now. They were assigned new posts by the Patriarch. Soon, two other families will move into the area to take over their duties. Barry straightened his back and sighed with relief. Who are these families if you don't mind me asking? Red Claw A and D. Stella paused. Should she use Crestfallen her family name that would be familiar to them or start spreading the Ashfallen sex name? They would need to begin recruiting people under their sex sooner rather than later, and keeping a low profile would only work for so long. But I told the Red Claws that the Ashfallen sect was a secret, so exposing ourselves so soon might be counterproductive. Stella offered the man an apologetic smile. I cannot mention the name of the other family for now, but I can say I'm a part of them. Barry seemed unconvinced but nodded anyway. I see. Well, I can only thank you for saving my son. Unfortunately, I have nothing of value to offer. Stella's eye twitched. She hadn't wanted any of this, and the last thing she desired was some reward from a mortal. I didn't even kill the monster. All I did was overturn the stone. Stella cursed in her head but didn't show her irritation. No need. I will be off now. Stella said, and the villages nodded respectfully to her. A quick glance at them confirmed none of these mortals possessed the potential for cultivation, as they were all stuck at the first stage of the Chi realm despite being late into their lives. Building a sect might be harder than she thought, basically anyone with a slither of potential to cultivate had been sent to the Blood Lotus Sex Academies, where they were trained to become cannon fodder, guards, or servants to the families. So the chance of her stumbling upon a villager with a talent for cultivation was unlikely. The lingering earthy taste of the spirit root improvement truffle made her think Tree might have a plan or ability to make cultivators out of talentless villagers, but it was a long shot. The Dark Light City did have an academy, and since they were now the rulers of the area, they could pinch the cultivators from there, but it was a massive headache as the academies were run by the Blood Lotus sect rather than whichever family was ruling the area so they would start asking questions as to why they were taking the cultivators away and get the rest of the sect involved. From what Stella had gathered from talking a lot with Diana, the Blood Lotus sect was a collection of families under one banner led by the strongest member, the Patriarch. They competed for resources, and the Patriarch didn't care so long as all the cities run smoothly. Having one family eradicated was fine. But Stella doubted the Patriarch would remain idle if he knew the Evergreen and Winter Wrath families had also perished as the Blood Lotus sect was now significantly weakened. Usually, Red Vine Peak would be doomed, but Ash is an intelligent tree, so it changed things. Instead of being a single star core cultivator with a limited area of control and a fleshy body that could be impaled by a sword, Ash was far more durable and had a much wider scope of control, meaning he could face off more people at once. The dead monster was a good example. Red Vine Peak was far away, yet this monster had died to a threat it couldn't see. Even if I reached the Star Core Realm, I doubt I could do that, as I wouldn't even know the monster was here. Ash can be truly terrifying when he wants to be. Stella blinked as she realized she had been momentarily lost in thought. Because the villagers had brought up how the lack of cultivators affected their lives, Stella realized this situation was a little more out of hand than she'd thought. Miss Cultivator Sam croaked out from the side as he weakly rolled over and faced her. Stella just raised a brow in response at the boy she was rather bored dealing with this farce. She wanted to return to Red Vine Peak to cultivate and maybe check on Diana to see if she was doing fine in the mine. None of these mortals had talent or use, and their questions ruined her mood. The child returned an innocent smile, 
miss, you said I can be a cultivator, right? Stella ignored the villager's shock and replied with a nod. Why couldn't he have just kept his mouth shut? How can I cultivate to be strong like you? Well, the answer was simple he couldn't. But this was already annoying enough, and Stella had no interest in chucking a cultivation manual at his forehead to shut him up, so she just pointed into the distance. You see that mountain? I live up there. If you grow up big and strong and can climb to the top of that mountain, then I will tell you the secret. The idea that such a scrawny and half-dead child could climb one of the tallest mountains in the Blood Lotus sect without any cultivation was laughable, so Stella felt relatively confident she wouldn't see the scrawny boy anytime soon. Before they could ask any more questions, Stella whispered under her breath. Ash, open a portal behind me. An intense ripple of spatial chi made her hair flutter, and the villages stumbled back with yelps. A rift in space formed behind Stella, and she could see the distorted courtyard and Ash's black trunk through it. Letting out a sigh of relief, she stepped through, and with a pop, she left those annoying mortals behind. Her body quickly adapted to the wind chill and different climate at the top of a mountain compared to being down in the forest, and she eyed the bench under Ash's inviting canopy. The portal collapsed behind her, and Stella relished in the silence. Although she had only been gone for a bit, that experience had taken far more out of her than she thought reasonable. Walking over and laying back on the bench. Stella felt the cool wood on her exposed thighs and shoulders. She frowned and looked up at the rustling red leaves overhead with unpleasant thoughts about the future. Running a sect is going to be so annoying. Chapter 78, Demonic Form Ashlock watched the villagers converse with each other excitedly after Stella returned to the central courtyard and the rift in space closed. After that discussion, he had naturally amped up magic truffle production as he could tell things would get busy soon. He still didn't know the limits of alchemy combined with his fruit and mushroom production abilities, so he wouldn't rule out being able to turn a talentless villager into a cultivator, but it would be resource intensive. For example, why would he sacrifice his own cultivation growth to accelerate the development of more truffles and fruit just to turn some random villager into a cultivator? It would only be worth it if he couldn't obtain a cultivator any other way. But he would rather use those resources to improve the spiritual roots of an already established cultivator that had been practicing for many years than level up a talentless villager, as time was not on his side. The beast tide was coming, and this area would soon turn into a hellscape. From his understanding, even after the beast tide had passed, other demonic sects would come to claim the land and establish a new sect here. Without cultivators on his side, he will forever be surrounded by enemies. Even if his roots spread throughout the valley, he couldn't fight off an invading demonic sect alone. Ashlock hummed as the villagers picked up their scrawny child and carried him toward the village. Interestingly, Ashlock recognized one of the villagers as the mortal Larry had spared the first time. Running a sect is going to be so annoying, Stella grumbled from the bench. Dealing with cultivators is easy enough as we can speak with our blades, but trying to be nice to mortals is hard. Stella reminded Ashlock of his introverted friends that had to spend a few days recovering after a big social event. Her arm covered her closed eyes as if she had a migraine, and she looked absolutely beat. Was it really that bad? Ashlock wondered. He felt she had handled the situation rather well from looking on. Stella seemed content on just laying there and recovering. Even Maple had gone and fallen asleep on her head, so he looked for something else to do. He was still itching to test his S-rank Mystic Realm skill, but he was waiting for Diana to hopefully recover before trying an unknown, dangerous skill. Switching to his root vision, he descended the mountain and looked into the cavern. He sighed in relief as he watched Diana still beating the shit out of Bob the Slime. Ha! Huh. Diana hollered as she delivered a brutal roundhouse kick that sent Bob flying halfway across the cavern. The slime convulsed as it flew like a water balloon hit with a hammer Ashlock pulled back on the root link to the slime to stop Bob from slamming into the wall. As Bob rolled for a few meters before stopping, Ashlock noticed the slime had turned from lilac to pitch black as demonic chi swirled around the jelly body. Compared to his spatial chi, which had been very stable within the slime, the demonic chi reminded him of those storms that plagued Jupiter. They were violent, erratic, and destructive. It was fascinating that Bob's body could even adapt to housing demonic chi. Ashlock had no idea how Diana had survived for even an hour, let alone days, with this demonic chi inside her body. Looking closer at the black-haired girl, her eyes had returned to their usual dull grey, and the spider web of black lines covering her entire body was faded but still visible if someone looked closely. So why are her flames still contaminated with darkness? Ashlock mused as he saw her dash across the cavern with a kick and punch the demonic slime with a wrathful punch. 
Her strength had increased since he last saw her, that was for sure. An hour passed with more brutal one-sided combat as Bob no longer had any capabilities of fighting back, and Ashlock came to a terrifying conclusion. Has she found a way to harness the demonic chi without it killing her? Seeing Diana's dark blue flames mixed with the darkness of the demonic chi working in perfect harmony across her body reminded Ashlock of yin and yang. Suddenly Diana stumbled to the side falling to the ground and managing to get into a cross-legged position despite the slime looming over her. She closed her eyes and began to meditate. Ashlock reeled the slime back and was glad he could still control the thing. Is she breaking through? Ashlock saw Chi begin to gather around Diana in a torrent. He knew Diana had been struggling in the sixth stage of the Soul Fire Realm for years now with a very significant bottleneck. Even after going cold turkey on Beast Corps after first meeting Stella, she had been unable to overcome this bottleneck no matter what she did. Was it finally happening? Had she found a way to overcome the bottleneck that had threatened to stunt her growth until she grew old and withered away into dust? Ashlock was worried. Would the demonic chi lurking in her body interfere with the ascension? I guess I can only wait and see. Dot. In an attempt to help out, Ashlock pumped some water from the mycelium network through his roots. The cavern was filled with dripping sounds as sappy water came from hundreds of roots across the cavern ceiling. Diana's expression was intense, and her breathing erratic, but she seemed to appreciate the gesture as the water chi all around joined the torrent. A while passed, and Ashlock could tell she had broken through the bottleneck as chi exploded in a wave with her as the epicenter and shook the cavern causing bits of the ceiling to fall. Luckily he had reinforced the cavern with his roots, so there wasn't a total collapse. But what happened next surprised him wings of feathered darkness sprouted from her shoulder blades, each thrice her size, claws of shadow materialized around her hands like gloves, and her eyes went black. She wailed like a tortured soul as she stood up. As she stumbled forward, demonic chi swirled around her body in a fierce mist. For some reason, Ashlock felt, unnerved. It didn't make sense even if she broke through to the seventh stage of the soul fire realm, she should still be far below him regarding cultivation so why did he feel hunted? It was an instinctual fear as if he were facing down a predator. Even though he knew he had the equivalent of a loaded gun in his back pocket that would guarantee victory, his non-existent heart still thumped in his chest. Through the dark mist, he could only make out the outline of Diana's demonic humanoid shape as the howls continued she prowled forward through the mist like a predator and then pounced toward Bob with a fiendish pace. Bob's skin was pierced, and two claws that didn't resemble human hands, more like bird claws, were thrust inside Ashlock then felt the demonic chi inside Bob rush toward the hands as if Diana was trying to absorb all the demonic chi. Do I stop her? Ashlock could flood Bob with plenty of spatial chi to get Diana away, but should he? Was Diana absorbing demonic chi a good or bad thing here? Deciding to wait and see, a while passed. Bob had almost all of the demonic chi that had been stored up inside drained. To maintain control, Ashlock had no choice but to refill the slime slowly with spatial chi which eventually forced Diana to take her clawed hands out. The fiendish howls and inhuman movements continued as combat resumed. Ashlock had to overload Bob with spatial magic and hold the slime with his roots so Diana's chains of attacks didn't destroy Bob in seconds. Demonic chi transfer to Bob occurred in the same way as before but at a much faster rate. The cavern continued to tremble as Bob was kicked through the black mist and pulled back in. All Ashlock could see the entire time was Diana's outline which included two feathered wings and claws. Eventually, Diana left Bob alone, and the dark mist that had obscured her body dissipated into the air. Ashlock saw her crumble to the floor like a puppet cut from its strings, and she fell asleep. Her body had returned to normal, and even her clothes were unscathed. There was no sign of any demonic chi corruption nor her weird demonic form. Ashlock let out a long sigh of relief. If someone had told him that the demonic form he'd just witnessed in that dark mist was an illusion or dream, he'd have believed them. Even the shirt around her shoulders showed no signs of holes for wings. Had the demonic chi influenced her mist ability to an even higher level than when she was first infected with demonic chi? Ashlock mused to himself. When she first used her illusionary mist technique after becoming infected with demonic chi, the laughing delusions that tricked the mind and enraged cultivators into acting on impulse had morphed into howling fiends. Had it simply upgraded and given Diana an illusionary form to make her seem more intimidating, or was it something else? Ashlock didn't know. He kept tabs on Diana for a little longer to ensure she was fine, and after confirming she was sound asleep and wasn't going to suddenly turn into some undead ghoul, he could finally relax. 
Ashlock spent the rest of the day practicing telekinesis in the central courtyard by trying to write on the wall. Stella had spent the afternoon sorting through the many spatial rings from the invading cultivators she had unlocked while searching for beast cores for Diana. She now wore four golden rings two on each hand containing all the items she deemed necessary to loot. One of the rings flashed with golden light, and a stick of black chalk manifested in her hand. She threw it out into the air as she lay slothfully on the bench, and Ashlock caught it with telekinesis. Stella lay on her side while keeping her eyes on the white pavilion wall opposite. She seemed to still be recovering from her social interaction with the mortals or maybe just taking a well-deserved break. She had been cultivating and fighting non-stop for a while now, and with Diana sleeping down in the mine, there was a brief moment of calm. The black chalk stick paused before the wall as Ashlock struggled to figure out what to say or ask. Then he thought of Diana. Stella hadn't seen the girl for a while nor knew of her recovery, so he decided to inform her. Diana has recovered and broken through to the seventh stage. Stella let out a long sigh of relief and grinned. I'm so glad. She is a great friend and ally. I can't imagine having to run a sect without her. Considering she seemed to handle the mortals so well from his point of view, he decided to ask about it. Why did I find speaking to the mortals so exhausting? Stella hummed for a while and then answered while looking up at his canopy. I have hardly talked to anyone other than Diana my entire life, and the mortals are just so different from me. Stella chuckled. You saw how they looked at me as if I were some kind of monster. They didn't see me as a fellow human being not that I blame them. We treat mortals like insects. It's ingrained in our minds from the start. There was a pause, and then she continued, When I was very young, I was surrounded by mortal servants that would do my bidding despite the fact I was just a child, and my father would always point at the wrinkled old maid that went around the courtyards groaning about having a bad back and told me that's what separated mortals and cultivators. We never become weak like that with time so long as we keep cultivating. Ashlock had to admit it was an interesting dynamic. Stella and Diana looked and talked like humans, but the fact they could live far longer and run around at supersonic speeds naturally separated them from the mortals in feudal society. It didn't help that the cultivators could lord over the mortals without repercussions out here in the wilderness, as without the cultivators, the mortals would perish to the beasts, so any kind of revolt was impossible. Maybe it's different in the Celestial Empire. Ashlock mused, it sounded much more civilized from what Senior Lee described, although that old man did say he preferred it out here. Ashlock was briefly lost in his thoughts when there was a sudden rush of water, and Diana shot out from his hollowed-out route that led down into the mines with a splash. She landed gracefully and offered Stella a weary smile as she collected all the water in a swirling ball above her palm. Sorry to have worried you, Stella. Diana then turned to look at Ashlock and clasped her hands, you too, Patriarch. I appreciate your assistance with my matter. She then gave a 90-degree bow toward the towering tree. Ashlock hadn't been mad at her, but he appreciated the apology nonetheless. Stella jumped up from the bench and gave Diana a tight and quick hug. I was so worried about you. Diana grumbled another apology, and the two returned to the bench and caught up on what had occurred while Diana had been insane. It was rather funny watching Diana's facial expressions as Stella recalled her being chained to Ashlock and how she screamed for multiple days and nights straight. They talked throughout the night, and Diana confirmed she was okay. The demonic chi is suppressed and under control, but if I push myself that far again, I will likely enter that insane state again, Diana explained and offered a reassuring smile. But I can always beat the slime up again to return to normal. Ashlock decided to ask about that demonic form she took by writing on the wall. Ashlock asks about feathered wings and claws you had down in the mine. Stella calmly translated and raised a brow at the message. Well, that sounds like an interesting story. Diana slowly nodded in agreement, with confusion written all over her face. Feathered wings? I don't remember ever having anything like that. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System. Day, 3478. Daily Credit, 4. Sacrifice Credit, 0. Sign in. The sun crested over the horizon, and Ashlock's sign in system popped up. With such few points to spend, he naturally dismissed the notification, but it had reminded him of something. His desire to test his new S rank skill Mystic Realm. Ashlock then asked the two girls if they were well rested and ready to watch him test his most powerful skill yet. Stella seemed genuinely annoyed when he mentioned he had no idea what his new skill could do. Fine, Stella grumbled as she rose from the bench summoned a sword to her waiting hand, and took a combat stance. Her cultivation flared up, 
and light purple flames coated her form. But I am taking no chances this time. Diana gave a nod of approval with a hint of jealousy as she noticed Stella's improved spirit root. Stella just rolled her eyes in response, you will get to improve your spirit root as well. Ashlock made sure to wake Larry up from his slumber and even shouted enough at Maple to cause the squirrel to stir from his deep sleep. The squirrel seemed annoyed but also intrigued at what was happening. With the whole gang ready to go, Ashlock brought up his skill menu. He felt like a president about to launch a tactical nuclear strike for some reason. Well, here goes nothing. Ashlock activated his ability, and everything changed. A dense white fog filled with weird celestial flakes swirled around the central courtyard swallowing his sect members, and before Ashlock knew it, everyone was gone except for him. He remained rooted in place, but neither his spiritual sense nor demonic eye could see the group through the fog. Guys! Ashlock shouted even trying to pull on his tether with Larry, but there was no response. Where did they go? Left with no other option, Ashlock sent his roots to surge out of the ground and into the perpetual fog in search of them. He demanded answers and wanted to discover what the hell this mystic realm was all about. Chapter 79, Trapped Far From Home Unlike a usual fog that would spread out and dissipate, the mystic realm fog stayed in a small compact area around half the size of the central courtyard. Considering it was an S-grade ability Ashlock was baffled. There had to be so much more to it than a simple fog blocking his senses. Panic had naturally set in Estella, Diana, Larry, and even Maple, who might be in a higher realm than him hadn't returned from the fog. The stone in the central courtyard cracked and fell aside as black roots surged from within the mountain and into the dense fog. Ashlock tried to sense anything through his roots, but they felt numb as if he'd dipped his toes in freezing water. The fog began to sparkle with a myriad of colors as if someone had dumped glitter into it. Ashlock's numb roots then began to feel different sensations. One felt burning hot, another in warm water, another in sand. It was beyond perplexing, as Ashlock had no idea what was happening inside the fog. He tried to control the fog and bring it closer to his trunk so he could get a better look, but it refused to budge. Everything about this skill was beyond confusing, and Ashlock felt frustrated at his inability to help. Stella inwardly cursed as a strange white fog that cut off all her senses enveloped her. She looked down at her feet, which felt weightless the floor was gone. There was only a ghostly fog that swirled around her feet. Was she standing on a cloud? Diana, what is going on? Stella realized Diana wasn't standing beside her anymore. She desperately looked around, but only the weird white fog could be seen. Finally, after frantically searching for Diana and coming up with nothing, she stepped forward hesitantly and began wandering through the swirling fog. Tree. Diana. Anyone. She shouted into the fog all around her, but nobody responded. It was eerie. She held her sword tightly in her grip as her heart pounded in her chest. Then her surroundings began to change the white fog became filled with flakes of shattered glass that gleamed and showed tiny bits of scenery. Some pieces were tiny, no larger than a speck of dust, but others were the size of her hand. One of these larger ones drifted by, and Stella caught a glimpse of a lightning storm within as if she were looking through a tiny window into another world. Curious, Stella reached out and poked it as the shard floated by. She then yelped as the hard floor she had been standing on vanished from beneath her, and in blinding light, she dropped down. Blinking the blinding light away, Stella found herself standing on a grey surface all around were black clouds flashing with lightning. Thunder roared in her ears, and hail rushed upwards like a reverse waterfall. All right, where in the Nine Realms is this? Stella yelled, and only the roaring thunder replied. Moments ago, she had been enjoying a pleasant morning in the central courtyard atop Red Vine Peak. Then Ash had wanted to test a new technique and now she was in some weird upside-down world inside a storm. She was all alone, and no matter where she looked, there was no sign of Diana, Maple, or even Larry. The grey surface below her trembled, and then she heard a terrifying roar. The sturdy ground beneath her vibrated and shifted as if it were alive. Then, looking behind her, she saw the grey surface tilt upwards and reveal a tail the size of a mountain. At this moment, Stella realized she wasn't standing on land, as she had been moving this entire time. It had just been hard to tell without a point of reference. Stella clamped her mouth shut and hoped the supersized sky whale she stood on would forget about her. A while passed, and the trembling stopped. While waiting, she had desperately looked around but couldn't find a way out of this place. The weird fog had vanished, and she hadn't learned her portal technique yet. Ash, have you sent me here to die? Stella muttered as her hands clenched. She then shook her head. 
If Ash's new technique was really that dangerous, she was confident he would find a way to bring her back with time. He considers you family, there's no way he would send you here to die, Stella quietly convinced herself. All she needed to do was wait, make the best of this disaster, and turn it into an opportunity. With a sigh, Stella decided to sit down cross-legged and cultivate. She had enough food within her spatial ring to last years and could always melt the upside-down hail into water. Closing her eyes, she began to meditate and try to connect with heaven. Unfortunately, the whispers of heaven's will were once again difficult to understand, and Stella sincerely wished she had another truffle to make the greatest use of this opportunity. After a while, she had to stop cultivating, as her soul core was overwhelmed. Phew, the chi is so dense here. Is this an upper realm or something? Stella wondered aloud as her body overflowed with power. I should be careful. If I cultivate too much pure chi like this, I'll find it difficult to continue cultivating with that weaker chi if I ever return to Red Vine Peak. While taking a break, Stella watched the clouds flashing with lightning. She knew for a fact that the lightning deo was intoxicating here. So, with her soul core overflowing with power, she coated herself in purple flames and reached out her hand. She paused briefly as she prepared for the pain even with her Deo comprehension of lightning, it was undoubtedly a no pain, no gain type of Deo to contemplate. Well, here goes nothing. Stella closed her eyes and tried to call the lightning to her. For better or worse, it answered. Like when Ashlock formed his star core, Stella's hand became the focal point for all the lightning in the area. After just a few strikes hit her hand, she could already feel her flesh burning and had to pop a low-grade healing pill to endure the pain. Diana breathed out a cloud of vapor due to the cold as she stood upon a tiny iceberg the size of a small courtyard. She surveyed the perfectly calm waters surrounding her in all directions until the horizon. Is this a pocket realm? Diana mused to herself as she tried to ignore the panic rising in her chest. She knew her spatial ring didn't have many supplies for an extended stay inside such a perilous place. Cultivators could survive for a long time without food or water, but Diana wasn't in the star core realm so her need for sustenance hadn't been fully overcome yet. Getting down on her knees, she plunged her head into the icy water and was amazed at its clarity. The crystal clear waters gave her a full view of the endless nothingness below her tiny iceberg. It was just a void of water that got darker the deeper she looked. There wasn't a single fish in sight, nor the ocean floor. She whipped her head back out of the water and frowned. Is this entire world nothing but ocean? Diana mused as she collected the water from her hair into a chi ball above her palm and dumped it back into the ocean. Rubbing her chin in deep thought, Diana came to a conclusion. Out of those weird shards within the fog that gave glimpses of other worlds, she had felt the most compelled to grab onto this one, likely from its extreme amount of water chi, which her body was naturally drawn toward. Deciding there was nothing for her to do in this situation, she sat down on the iceberg and began to meditate. A long time passed, and Diana felt overwhelmed with power. Although she had just broken into the seventh stage, she felt herself closing in on the bottleneck for the eighth stage, as the chi here was so pure. She then noticed something odd as she breathed out and fully emerged from her zen-like state. The ocean was, gone. The iceberg was on the ocean floor, which was nothing but black mud. The clouds that had dotted the sky suddenly looked so far away as she gazed up. Diana stood and stepped off the iceberg with a squelch as the muddy ocean floor splattered on her clothes and enveloped her shoe like quicksand. Using her cultivation, she could extract the moisture out of the mud around her, making it hard enough to walk upon. Looking all around, she couldn't see anything but black mud in all directions, so she decided to walk in a random direction and began wandering the endless mud flats. Eventually, she stumbled upon a group of sparkling rocks buried under the mud. She had only noticed one of the rocks, as a tiny piece stuck out from the black mud and was made very obvious. Naturally, she summoned a sword to her hand and cautiously approached the suspicious rock. Then, with the very tip of her sword, she tapped the sparking rock, and the entire ground trembled. Expected as much, Diana commented in a dull tone as she stepped back and watched the mud explode. Hundreds of tendrils resembling spines of bone lashed out as if searching for the one who disturbed them. Within the center of these tendrils was a gaping maw where each tooth ended in a tiny sparkling rock. Diana calmly evaluated the monster memorizing its attack pattern and searching for a weakness. She estimated its cultivation realm to be slightly below hers, but it had the terrain advantage, as its massive body was mostly protected by a thick layer of mud. Diana slowly circled the creature as she made great use of the abundant water chi lingering in the air to fill the entire area with her mist. It still carried a hint of demonic chi, 
which seemed to startle the monster as it thrashed out violently with its tendrils, trying to hit the laughing illusions. So the monster has sight or hearing, then, Diana mumbled as she kept looking for an opening. If she could destroy its sensory organ, then killing the creature would be simple. Diana hated to admit it, but she did feel a hint of desperation. This was the first living creature she had come across, and she had no idea how long she would be stuck in this pocket realm or how to even get back. As far as she was concerned, this was a life or death battle. Her only solace was that her foe seemed incapable of movement, so she could always slowly whittle it down as she recovered outside its attack range. Noting an opening as one of its tendrils lashed out a bit too far into her mist, she dashed forward, coated her blade in blue flames, and swung down with as much might as she could muster. A flash of earthy brown flames coated the tendril at the last moment, which absorbed her sword's flames, and her metal blade bounced off the surprisingly durable tendril despite it looking like a spine of brittle bone. She skillfully dodged to the side as a second tendril of bone rushed past her face intending to skewer her and bring her cold corpse to the waiting maw of the monster. The ground began to tremble. The monster slowly moved through the mud as if swimming toward her. Diana calmly leapt back and reassessed her attack plan from a safe distance. The monster was slow and fell for her illusions, but it was an earth affinity, so its defensive powers, especially when half submerged in mud, would prove somewhat troublesome. Tapping her sword on the mud in annoyance, Diana sighed as she watched the wiggling mess of tendrils move through the mud toward her. This is going to be a long battle. Diana complained as she dashed through her mist again, dodging random tendrils as she went. The only path to victory she could see was abusing her superior cultivation stage to outlast the monster and deplete all of its chi. However, despite the circumstances, Diana couldn't help but grin, as she knew that after this fight, she would be on the verge of the eighth stage of the Soul Fire Realm. Diana was confident that days worth of time had passed in this pocket realm, yet the sun had remained in the exact same position the entire time, beating down her back with its scorching heat. She hadn't noticed it when she first arrived, but without any shade, this was more like a desert than a frozen water world. Sweat dripped from her short hair and face, yet she dared not use any chi to remove the water, as she needed to conserve every drop of chi in her soul core. Even with her running off and cultivating outside of the monster's reach, it hurled lumps of chi-charged mud in her direction, meaning she could never stay still for too long, and if she strayed too far, she feared the monster would retreat underground and recuperate its chi. Her only chance at victory was relying on its stupidity and rage to keep it above ground. And its hunger. It was likely just as hungry as she was due to the lack of food around here. Diana stumbled as she cycled her chi using her sword as a makeshift cane. As she had gotten more tired, the monster had landed some hits on her. None lethal, thankfully. But they had left nasty gashes that had been healed with her rapidly decreasing supply of healing pills. She had cut off a load of the monster's tendrils over the past few days, and the last few were sagging on the ground as the beast was worn out. Deciding she had dragged it out long enough and with no will to continue this farce, she now charged in with an aimed strike. Her target? A weird dome hidden off to the side of the monster's maw where most of its tendrils originated. Diana had identified it as the likely location of the monster's brain. Ducking under a sluggish tendril and sliding through the mud, she stabbed at the fleshy dome and wasn't surprised when a final flicker of brown flames defended it. Unfazed, she summoned a dagger from her spatial ring and viciously stabbed at the fleshy dome with all her stored-up wrath. Murky green blood sprayed everywhere, and a tendril aiming at her slammed into the mud beside her and all the other tendrils that flopped down with sickening squelching sounds into the black mud. The monster had been slain, and Diana shakily stood up, sighing in relief and wiping the sweat, blood and mud from her eyes. She began looting the monster's corpse as it was far too large to fit inside her spatial ring, but as she pulled off the shiny rocks from atop teeth that were taller than her, she felt the ground faintly tremble. Was another one of these monsters coming? Climbing out of the monster's mouth and surveying the horizon from atop a tooth, she looked to the horizon opposite the sun and noticed that a new mountain range took up her entire view. That hadn't been there before. Diana wondered as she heard a faint thundering sound accompany the trembling. It wasn't until Diana realized the mountain in the distance was getting closer that panic set in once again. She fumbled to rip off as much as she could from the monster's corpse and then took off running. Her lungs burned from immense fatigue, and her soul core was utterly empty after the fight. The small puddles of water amongst the mud vibrated as the trembling and roaring behind her worsened. She ran for what felt like an eternity, but the situation only grew more dire. A part of her didn't even want to look over her shoulder but after finally collapsing from exhaustion onto the mud, she had no choice but to stare at the impending threat. 
With the sun behind her back, there was no looming shadow, but she couldn't even see the sky anymore. Now that it was close enough, she could confirm it had never been mountains. Instead, it was a planet-sized wave of water and rock that was surging toward her at speeds many times her maximum running speed. This giant wave likely cycled around the pocket realm, obliterating everything in its path. I must have entered the pocket dimension on the other side of this wave. Diana cursed as she pushed herself up into a meditation position. She now understood why nothing was alive here except the monster that could hide beneath the mud, as nothing could survive such a wave except maybe a monarch realm cultivator or a spirit beast. Is that what the beast tide is going to be like? Diana mused as she looked up at her impending doom. She had never seen a beast tide, but from the legends she had heard of them, they were likely more survivable than this wave. She was so dead. Diana decided to shut her eyes and prepare to die, but something poked her on the back. Her eyes snapped open, and despite her exhaustion, she whirled around, ready to face another one of those monsters. Instead, she was greeted with a familiar black root and possible salvation. Chapter 80, Mysterious Mabel On the dawn of the seventh day since Ashlock had deployed the Mystic Realm Fog, he felt something other than random sensations of environments through his roots. Ashlock felt hands clasp around two of his roots, and he felt tiny paws around another. Ashlock wasn't sure how to proceed, but he felt one of the pairs of hands tug on his root with what he interpreted as desperation and urgency. I hope this is right. Ashlock muttered as he pulled that particular root back with as much force as possible. To his surprise, Diana flew out of the fog and crash landed beside the wooden bench onto the purple grass. She was drenched like a drowned rat and seemed completely out of breath. Black mud stained with green and red blood caked her clothes, and she appeared to be missing a shoe. Ashlock was thrilled to finally see one of his sect members alive and well. In a cultivator world, so long as the person had most of their limbs intact, they were fine, in his opinion. Well, pulling on the root worked for Diana, so maybe it will work for the others. Ashlock pulled on all his roots, and Stella came out with a little more grace than Diana, managing to land on her feet with barely a stumble. Meanwhile, Larry flew overhead and into his canopy with a crash with a yawning and unbothered squirrel on his head. As the sun crested the mountain and shone onto the sparkling fog, it dissipated, and the courtyard returned to being devoid of the mystical fog. Oh, thank the heavens! Stella said as she collapsed and patted the courtyard's lush purple grass surrounding Ashlock's trunk, I was not cursed to spend eternity stuck upon that beast's back. After gathering her senses, she trudged over to the wooden bench and poked Diana's shoulder with her foot as she relaxed on the bench's armrest. What in the Nine Realms happened to you? Big, wave, mud, monster, Diana muttered between gasps. Ugh, so tired. Ashlock gave Stella a minute to recover before he used the chalk stick left behind to write his questions on the wall, as she seemed like the one least exhausted. Except for Mabel, but that squirrel wouldn't listen to him anyways. Stella appeared in a foul mood as she rested her head on her upright palm and huffed the hair from her face as she slowly translated the text. What happened, you ask? She broke out into hysterical laughter for a moment before slapping her cheeks. Sparks of lightning rippled across her flesh, causing her hair to shoot up as if it had been struck with static electricity. With a scowl, she reached up and summoned a hair tie from her spatial ring and spoke while she rested her hair into a ponytail, well, I found myself lost in the fog all alone. After stumbling through it for a while, I felt compelled to reach out and touch a weird fragment containing another world that floated past me, and then before I knew it, I was standing on the back of a sky whale the size of Dark Light City within a pocket realm overflowing with spatial chi and an environment teeming with lightning deo. Stella got her hair under control and continued, Now, I will admit it was a great opportunity, but after spending a month swallowing lightning-filled ice, burning my hands, and suffering from chi intoxication, I am in a bad mood. And with that, Stella closed her eyes and lay back on the bench, refusing to even look at the wall so he could ask another question. Ashlock had a lot to contemplate. Stella mentioned a month had passed, but he was sure only a week had passed here on Red Vine Peak since they entered the fog. It seems the Mystic Realm is some kind of small world? But why did Stella say she was all alone in the fog? Did the others go somewhere else? Ashlock wondered and then turned his attention to Larry, slowly crawling down his trunk while trembling like a leaf. Hey, Larry. Ashlock asked down the tether, and the spider paused like a kid caught eating from the cookie jar. What happened in there? M Master, I saw horrors I didn't think imaginable ow. Larry grunted as Mabel smacked him on the head for some reason. Ashlock was confused. 
Why had Maple come out of the fog while on Larry's head? Explain. Ashlock urged Larry to continue, what horrors? Did you go to the same world as Stella or somewhere else? Larry looked hesitant to explain, with Maple glaring at him atop his head. Master. I had the pleasant experience of visiting Maple's home world, and I h had a l lovely time meeting his siblings. The giant spider shook with every word as if terrified to slip up and say something wrong. Siblings. Ashlock couldn't believe it. Everything around Maple was a mystery. How did such a small squirrel survive in a dimension that contained that world walker monster? What was his true strength? What did his siblings look like? Ashlock asked through the tether, and Larry seized up. Master, they, were a bit larger than Maple and weren't exactly what I would call cute fluffy squirrels. Larry then shrieked as Maple tapped his claw gently on one of Larry's eyes and viciously bared his teeth with a hiss. Ashlock was a little taken aback seeing such a vicious side to Maple. He only ever saw the squirrel sleeping and going off randomly. As much as Ashlock wanted to sate his curiosity, Larry wasn't included in his pact with Maple, so the violent squirrel might actually murder his pet if Larry said too much. Which just made Ashlock even more curious. Maybe if he could also go into these pocket realms, he could visit Maple's world and see for himself. But that was a goal for another time. Everything was a bit sudden, but organizing his thoughts, Ashlock concluded that his mystic realm ability allowed him to give access to pocket realms to all who enter the fog. It also seems that multiple people can go to the same pocket realm as Larry and Maple did, or they can end up in different ones like Stella and Diana. Even more curious is how Stella described her realm as containing spatial chi and lightning deo. In contrast, Diana muttered something about a giant wave that gave him the vibes of a water chi-filled environment. What kind of world would he get if he could enter the fog? Opening his status screen to look at the Mystic Realm ability, he saw something he hadn't been expecting. Mystic Realm S locked until day, 3515. Bringing up his sign-in system, he saw the current day was 3485, so the skill was locked for a month. The skill was also grayed out in his menu, and a warning message popped up when he tried to forcefully use it. Continuous access to the Mystic Realm can incur soul damage. Proceed. Y slash N. So I can still forcefully use the skill if I wish, but it might damage my soul. Ashlock mused as he looked over the warning message another time just to make sure. He had already taken some soul damage during his ascension to the Star Core Realm due to that evergreen bastard, and even just losing 1% of his soul had left him with an empty and ominous feeling. With no wish to gain any further soul damage, he decided to wait out the 30 days. Instead, it would be best to prepare for its subsequent use and give his sect members some time to recover and get over their anger toward him. He hadn't figured out why the fog dissipated when all of them had been pulled out and also why he found them all at the same time. Everything lined up too smoothly for it to be a coincidence. His only guess stemmed from the skill's time delay before he could use it again. I found them all exactly one week after I used the skill, and then the fog dissipated once the sun rose. Does the ability have a seven-day limit? It would be essential to know but he had no way to find out for sure until he did a second test run in a month. Meanwhile, Diana had managed to push herself off the ground and stagger over to the bench. Before collapsing next to Stella, who was half asleep with her head on her palm, there was a flash of gold as Diana's clothes vanished for a split second and were replaced with fresh, clean clothes from her spatial ring. A pretty neat trick that Ashlock wished he had back on Earth, as getting dressed in the morning for work while being half asleep had always been an inconvenience. Despite having a relatively good memory as a tree, he found his memories of Earth fleeting. As the years went by in this new world he found himself in, the memories of Earth felt more and more distant alien even. If he somehow made it back, as a human, he felt his morals would be fucked up, and he would never be able to adapt to modern society again. In a fresh set of clothes that reminded Ashlock of Earth every time he looked at them due to their modern style, Diana sighed as she looked up at his canopy and began to monologue as if that were where his ears were. Patriarch, as terrifying as that experience was, I can only thank you for it. Diana summoned a blue flame on top of her head as if she were a human candle, I was only in there for what felt like a month, but I gained a year or two worth of cultivation and am almost at the eighth stage, if my spirit root had been better, I would have ascended the stage already. She dissipated her flame and smiled weakly, if we use this weird fog correctly, we could become the most powerful sect in the land. I just hope you will gift me with one of those truffles that Stella spoke of so that if I ever go in there again, I can soar to great heights and help protect the Ash Fallen sect in the future. Diana's ramblings made Ashlock realize something once again. 
His personal strength was nothing to scoff at, but most of his abilities aligned with empowering others rather than himself. Trees were known for providing, nurturing, and protecting the forest under their canopy. Was the system trying to steer him in that direction with the abilities it had randomly picked for him? It was suspicious, to say the least. Did the system have an agenda? Did it always plan for him to raise a sect and fight? And if that was the system's plan all along, who is my foe? Ashlock wondered, this seems like far too much effort to make me and my sect strong enough to face off a group of demonic cultivators out in the wilderness. Is there some greater threat out there I must face? Maybe the demonic beasts that will make up the beast tide? Or perhaps the Celestial Empire? Merchants? People from the higher realms like Senior Lee. The list was endless. Ashlock had no clue, but he wasn't one to complain about it. As a stationary tree, empowering those around him was ideal and gave him far more reach than any typical tree could achieve. Speaking of the section. Ashlock had been putting something off while desperately searching through the fog for his friends. Friends, hey, feels weird to think of them that way, but family is a bit too far for anyone except Stella, while acquaintances or sect members feel too cold. Ashlock especially struggled to categorize Mabel and Larry. One was in a mind control slave contract through the system, and the other was a mysterious squirrel he couldn't understand even if he tried. Writing on the wall, he notified Stella of what he had been delaying. Stella barely looked through sleepy eyes at the wall and grumbled, those red claw bastards are all here now? Did they move into the White Stone Palace while we were gone? If they had learned those ancient texts, Ashlock could write to them directly through telekinesis or send Larry as his spokesperson, but if it took Stella a year to learn, then he doubted the Red Claw Grand Elder had even begun to grasp the basics. What if I learned this world's language? Ashlock realized he had never really thought about it, but he quickly dismissed the thought when he remembered why it had never bothered. My language of the world ability automatically translates everything, so it would be impossible to learn as I can't even understand the original text or language. It was a passive skill, so he couldn't turn it off. Why the skill couldn't just teach him all the languages made sense due to the skill's name. Language of the world suggested he learned a language that the entire world once knew or perhaps was there when the world was created. Whatever it meant, it was apparent the language Stella and Diana spoke was a more modern variation of what they call the ancient runic language that he could speak. Is it urgent? Stella asked with a grumpy yawn, I couldn't catch a moment of rest in that pocket realm. If I had let my body passively cultivate, I feared I would die from chi poisoning and the thunder was so loud. It certainly wasn't urgent, but Ashlock wished to give them some direction as, from his observations during the last week, Dark Light City still appeared restless, and the villagers hid away in their homes. His first day or two after casting the Mystic Realm skill had been spent frantically searching through the fog, but after a while, he had resigned himself to a more casual search as he doubted the system would give him an ability that would send his friends to their deaths. So he had taken note of the surroundings in preparation for their inevitable return, at some point. Ashlock wrote on the wall that she could take a day to rest first, and Stella graciously retreated into the pavilion in search of a place to slumber. Cultivators rarely needed to sleep much, so Stella usually grabbed some shut-eye while resting on the bench below his canopy for a few hours in the midday sun. But she clearly desired a place to quietly rest out of the windy Red Vine Peak courtyard. Diana also seemed too exhausted to even move from her spot on the bench where she was slouching like a couch potato watching a football game. Without Stella to translate his questions, Ashlock could not ask Diana any questions. Unfortunately, she didn't know the ancient language, so he questioned Larry more about his experience. Larry, what kind of chi was present in the world you went to? The spider had been awfully quiet in the corner, sneaking glances at Maple, who had teleported up into his canopy at some point and was lying slothfully on Ashlock's branch. Larry kept his voice very low, which made it hard to understand when mixed with his gruff accent there was no chi, only chaos. Mabel slightly opened his eye, and Larry clamped his mouth shut, which seemed to amuse the squirrel. That sounded rather ominous. How could there be a place with no chi and only chaos? What was chaos even? Ashlock decided to ask a more, tame question. How did you two end up in the same pocket realm? Well, Stella spoke of weird shards, but the moment I entered that fog, I was already in that accursed place. Larry then crawled back and quickly corrected himself, I mean, it was a lovely place. Maple's family was very accommodating of me. Although I felt like a tiny bug next to them. Larry was careful at dropping the hints, but Ashlock started understanding the situation. When he tried to summon the S-grade world walker, 
he saw the hellish landscape behind that giant creature. So does Larry think those behemoths are related to Mabel? Is that what Mabel will evolve into in the future? It was hard to believe when he looked at the cute fluffy white squirrel, which couldn't look more unassuming if he tried. Whatever, it didn't matter. Once mastered, the mystic realm would be a massive boon to his sect, as Ashlock could provide cheerage environments to many different types of cultivators. This diversity will make the Ash Fallen sect far more stable than these houses that relied on a single affinity passed down through their bloodlines which tied their strength to the surrounding environmental chi. With only a few members, he already had two spatial affinities, one with water and another with Ash affinity. Unfortunately, Ashlock still had no idea what affinity Mabel had, if he even had any chi to begin with, as Larry had mentioned there was no chi in the pocket realm he went to. Wait, did they even go to a pocket realm? Larry said there were no shards and that they just appeared there instantly. Definitely some maple bullshit, I suspect, Ashlock grumbled as he turned his attention away from the central courtyard and back out to the forest filled with villagers as it still required his attention. Without the presence of cultivators on the walls, quite a few monsters had snuck over and were threatening the villagers' lives. The Red Claw seemed uninterested in making a move without being ordered. So Ashlock planned to save the helpless mortals while getting more sacrificial credits as they looked a little low after the big fight. Once he had cleaned up the situation in the forests, he would send Larry and Stella to the Red Claws in the afternoon. It was about time he put those Red Claw fellows to work. Chapter 81, The Ultimate Tournament Arc Grand Elder A woman's distant voice rang through the library's heavy wooden door, which flew open a moment later as she rushed inside. The representative of the Ash Fallen sect has arrived at the gate alongside the spirit beast. The Red Claw Grand Elder looked up from the desk covered in parchments still smelling of fresh ink he had been furiously copying over the last week and eyed the young woman with the same fiery red hair as him. Amber? Have they really come so soon? The rest of the family only arrived a few days ago, and I haven't had time to talk with them yet. The Grand Elder grumbled as he eyed the setting sun through the stained glass window and noted it was late evening. I hope they wouldn't come for a bit longer as I still have much to learn about this ancient language, and my state of mind is clouded. Amber, one of the younger generation that had been with him on that day they faced the spirit beast in combat, furiously nodded. They are already waiting outside and demanding an audience with you. All right, all right. Just give me a moment. The Grand Elder sighed as he separated the original documents he'd promised to return to Stella Crestfallen by the week's end and his own personal copies. The two stacks of parchments vanished into his spatial rings, and he rubbed his eyes as he followed Amber out of the silent library. Even with his cultivation being in the middle of the Star Core realm, his wrists ached, and his eyes felt dry as he walked through the corridors of the White Stone Palace. As he strode, he passed by many of his family members, but they all returned unenthusiastic nods rather than the usual lively greetings he expected of them. Although the Red Claws were a relatively small and tight knit family, they still ran a city in the volcanic region of the sect. Unfortunately, he had forced them to abandon their lives, businesses, and plans, which they had all left behind because their useless Grand Elder had promised the heavens their family's allegiance to some unknown power within the sect. Also, Dark Light Valley was less than ideal for cultivating fire chi, so they were all extra grumpy with him. It also didn't help that after arriving, he'd refused to speak with them as he was busy copying the ancient language over so he could start learning it to converse with his new overlords. The whole situation was a mess in his eyes and he just wanted a few weeks for everything to settle down and for him to get his family in order before having to deal with the Ash Fallen sect again, yet here they were, on his new doorstep. Amber. The Grand Elder's voice echoed through the Stone Palace's eerily silent and depressing walls. The skittish girl acknowledged she was listening with a nod, so he continued, gather all the elders of the family's side branches. We will have a quick discussion in the front room and then meet with the Ash Fallen sect representative outside. Amber nodded and left to fulfill his orders leaving the lonely Grand Elder to stroll through the bare hallways. His shoes tapped the stone, and his dark red robe swished around his legs. Despite years of experience handling politics and sitting at a table with the Patriarch, he had an unsettling anxiety brewing in his chest about this upcoming meeting. How the Patriarch had kept such a secret so silent from even him was unnerving. Things simply didn't add up regarding the Ash Fallen sect, but his hands were tied. He had sent messages to his contacts throughout the sect over the last week, but their investigation was still ongoing. Naturally, it would make sense if they had never heard of this secret Ash Fallen branch of the sect, as anyone who knew was apparently killed. Not like it matters anyway after taking that oath. 
The Grand Elder muttered as he entered the waiting room keeping his back to the door and his hands clasped behind his back as he gazed at the setting sun through a stained glass window with a heavy heart. Over the next few minutes, the elders of the various red claw side branches trickled in and silently took a seat in the well-furnished room. The Grand Elder could sense the tension building even with his back to them. Are you going to keep your back turned and ignore us forever, Grand Elder? A gruff voice the Grand Elder recognized as Elder M.O. broke the tense silence. You may be the Grand Elder of our beloved Red Claw family, but to oath bound our loyalty to an unknown force is preposterous. Were you misled? Mind controlled? Remember, the rest of us have yet to take the oath and are simply here out of our lingering respect for you, so if you cannot justify this, we shall take our leave. Strong accusations there, Elder M.O. The Grand Elder spoke sternly as he turned to face the branch elder that managed the family's prodigies, and the elder shrunk back slightly from the Grand Elder's glare. Do you have such little faith in your Grand Elder that you genuinely believe I would fall for such a scheme? Elder Emo was a cultivator near the end of his lifespan evident by his wrinkled face, balding head, and permanent skull. Accepting he had peaked in cultivation at the eighth stage of the Soul Fire Realm, Elder Emo had devoted himself to teaching the younger generation, so he was a well-respected and valued family elder. The balding man scowled harder than usual, Grand Elder, I will follow you through the fires of hell if given a reason that benefits the family and leads us to prosperity. But to follow you like a blind man is the peak of foolishness. Calm yourself, Elder Emo. The Grand Elder said simply and surveyed the anxious expressions of the other elders. Allow me to explain our situation. The elders listened with a mixture of awe and doubt as he described the events that led up to him, vowing to the heavens. He especially enjoyed Elder Mo's expression when he described in great detail the horrifying feeling of tiny spiders crawling into his mouth and how he still had a lingering phantom ash aftertaste since then. Concluding his explanation, the Grand Elder added one last point. I believe the key to us making the most of this situation is getting onto Stella Crestfallen's good side as she is the descendant of this elusive immortal. I see. The girl does indeed seem of great importance. Especially since she can order around a spirit beast despite being in the soul fire realm. Elder Emo leaned back in his seat and rubbed his hairless chin, contemplating, so you have not seen this supposed immortal yet, but too many coincidences line up and make this immortal's existence seem possible. Indeed. The Grand Elder nodded solemnly, even disregarding the oath, I personally believe this to be the opportunity our family has been seeking for far too long. If we can win the trust of the Ash Fallen sect, then we are privy to information the other houses are not and will therefore be closer with the Patriarch. Elder Emo slowly nodded in agreement, but the others didn't seem so convinced. But the chi around here is awful for our youth. A stern-looking woman interjected. If we stay here, even with the support of vast cultivation supplements, it will be impossible for us to advance with so much nature and water chi all around. Our cultivation will stall, and we will fall even further behind the other families. Do remember the beast tide is coming, and the fight for the new land at the next sect location is looming. Elder Margaret you bring up a good point. I plan to bring this matter up with the Ash Fallen sect representative. The Grand Elder sighed, Unfortunately, we have kept Stella Crest Fallen waiting long enough, so we may not discuss this further. Please be respectful, and understand that although you aren't oath bound to this place, the spirit beast the girl is bringing will hunt you down if you dare leave. Everyone stood up and briefly exchanged serious expressions before they made their way to the White Stone Palace's courtyard in an awkward silence. The Grand Elder just prayed none of them made a fool of themselves in front of the Ash Fallen sect. Stella found herself at the base of the neighboring mountain peak as she stepped through the portal created by Tree. There was a small pop of air as she stepped through and then a larger one as Larry emerged beside her. The spider still freaked her out, but its presence was calming her nerves for once. The last time she had met with the Red Claws, it had been a spur-of-the-moment situation where her overwhelming confidence was mainly fueled by her annoyance over having her cultivation interrupted. She had been arrogant and abrasive and had made up a story on the spot. But this time was different. Stella had tossed and turned on a moldy mattress inside the pavilion for hours as sleep escaped her before getting up and accepting her role as Ash's spokesperson. As she quickly scaled up the mountainside with her cultivation swirling through her body, she couldn't suppress her rising anxiety. I should have forced Diana to learn the ancient language as well, she handled the merchants in Slimer perfectly. She would make a way better spokesperson than me. Although Stella felt a bit inadequate for the job, the fact Tree trusted her so much filled her heart with warmth. Clenching her fist, she swore she would try her best, and the meeting would go perfectly. Just remember the topics Ash wanted to say, and then I can leave, 
Stella muttered as she arrived at the White Palace gates. There, she found a red-haired man leaning against a pillar. He seemed confused. And you are. The man then saw Larry crest over the mountain steps and stand behind her, which made him clamp his mouth shut. My name is Stella Crestfallen, and I represent the Ashfallen sect. Please inform the Grand Elder to meet with me at his earliest convenience. Stella gave the man a threatening smile, and the poor guy ran off in a stumbled sprint. A while passed, and Stella tapped her foot in annoyance. How long could it take for that Grand Elder to find his way to the front door? Luckily, as her patience reached its breaking point, five figures donning dark red robes emerged from the White Palace. The one at the forefront she knew all too well offered her a short bow, and the rest followed. Stella crestfallen, please excuse my tardiness. The Grand Elder straightened his back and failed to hide his surprise, your cultivation has increased by leaps and bounds in only a week. How very impressive. As expected from the daughter of an immortal. Stella returned a frown and crossed her arms below her chest. The Grand Elder smiled weakly and gestured to the men and women beside him, these fine people are the elders of the various Red Claw branch families, brought here as requested. Stella gave them a once-over with little interest as they were all busy goggling at Larry beside her and had all gone pale as ghosts. She couldn't help but raise a brow at the Grand Elder, I believe I only requested your attendance, Grand Elder? These other elders are not under oath yet, therefore, I do not wish to speak with them for now. Ahem, please forgive me. The Grand Elder clasped his hands, but it will be hard to convince the rest of my family to follow me and stay here if they aren't privy to Ash Fallen's power and benefits. Benefits? Stella snorted, leaving your family alive for discovering Ash Fallen's existence is already generous enough. What need would an immortal have for a small family within the sect if he had no need for the Ravenborn, Winter Wraths, or Evergreens? Stella then scrutinized the terrified elders in the eye one by one, and all of you also know about Ash Fallen's existence now due to your grand elder blabbering mouth, so either you swear the oath today or die. Ash had explained to her during the afternoon the importance of monitoring this group. Honestly, what they could offer the Ash Fallen sect was almost not worth the risk of their betrayal or leaking their existence to the Patriarch. But they had to start somewhere, and this family would serve as a good test. Trust was cheap out here in the wilderness where backstabbing was commonplace, and loyalty was more fickle than the crisp autumn leaves that cracked underfoot. Despite Ash's harsh opinion of the Red Claws, Stella was giddy to set them to work. She had always wanted a group she could order around so she could focus on her cultivation. Forgive me. I misspoke. The Grand Elder smiled. Would your spirit beast be fine with facing my elders in a friendly fight? I feel experiencing its torment will serve them well. Stella could detect a smug undertone to his voice. He must have described his experience to the others, Stella thought as she saw the other elders shrink back. Larry flared his cultivation as he crawled forward, making the elders yelp as an intense force pressed down on them. Then the massive spider opened his maw, and tiny ash spiders began to pour out and crawl toward them in a wave. A balding man stumbled forward and fell to his knees. I, Elder M.O. of the Red Claw family, pledge my loyalty to the Ash Fallen sect. He took a deep breath as the Chi of Heaven swirled around him, if my loyalty is to falter, may my cultivation be forever crippled and my heart demons unleashed upon my unfaithful soul. Stella nodded at the man, anyone else? Naturally, the other Red Claw family members soon followed, pledging their loyalty as they eyed the tiny ash spiders with fear. Good. Now that everyone here has pledged, I can say my piece. Stella side-eyed Larry, entomb this courtyard in ash so no prying eyes or ears can reach us. Larry obliged and surrounded the group in a swirling dome of ash. Stella spoke through the absolute eerie darkness where only the shifting ash and nervous breaths of the elders could be heard, Red Claws, by order of the immortal, you are now under the rule of the Ash Fallen sect. Your duties are simple. There was a brief pause, and the Grand Elder answered through the darkness, the Red Claws are willing to serve. Stella smiled as she continued, obey all requests from the immortal given through myself or those under the Ash Fallen sect. To complete this task, all elders must be well versed in the ancient language by the end of the year. Furthermore, your family shall manage Dark Light City and its surroundings as any other family would manage a city. This includes guarding the walls and overseeing the industries. Forgive my imprudence Stella Crestfallen, but may I ask a question? Stella recognized the gruff voice of the first elder to pledge his loyalty. Please continue, Elder Emo. Thank you. Elder Emo replied, does the Ash Fallen sect really not want any ownership over Dark Light City and the area? We own it. You manage it. 
Stell equipped back. The immortal has no interest in managing a mortal city nor desire to micromanage some farms or mines. Understand? Yes. Elder M.O. replied and fell silent. Excellent. Stella clapped her hands together. Now we can get onto my true reason for coming here. The immortal wishes to establish the Red Claws as this region's publicly known ruling family and restore peace, while he also needs a highly skilled alchemist. Ahem, we have a few alchemists in training under our family. The Grand Elder interjected, and Stella scowled. Ash didn't want an alchemist from the Red Claws to step foot on Red Vine Peak as they would leak information. Instead, they needed an alchemist from the city that had no affiliations. The offer is appreciated, but the Immortal wishes to conduct an alchemy tournament to spread your family's fame. It will be run and funded entirely by the Red Claw family. Stella said, and she could feel the elders grow restless, so she added, the elder that puts the most work into the tournament's creation and also the elder who sponsors the winning candidate of the tournament will be rewarded directly by the Immortal. Stella summoned a light purple flame into her hand and decided to showcase just a fraction of Ash's power to excite the elders. How about a legendary pill that can improve the purity of your spirit root, for example? Stella knew exposing this part of Ash's power was risky. But if rumors of this legendary pill's existence spread, she knew they were at fault and could be eliminated. Furthermore, a legendary pill that could improve a spirit root's purity was impressive but was nothing compared to the knowledge that Ash could grow them. But the final thing that reassured Stella was the downright selfishness of demonic cultivators. If an opportunity presented itself, they would rather take the information of it to the grave than allow another person to benefit. So even their own family was kept out of the loop. As expected, news of such an outstanding pill got the elders' attention, and Stella began to think she might have got them a little too excited. Chapter 82, Blooming Root Flower Two weeks elapsed uneventfully since Stella confronted the Red Claw family. After revealing the existence of the legendary spirit root improving pill and outlining plans for the alchemy tournament, the elders appeared rejuvenated and eager to be under the Ash Fallen sex rule. They soon tempered their excitement and raised several concerns, such as the scarcity of fire chi and their lagging behind other sects. Stella assured them that the immortal would provide a solution in two months' time an entire month after they agreed to schedule the alchemy tournament. Ashlock recognized that organizing such an extravagant tournament would require time, but he urgently needed an alchemist so he imposed a one-month deadline, which was already halfway through. To address the Fire Chi problem, Ashlock intended to grant the Red Claws access to his Mystic Realm, but only after another round of testing in two weeks. He wanted to confirm the Mystic Realm's consistency before making any promises. It would be mortifying if he assured them of its benefits, only to discover that the Mystic Realm could only connect to realms devoid of Fire Chi. Meanwhile, Ashlock had directed a route to ascend the Red Claw Mountain and encircle the White Stone Palace, enabling communication with the Red Claw family's elders once they mastered the ancient language. Unfortunately, it had taken far more resources than he was willing to admit, partly due to the mountain's lack of soil or mycelium, so the route's growth was wholly fueled by his chi. Ashlock was genuinely impressed by the elders' dedication over the past fortnight, with hardly any family members cultivating, which he attributed partly to the absence of fire chi rendering cultivation a somewhat fruitless endeavor. Instead, they devoted themselves entirely to the responsibilities he imposed on them through Stella's speech. During the day, they concentrated on the tournament and other duties like patrolling the walls or overseeing the mines, and at night, they fervently studied the ancient language in hopes of one day communicating with an immortal. Although Ashlock was pleased with his new subordinates so far, he had to concede that the vigilant wall guards meant fewer beasts breached the walls for him to snack on causing his sacrificial points to dwindle in recent days. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3499 Daily Credit, 11 Sacrifice Credit, 207 Sign-In Only a little over 200 points. Ashlock Cursed Aside from producing mushrooms and fruit for future alchemy ingredients and practicing telekinesis, the past fortnight had been uneventful. Larry was away hunting prey beyond the walls, leaving him scarce Maple was similarly absent, likely off conducting atrocities somewhere. Diana and Stella were meditating on the adjacent courtyard's runic formation after being given more truffles. They hadn't moved in days, leaving Ashlock alone with his thoughts. He longed for more points, as 200 seemed meager. Should I focus on extending my roots eastward, past the wall and into the wilderness? Previously, it hadn't been a practical idea since he couldn't kill or transport corpses back. However, now able to cast devour through portals and drag bodies back to Red Vine Peak, 
he was motivated to explore the wilderness and stop relying on the corpses Larry or others brought him. Fortunately, the wall's foundations weren't particularly deep, and by late afternoon, he had a single route beyond the wall, venturing into the vast wilderness. Naturally, he soon connected to the mycelium network present in the nutrient-abundant soil, accelerating his root's growth despite its distance from his star core. However, as the root extended for several more miles, Ashlock noticed his spiritual sight through the root gradually diminishing. MHM, my chi will be significantly weakened at this distance. He might even struggle to create a functioning portal if he ventured further. Fortunately, as a tree, he had no need to pursue prey. Similar to his strategy with the rats in the mine, Ashlock guided the root to puncture the soil and surface within a dense, leafy bush. He then summoned his magic mushroom production menu and filled the bush with fragrant poisonous mushrooms. To Chi-empowered creatures roaming the wilderness, Ashlock knew that poisonous mushrooms would have little effect. So, instead of causing direct harm, he designed the poison to induce sleep. His exploding portals, thorn-covered vines, and spatial chi-coated leaves controlled by telekinesis would handle the rest. It wasn't until the dawn of the following day that Ashlock found his first victim. Sniffing a peculiar bush laden with sweet-smelling mushrooms was a massive boar-like beast cloaked in black fur with a single menacing horn jutting from its narrow forehead. Despite its size, the creature's gaunt features, with ribs poking through flesh and shallow cheekbones, suggested a lack of food in recent weeks. It was starved, and despite the suspicious nature of the bush, it reluctantly leaned in, pushing its snout between the dense leaves and nibbling on the protruding mushrooms. Ashlock had no idea how the mushrooms tasted, but the boar seemed content as it eagerly delved deeper into the bush, consuming every mushroom within reach. With the beast so close to his root that it coiled up the bush's stem, he could detect that the boar's cultivation was around the fourth stage of the soul fire realm. Pathetically weak, Ashlock muttered. As his cultivation grew, weaker monsters yielded fewer credits. Regardless, this half-starved creature at the fourth stage of the realm below his own would still grant a few credits, just so few it almost wasn't worth the effort. Eventually, the beast staggered back and started blinking as if succumbing to drowsiness. With a thud, it toppled like a sedated cow, lying there in a peaceful slumber. Ashlock faced a choice, drag the boar through a portal to consume it for a few points or leave the carcass in hopes of luring a more formidable foe. In times like these, he was grateful for his increasingly manageable hunger, which allowed for more calculated decisions. Opting to leave the boar behind for now, Ashlock continued to extend his root network, reaching several miles beyond the wall and into the untamed wilderness. Later that afternoon, Ashlock checked on the slumbering boar, only to find it gone. I am such a fool. Ashlock berated himself, remembering he couldn't monitor everything. He would remain unaware of events unless he observed an area or a creature not on his roots. Casting eye of the tree god, Ashlock surveyed the area to see if he could find the culprit. Fortunately, he didn't have to search far before spotting an enormous six-legged wolf-like creature covered in dark brown fur enjoying its meal. Seventh stage of the soul fire realm. Ashlock mused as he observed the beast that stole his prey, not too shabby. It will serve as a nice meal. The creature yelped in surprise as a rift in space materialized above it, and numerous black vines coated in flaming star core chi shot through, wrapping around its limbs. Ashlock had anticipated more resistance, but the wolf appeared drowsy, thrashing about as if exhausted. Did the boar's blood still contain the sleeping toxin? Ashlock wasn't certain, but he was even more astonished when the wolf refused to release the boar clutched in its jaws, dragging it along as the portal overhead pulled them both in. Back at Red Vine Peak, many miles from the wilderness, the wolf found itself beneath the vast canopy of an immense demonic tree, which eagerly accepted its sacrifice. The creature squealed as the vines tightened their grip like coiling vipers, then outright howled when thorns injected searing digestive fluids into its skin that melted its flesh. Plus 28. Plus 12. Ashlock felt a twinge of guilt for the wolf, but the sacrificial credit notifications quickly washed it away. Checking his balance, he now had a combined total of 259 credits, enough to guarantee a C-grade draw. Since he only needed a hundred more to somewhat secure a B-grade item or skill draw, Ashlock resolved to return to the wilderness and continue hunting. His vision blurred as he rapidly surveyed miles of wilderness in search of prey. Maybe I should make my roots grow into the center of the mushrooms, so I can sense when a monster bites. He tried, but unfortunately, his magic mushroom production skill lacked such a feature and forcing the growth would destroy the mushrooms. Ashlock had connected to the mycelium network, 
but the trees in the wilderness didn't react to passing monsters as those at the base of Red Vine Peak did to cultivators. It made sense, considering beasts were common and didn't bother the trees. I could start spreading my demonic seed throughout the wilderness, as connecting with them is far easier. Of course, they would inform Dad about potential snacks, right? Ashlock chuckled but quickly turned serious as he spotted more creatures among the foliage, drawn to his sleep-inducing mushrooms. His excitement waned when he assessed their cultivation. Even weaker than the boar. Ashlock's only consolation was that the group of around five beasts would yield a similar number of points due to their number. This time, he didn't wait for them to start eating his mushrooms spatial chi coated leaves were torn from nearby plants and launched at the skittish monsters resembling giant demonic chickens. The creatures attempted to flee the deadly whirlwind but were reduced to shreds within seconds. A rift then opened and dragged their shredded corpses through to be devoured. Plus seven. Plus eight. Plus four. Plus three. Plus five. Does this even count as a snack? Ashlock grumbled as he finished his meal and went out hunting again. By the next day, Ashlock felt like a genius. He had observed that his children had turned the forest at the base of the mountain into an area devoid of wildlife likely due to the pervasive scent of death. Consequently, he realized that growing demonic trees near the mushroom-bearing bushes would be counterproductive, as the monsters would be deterred from venturing in, even if enticed by the sweet-smelling mushrooms. Thus, Ashlock devised a solution. He aimed to use the demonic trees in the wilderness as a warning system through the mycelium network, alerting him to the presence of monsters he could kill. Additionally, if the monsters consumed the berries of the demonic trees, they would perish allowing him to claim the corpses. To achieve this, Ashlock quickly grew tiny fruits, barely surrounding a demonic seed. He then opened rifts around them, severing the stems and depositing the seeds at the outskirts of his roots in the wilderness. The plan was for the demonic trees to funnel the monsters toward the mushroom-laden bushes while simultaneously warning him when the creatures entered his kill zone. Unfortunately, the trees would take years to grow unless they sprouted from the corpse of a beast that had consumed them. So, Whenever Ashlock encountered those oversized demonic chickens, he would use telekinesis to decapitate them and force the demonic seed into their bodies, expediting the growth of the saplings. Even with this accelerated growth, it would still take approximately a year for a sapling to mature into a tree capable of conveying emotions to him via the mycelium network. Therefore, Ashlock treated this as a long-term project and focused on locating stray beasts with his eye of the tree god, dragging them through portals. Ashlock was annoyed about the beasts being so low in cultivation, but if he reflected more on the situation, he realized it made sense that the beasts roaming near the sex walls were limited to the soul fire realm. If star core beasts were present, a grand elder must constantly patrol the walls. By day's end, he decided to cut his losses and concluded he had accrued enough points for a draw. At his current rate, it would take too long to save up for an A grade or higher draw with the wilderness now scarce of stray beasts for him to feast on. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System Day, 3501 Daily Credit, 12 Sacrifice Credit, 327 Sign-In Yes, sign-in, Ashlock said, and a system notification flashed in his mind, one he was all too familiar with. Sign-In Successful, 339 Credits Consumed Unlocked a B-grade skill, Blooming Root Flower Production Information entered Ashlock's mind regarding the skill's nature, and he resisted the urge to roll his eyes at the system's skill selection, knowing that production abilities were among his most valuable assets. As his cultivation realm and chi generation expanded, the constraints imposed by the skills somewhat diminished. However, Ashlock had to exercise caution. All the chi he expended on growing mushrooms and fruits, expanding his root network, and enlarging his trunk could be used instead to develop his star core and cultivation stage. Ashlock's star core generated abundant chi on its own, but the only way to force it to the next stage was by expanding the star core through meditation and pouring more chi into it. If his meditation technique couldn't keep pace with his chi expenditure, his star core's growth would stall, and he would remain forever stuck in the second stage of the star core. He wanted to avoid such an undesirable fate by being careful. This made the sudden unlocking of a new production skill all the more concerning. Ashlock chose to postpone hunting for the time being and refocused his attention on Red Vine Peak to test his new skill. As his vision blurred and he switched from his eye of the tree god sight, which surveyed the land, to his usual spiritual sight, he was taken aback by the sight of two columns of fire one purple and the other blue erupting in the runic formation courtyard. Moreover, there were other cultivators present. Chapter 83, Acting Mysterious 
Two coiling dragon-like flames of spatial and water chi spiraled up and reached for the stars, making the entire pavilion tremble under the wrathful display of power. It only took a moment for Ashlock to realize that Stella and Diana had ascended simultaneously to the next stage in the Soul Fire Realm, causing the supernatural spectacle. Stella should be in the ninth stage now and Diana in the eighth. They are both getting close to the Star Core Realm. Ashlock mused to himself. If I sent them back into the Mystic Realm with all the cultivation resources I can produce, I should have two Star Core sect members very soon. Ashlock then tore his sights away from the fascinating display and used Eye of the Tree God to check on the cultivators he had sensed standing outside. He could see a red claw woman and man donning dark red robes waiting respectfully at the closed doorway to the pavilion their attention was focused on the flames visible over the walls with their hands clasped behind their backs. They didn't move and continued to wait patiently, so Ashlock deemed them acceptable to ignore for now. So he concentrated on the girls busy consolidating their new cultivation stage as the roaring column of swirling flames calmed down and returned to their bodies. Diana was the first to open her eyes two swirling abysses of demonic chi were all Ashlock saw, and he was worried for a moment she was about to lose control luckily, his fear didn't come to fruition as Diana blinked the darkness away and her usual dull grey eyes that reminded Ashlock of a dead fish returned. She summoned a ball of glowing blue flame above her palm and watched as light blue flames swirled around a dense black core which Ashlock assumed demonstrated how her water chi controlled and suppressed the demonic chi inside her. A slight smile lurked as she marveled at her improved spiritual root shone through the lighter shade of her soul fire. It really worked. Diana mumbled to herself, just loud enough for Ashlock to overhear and feel happy. He was glad to see Diana in higher spirits after what had occurred to her since the battle for Red Vine Peak. The demonic chi had left a shadow in her heart, and she had felt more distant in recent weeks to Ashlock. Stella was the next to recover from her state of enlightenment and cultivation. Unlike Diana, who was still sitting and playing with her eighth stage soul fire, Stella was far more ecstatic as she sprung up and dashed through the dividing walls doorway and into the central courtyard. I finally understand. She shouted with a smug expression. She raised her hands and kept her eyes latched onto Ashlock's trunk. Ashlock began to understand her plan when he felt a ripple in the spatial chi near his trunk, and then a portal began to open. Admittedly, it was rather amateurish compared to his portals, which had improved by leaps and bounds since he'd first learned the technique, but it was good enough for Stella to stick her hand through and poke him from the other end of the courtyard. Then as Stella still had her arm through the portal Ashlock noticed the spatial rift becoming increasingly unstable, and before Stella even realized it, the portal began to collapse. Her face transitioned from smug to horror as she tried to yank her arm back through the portal before it sliced her arm in half, but she was too late. Ashlock unleashed his immense amount of spatial chi into the air, forcefully took control of Stella's portal, and stabilized it within an inch of its total collapse. As only a single realm and two stages separated them, Ashlock had to use a truly astonishing amount of chi to overpower her but it was made easier as her concentration had faltered due to her panic, so the technique was weakened. She brought her arm through the pride open rift and blinked at it while testing all her fingers as if she saw a phantom limb. That, was dangerous. Stella sighed in relief after confirming she wasn't dreaming and everything was fine, although she then yelped as the portal snapped closed right in front of her, sending out a wave of spatial chi and compressed air. Diana had wandered in from the other courtyard and witnessed the tail end of the incident. Despite her lack of knowledge regarding spatial chi, she still got the gist of the situation. A deep frown appeared as she walked over, poked Stella's arm, and angrily whispered, Did you try sticking your arm through a portal a second after reaching enlightenment? You did, didn't you? Are you a fool? Why are you whispering? Stella retorted clearly trying to sidestep the subject regarding her lack of safety while using spatial techniques. Diana pointed to the pavilion's closed doors and hissed, Can't you sense that there are two cultivators beyond the door? What if they heard your yapping? Stella's eyes widened as she glared at the door and slowly nodded, Oh yeah. Those are the two Red Claw escorts I asked for. They must have arrived a little earlier than expected. Escorts. Diana looked baffled, Why would you need Red Claws to escort you anywhere? To take us around the city, obviously. Stella grinned, We need to acquire mortal workers for Red Vine Peak now that we have our cultivation in order. The winner of the Alchemist Tournament will be moving in here soon. We can't have the place looking like a slum, right? Diana pinched the bridge of her nose in frustration and lectured in her usual monotone voice, Stella, my family used to own this city. You could have just asked me to be your escort I know all the best spots to hire people. Why use some red claws that only moved in recently? Ashlock had to agree. 
he had left Stella to handle the Red Claws on her own and only listened to her reports on her discussions with the Grand Elder. He wasn't particularly interested in micromanaging people he couldn't even speak to directly. With all his ongoing projects, it was too much of a hassle. He felt it was best to leave it to Stella for the time being. Had he made a mistake? Why were there two Red Claw cultivators so close to his peak? Now, now, don't get so angry. Stella retorted, I felt the need to introduce you to the Red Claw so you can assist me with managing the Ash Fallen section. Diana was taken aback and mumbled, You want me to, help? Do you really trust me that much? Of course I do. Stella patted Diana on the shoulder and smiled, It's totally not because I'm tired of having to deal with everything myself. Ashlock had no issues trusting Diana, but even he'd been surprised that Stella was willing to share any of her power within the sect with Diana. However, now he understood. Stella was just lazy. Diana slapped Stella's hand from her shoulder and glared at the taller girl, You are just lazy, aren't you? Fine. I will help. Great. Stella clapped her hands, Shall we go and meet with the escorts then? Diana's golden ring flashed, and a white wooden mask materialized in her hand. She ignited it with water chi, causing a subtle blue flame to dance across its surface, before securing it to her face with a grumble. The Red Claw Grand Elder would recognize my heritage in a heartbeat, she muttered. My facial features are too similar to my father's. You just want to act mysterious and show off your improved spiritual route. Stella laughed as she held out her hand, sounds fun. Give me the other mask. Diana sighed and gave Stella the black wooden mask, which she gleefully attached to her face and copied Diana by coating it in light purple flames. Ashlock had to admit, Diana looked rather menacing in her modern-day style clothing, with a white mask that contrasted starkly against her black hair coated in light blue flames and hints of demonic chi. Meanwhile, Stella looked like a noble attending a high-class event, adorned in a white dress and several golden spatial rings, openly flaunting her near star core cultivation. It wasn't enough to make her a big shot, but the purity of her spiritual root and her younger appearance showed how fast she'd cultivated to such a high realm. She would be feared as some prodigy of a hidden family. Ashlock was worried that dressing up like this would attract more attention than keeping a low profile, but he decided to let the girls have their fun. However, he saw the merit in concealing their identities, considering they were heading out to Dark Light City to recruit people who might leak information. Ashlock didn't want anyone to link the girls to the hired workers, thus avoiding any information leaks. Immortal Senior Stella raised her voice, and Ashlock saw the two red claw cultivators waiting beyond the pavilion door straighten their backs, we shall return soon. Stella then led Diana toward the door. Amber red claw stood with her back as straight as a bamboo shoot, patiently waiting for Stella crestfallen to come out. She didn't dare to knock on the door, fearing she might disturb the immortal. Out of respect, Amber kept her spiritual sense reined in, even though it wouldn't have mattered much. The spatial chi in the air was so thick that Amber felt like she was inside the immortal's aura. All cultivators naturally altered the area around themselves to match their affinities so they could cast techniques. For Amber, her fire chi aura extended about a meter around herself, and with some effort, she could cast techniques up to five meters away. In comparison, Amber felt like she'd been inside the immortal's aura since entering the forest surrounding the entire mountain range. In fact, the Red Claws had been under even more stress as the Immortal's aura began to bear down on the White Stone Palace recently, which made cultivation even harder than usual. They also feared they had caught the Immortal's ire somehow. Amber could feel her heart pounding in her chest. She had silently thought the Immortal was a ruse, but coming here and being so close to the Immortal's home shattered that belief. The Immortal was real according to legends, only a monarch realm cultivator could have an aura that eclipsed a mountain. And today, she was here to escort one of the Immortals' direct descendants around the city that she barely knew. Stella had also suggested another elusive member of the secretive Ash Fallen sect would be joining them. The doorway creaked open, and Amber got the briefest view of the Ash Fallen sect before a faceless mask glowing with purple flames peeked around the wooden door. It took a moment for Amber to recognize the person. But the blonde hair and red maple leaf earrings were all she needed to identify the infamous Stella Crestfallen, that had been the source of all her family's headaches over the last month. Amber Red Claw greets the mistress, Amber said as she bowed, bending her back toward the ground in reverence to Stella's feet. Humiliation? Amber didn't even know the meaning of the word. She was nothing but an ant in front of an immortal's descendant. Elder M.O. greets the Ash Fallen Elder. She heard from the Elder beside her, who gave a shorter bow. Raise your heads. 
The wooden mask ablaze with light purple flames distorted Stella's voice, which Amber had become accustomed to. I have someone to introduce to you. Amber raised her head respectfully. The doorway to the Red Vine Pavilion was sealed, obscuring its deep secrets, and in front of it stood two women. Stella gestured to the shorter black-haired woman beside her. This is Diana, another member of the Ash Fallen section. Hello, Diana spoke dryly as if bored with life. Amber felt like she had heard of someone called Diana who used Water Chi before, but she wasn't sure. Water Chi was one of the more common affinities, and although it had been mostly controlled by the now eliminated Ravenborn family, many other people could use it. It wasn't so unusual for there to be two Water Chi cultivators with the same first name. Diana then followed up the silence with, Shall we go? I don't have time to waste on these things. Amber felt as though Diana's words were directed at them, even though Diana wasn't looking at them. So, Amber answered, Are right this way, Mistress Diana and Stella. Please allow me to escort you to the city. As Amber turned to lead them down the mountain, Stella raised her hand and snapped her fingers with a thunderous crack. The dense spatial chi surrounding them erupted into a violent vortex, tearing apart the fabric of space itself to form a rift. Amber looked through the distorted space and noticed that the portal only went a few meters down the mountain and was terribly unstable, like a violent storm. Tree, help me, Amber heard Stella whisper under her breath. In response, the portal rippled, expanded, and now revealed the gates of Dark Light City. The portal had become far more stable, and the level of chi emanating from it was in the Star Core realm. Did Stella just pray to the heavens, and it obeyed her will from mere words? Amber narrowed her eyes. Did Stella and the Ash Fallen sect worship the destroyed world tree? Elder M.O. also appeared pale as a sheet as he stared dumbfounded at the portal, his feet rooted to the rocky mountain. Are you coming, escorts? Diana mocked in her distorted monotone voice as she strode through the portal. Stella also stepped through the portal without a word, leaving the Red Claws alone on the mountain. The Red Claws exchanged worried looks before calming their expressions. They could feel the weight of the Immortal bearing down on them it would be foolish to keep the Immortal's descendant waiting. Amber silently wished that the pair wouldn't cause too much of a scene in Dark Light City as she stepped through the portal with a sigh. Chapter 84, Serene Mist Camellia Ashlock was sorely tempted to refuse to help Stella and make her walk down the mountain while holding her head in shame. But as much as he wanted to embarrass her, it was a lower priority than maintaining the Ash Fallen Sect's mysterious facade. The Red Claws had sworn an oath and had been diligent so far, but Ashlock knew their loyalty was born out of fear of the unknown. He could control them using his Star Core prowess, but he preferred to use the Carrot and Stick method. This meant rewarding good work and punishing those who crossed the line. However, Ashlock had only been wielding the stick, offering little in the way of rewards. Now, after two weeks had passed without any rumors about the legendary pill, he felt he could trust them a little more. The question was, how could he reward them for their excellent work so far? His system naturally came to mind but his points were zeroed out due to his recent skill draw. Ashlock then realized something, he hadn't dabbled much in F and E grade draws, only really focusing on higher grade stuff. Wouldn't some F-grade items work great as rewards to give to well-performing subordinates? A single monster eaten would fund each draw. Ashlock mused to himself as he looked over his system windows that floated in his mind, I'm finally one of the strongest, if not the strongest, being in the Blood Lotus sect other than the Patriarch. If that demon decides to exit closed-door cultivation prematurely, my death is almost certain anyway, so it shouldn't hurt to waste some points for once and explore the system's draws more. Checking on the wilderness, Ashlock found no monsters feasting on his sleep-inducing mushrooms. It must be a slow hunting day. I'll check back later. Ashlock then spent the next hour watching over Stella and Diana as they strode through the streets of Dark Light City. Naturally, the two beautiful and mysterious women drew a lot of gazes, and it didn't help that they walked with two red claws in tow that kept a respectful step behind. Compared to just a few weeks ago, the entire city was bustling with activity and the people seemed far happier than they had been under the Ravenborn, Winter Wrath, or Evergreen's rule. Although Ashlock had not explicitly instructed the Red Claws to treat the mortals of Dark Light City differently from a usual cultivation family, the fact that the family was much smaller than the last three families seemed to have played a role in their more relaxed rule over the populace. Stella strode ahead with a stern expression, and Elder M.O. hurried to keep up. Yes, mistress. He asked when she called him by name. Stella snapped her fingers, and her ninth stage chi swirled around them, distorting both the air and sound. Ashlock would have struggled to hear their conversation if he were not in a higher realm. 
Elder Mo, feel free to speak. Tell me about the preparations you have made so far. Certainly, he replied, and Elder Mo detailed the preparations as they walked. We have contacted some old acquaintances in other families. They will bring their own alchemists to the tournament to ensure that whichever alchemist wins will be the true king of alchemists in the Blood Lotus sect, as the immortal naturally deserves only the best. Stella abruptly stopped walking, causing everyone else to halt in the middle of the street. Her eyes blazed with fury as she turned to Elder Emo. What in the Nine Realms are you thinking? We need the best alchemist in the city, not from the entire sect. Elder Emo nervously chuckled. Please, mistress, calm down. Dark Light City is one of the largest cities in the sect, and many eyes are on us right now. We were the first to arrive after the Winter Wraths and Evergreens were wiped out. However, many others had also prepared to come and claim the city after rumors spread of the Winter Wraths and Evergreens' destruction. Furthermore, with the heavens opening up, this area may be overflowing with heaven's intent, creating a perfect environment for cultivation, making it an area of great interest. So, you're saying we can't keep the tournament a secret? Stella stroked her chin. Yes, exactly, Elder Mo replied, rubbing his hands together. It's better to invite them to the tournament and make it an open event than try to be sneaky and obscure it. Sometimes, it's easier to hide things by being out in the open. Ash Locke, who was eavesdropping on the conversation, understood the logic behind Elder Mo's words. Cultivators, especially those from noble families, valued face and respect. It would be better for the Red Claws to openly establish their rule over the region rather than trying to do so behind everyone's backs. Stella seemed lost in thought, so Elder Mo continued, Naturally, we did not mention your name or the Ash Fallen sect. We advertised it as our Red Claw family giving back to the Blood Lotus sect and nurturing the next generation of talented alchemists. There may be rumors circulating among the upper echelons behind closed doors, but we can do little about that for now. Elder Mo, what you say makes perfect sense but this needs to be handled carefully. Stella's eyes drifted over her shoulder and landed on Red Vine Peak on the distant horizon, the tournament can be the perfect way for the Ash Fallen sect to retain its secrecy in your shadow, but if we are exposed, you must understand that will be your end. Before Elder Mo could reply, Diana interjected, Stella, don't be ridiculous. The Red Claw's actions may deviate slightly from the original plan, but there is no way a family that has sworn an oath would be unfaithful to an immortal, right? It's as Mistress Diana says. Amber, a girl Ashlock recognized, exclaimed. We would never betray you. Please trust us. She then prostrated herself in a deep bow. Ashlock believed that Amber was telling the truth. He had spent a considerable amount of time monitoring the Whitestone Palace through his spiritual sight. He had grown roots through cracks in the palace's loft and snuck through the floorboards to get his spiritual sight into the palace. Dot. This was done so he could spy and listen in on the Red Claws and also in anticipation of when they finally learned to read the ancient language, and he could control a stick of chalk with telekinesis to communicate with the Red Claw Grand Elder. Fine. Continue with the plan Elder Mo. Stella said before striding away, followed reluctantly by the others. Diana, where is the best place to find servants for hire? We can show you Amber began, but Diana turned her ominously glowing blue mask towards her, causing the girl to fall silent. Diana then gestured towards the city center. Past the airship station and academy, there is a higher class district for wealthy mortals. It's the perfect place to find desperate, jobless servants. Good. Stella nodded, let's go. Watching the group make their way toward the city center grew tiresome, so Ashlock shifted his thoughts back to the rewards. With other families coming, he realized the tournament stakes had grown slightly out of proportion. I need to help the Red Claw family. Ashlock muttered to himself. They are a small family and are lacking in almost every way compared to the others. They're bigger than the Winter Wraths or Evergreens individually, but those two families combined to rule over Dark Light City. If the Red Claws were shown up by the other families and couldn't manage or protect Dark Light City, Ashlock feared that another family would take over, ruining all his plans. Keeping the Red Claws' mouths shut had already been challenging, and he didn't want to waste more time convincing a larger family to work under the Ash Fallen sect. Maybe this tournament was a bad idea, Ashlock grumbled, realizing he had underestimated the sect politics and should have given it more thought. But at least I can control the situation better this way than if they all showed up unannounced on my doorstep. It's fine. The situation is salvageable, Ashlock thought to himself. All I need to do is make the Red Claws look so powerful that nobody would even glance at Red Vine Peak, 
and instead, focus all their attention on the Red Claws. The first step in making the Red Claws more powerful was improving their cultivation. They had recently stalled due to the lack of fire cheerich areas within Ashlock's roots or the reach of his Eye of the Tree God. Thus, he needed to improve the mountain peak for them. Summoning his skill list, his new B-grade skill blooming root flower production caught his attention. Activating it brought up a menu that allowed him to select flowers, similar to his other production abilities. But these flowers are special, Ashlock mused to himself. His blooming root flower production skill allowed him to produce flowers on his roots instead of his branches, which was a crucial feature since his system treated his trunk and roots as two separate entities. Some skills only worked with his roots, while others worked near or on his trunk. Moreover, unlike regular flowers that bloomed in summer and produced seeds for reproduction, Ashlock's skill allowed him to grow flowers immediately upon deployment on his roots, hence the blooming part of the skill name. Ashlock browsed through the hundreds of menu options, realizing that the chi cost of these flowers was high on deployment, just like the fruit and mushrooms. However, once they had grown, they could sustain themselves with the chi in the air, requiring only a tiny bit of upkeep from him. The main difference between his fruit production ability, which allowed him to create fruit with any size and color and add one of his skills to it, and this flower skill was that he couldn't add his own skills to the flower. In fact, most of the flowers were grayed out, meaning they couldn't be selected, including one called the Blaze Serpent Rose. When he tries to click on the Blaze Serpent Rose, he received a message. Can only grow flowers the host has analyzed. Ashlock sighed, realizing that his flower production skill was limited since he could only grow flowers that he had analyzed before. My fruit production ability is limited because I can only add skills I know, and the mushrooms consume much of my chi to produce. Now, my flower production requires me to obtain the flowers first, he grumbled, scrolling through the list of common flowers that he recognized in the vicinity, but none of them had any fire chi properties. The Red Claws might have some fire chi flowers in their spatial rings. I should ask Stella to inquire about them when they return, Ashlock thought to himself realizing that he needed to obtain these flowers to improve the Red Claw's cultivation. Ashlock's gaze wandered over to the forest surrounding his mountain, where he planned to test his flower production skill with some local flowers. He browsed through the menu options, wondering how he could improve the area. The forest was dense with lush green trees, interspersed with scarlet-leaved demonic trees that turned the area into one of half-dissolved carcasses and buzzing flies. This place has become rather ominous, and these carcasses are scaring off any wildlife, Ashlock noted, surveying the forest. He could populate the area with bright flowers to distract from the misery or lean into the already present spooky forest vibe. After a brief debate, Team Spooky won in Ashlock's mind, and he decided to make the forest surrounding his mountain as treacherous and unappealing as possible to discourage people from wandering up his mountain. I can then cover the Red Claws mountain in bright red flowers to attract all the cultivators' attention like bees, while making the Red Vine Peak seem like an abandoned place of little interest. Ashlock knew that cultivators in this world were attracted to glamour and shiny things, so why would they be interested in a lonely mountain when the sect was surrounded by thousands of miles of wilderness overflowing with fearsome beasts to hunt? With that in mind, Ashlock found the perfect non grayed out flower in the menu, the Serene Mist Camellia, a small pink flower that converts water chi into a mist that obscures it from predators. Having seen these flowers dotting the forest, Ashlock knew they were partly responsible for the lush environment within the nearby forests. The serene mist camellia attached to the top of trees and released a light mist that fell down and provided water to the foliage below. After selecting the flower, the menu changed to ask where Ashlock wished to grow the serene mist camellia. Naturally, he picked all the roots he had coiling around the hundreds of demonic trees littered throughout the forest. As the pink flowers bloomed, Ashlock received a wave of happiness through the mycelium network. It seems they like them. Ashlock chuckled. It was a beautiful display but he almost wanted to groan as his star core pulsed and shrunk slightly due to the immense drain on his chi. I might need to meditate for a few days to recover that expenditure, or I could go hunting. The thought of meditating was boring, and the prospect of hunting netted him credits he could use to sign in. With that fleeting debate, his vision returned to the sky above the wilderness as he searched for a snack. Because of the silence earlier in the day, Ashlock was surprised by the sudden wave of incoming beasts he saw. He wouldn't be surprised if it was an early sign of the beast tide. Most of the monsters were weak, consisting of giant demonic chickens charging and letting out weird screams from outside his view range. They were stampeding the bushes with his mushrooms, leaving them flattened and crushed. Fucking chickens ruining my gardening. 
Ashlock was Loki pissed those mushrooms had taken up a considerable amount of chi, and he hadn't yet repaid the debt they had incurred through hunting. If he couldn't devour a good few of these low cultivation realm demonic chickens, he had a week or two of meditation ahead of him. Ashlock did get a bit of a laugh seeing all the red claw cultivators patrolling the walls freak out. Inform the elders. Patriarch. Where is the patriarch? We are about to be overrun. Oh heavens, they can fly. Back back. Run. One of the more seasoned elders present turned his back on the incoming threat, glanced toward Red Vine Peak, and calmly asked, just loud enough for all those around him to hear, Immortal Senior, please lend us a mere fraction of your strength. Well, Ashlock was never one to turn down such a polite request from a diligent subordinate. Using telekinesis, he ripped hundreds of leaves from nearby trees and sent them whooshing over the terrified red claw cultivators' heads, raining down on the hundreds of demonic chickens like artillery fire. It was an absolute slaughter, but it didn't end there. Reality cracked like shattered glass overhead, and many tendrils coated in the purest of lilac flame slithered down to acquire the bodies and drag them away. All of the red claw cultivators fell silent and stood on the blood lotus sect wall with expressions of unease as they watched the scene. Ashlock had no idea what they thought of his display, but he hoped he had made a good impression. Such destruction while limiting himself to the star core realm. The man who had asked for his help muttered while rubbing his chin, what a terrifying individual. Did he even use a fraction of his power? Ashlock looked wearily at his dimming star core that had halved in size and silently wished the man's words were true. In actuality, he had used almost all of his chi reserves to put on a show, but hopefully, the corpses raining from the sky into the central courtyard and forming a mountain of death would serve him well. After sealing off the rift and ensuring the stampede was mostly dealt with, Ashlock metaphorically rubbed his hands in glee. Combined, the chickens wouldn't provide an awe-inspiring amount of points, but if he signed in after devouring each one, he could expect hundreds of new low-grade items, summons, or even skills. What Ashlock hadn't expected was for his very first sign-in to reward him with a new F-grade summon. Chapter 85, Cursed Blood Ashlock knew he had to be fast. Over time, Ashlock enhanced his resistance to hunger during his life as a tree. However, once he activated his devour skill on a monster, the skill would persist until either he depleted his chi or the target perished. Having used devour on hundreds of demonic chickens simultaneously, he would need to rapidly interact with his system if he intended to experiment with his new idea of claiming low-grade rewards. Plus 3 SC. Ashlock shouted, System. Before the notification of three new sacrificial credits had even faded from his mind. Idle Tree Daily Sign-In System. Day, 3501. Daily Credit, 0. Sacrifice Credit, 3. Sign-In. Yes. Sign-In Successful. Three credits consumed. Unlocked an F-grade summon, Infant Grass Snake. Ashlock was momentarily startled as he sensed a faint tether of black chi between him and a tiny black-scaled snake, no larger than a finger, slumbering peacefully among the lush purple grass near his root. Why didn't the snake come through a rift? Hey, system. Did you scam me? Ashlock cursed as Larry and Maple had arrived through rifts, and he had received a system prompt inquiring if he wanted to summon the creature. However, this time, the system connected him with a random creature in the vicinity. Could it be that he hadn't supplied the system with enough credits for it to bother summoning a creature from another dimension? To be fair, I only offered a meager three credits, so I should be grateful it's not a worm, Ashlock mused as he observed the little grass snake. The snake appeared rather endearing now that he could easily focus on it through the tether. There was an abundance of wildlife within the courtyard, particularly in the mushroom garden, which included bugs, worms, and small snakes like this one. However, he hadn't paid much attention to them before, as they possessed little to no chi and were too insignificant to be selected as a devour target. Name Summon System, let's be frank, labeling it a summon is a bit of an overstatement, you merely enslaved a random grass snake that was minding its own business. Ashlock didn't have the luxury of time to contemplate the ideal name for his new snake companion, as the next batch of sacrificial credits arrived. He settled on Kaida which meant Little Dragon. Your name will be Kaida, but I'll call you Little Kai, Ashlock chuckled before returning to his tasks. He had more sign-ins to complete. Unfortunately, his next sign-in amounted to 40 credits due to his distraction with Little Kai. Sign-in successful, 40 credits consumed. Unlocked an E-grade item, Sun and Moon Amulet. Ashlock's interest was piked but then died a fiery death as he learned the amulet's capabilities, 
a basic amulet that provides minor resistance against light and dark attacks? How minor are we talking system? Sure, the amulet did have some use, but for 40 points? Seemed rather lacking. Plus 5 SC. Sign in. Sign in successful, 5 credits consumed. Unlocked an F-grade item, unhatchable spirit beast egg. Hey. Ashlock thought the name was peculiar, so he read the description while metaphorically scratching his head, an egg that will never hatch, as the spirit beast embryo inside has perished. What on earth is the point of it, then? Undeterred, Ashlock decided to continue signing in, drawing more F-grade items. Unlocked an F-grade item, energy depleting tea. A tea that actually drains a small amount of chi when consumed, rather than restoring it, Ashlock grumbled. All right, I can see a potential situation where this might be useful. I'm definitely going to serve this to Senior Lee as payback. Unlocked an F-grade item, leaky water pouch. What on earth is the purpose of a container with holes that can't hold water or other liquids for extended periods? To play a practical joke on someone. Unlocked an F-grade item, ordinary pebble. Ashlock checked his inventory, and indeed, there was a single pebble. Despite the system's assertion that it was a plain, ordinary rock with no special properties or uses, its appearance resembling an RPG rock icon made it stand out conspicuously when compared to any regular pebble. I can't use any of these draws as rewards for my subordinates or for the upcoming alchemy tournament, Ashlock grumbled but decided to attempt just a few more times. Unlocked an F-grade item, oversized sword. An impractically large and heavy sword, impossible to wield effectively. Okay, this one could be amusing but still useless. Unlocked an F-grade item, fake spirit stone. Another peculiar item. Ashlock examined his inventory and confirmed it looked exactly like an ordinary spirit stone he had seen mortals hauling from the mines. An imitation stone that contains no spiritual energy, serving no purpose in cultivation or crafting. Fighting the urge to groan in frustration, Ashlock decided that F-grade draws were a waste of credits. Sure, they had some very niche uses, but he opted to concentrate on E-grade and above for the subsequent few draws as the E-grade Sun and Moon amulet was at least more than a novelty item he could give to Stella or Diana for protection. Sign in successful, 55 credits consumed. Unlocked a D-grade item, wind walking boots. A pair of stylish black boots with golden wing embroidery materialized in his inventory. MHM, so they slightly boost the wearer's speed. Not the most useful effect, but at least they look nice. With plenty of corpses remaining, he continued. Sign in. Sign in. Sign in. He shouted until he swore his mental voice would go hoarse, and a migraine was festering at the corner of his mind. Rapidly, the pocket dimension within himself that the system used to store his items filled with random objects like a bamboo sword, weighted training gear, low-grade detoxification pill, low-level barrier token, meditation mat, cloak of minor concealment, and more. Apart from the initial summon, he noticed that the system favored giving him items when he conducted low-credit draws. Inventory is full. A message Ashlock hadn't expected suddenly appeared in his vision. What happens if I sign in even when my inventory is full? Will it be forced to give me something other than items? Sign in successful, 24 credits consumed. Unlocked an E-grade item, body strengthening elixir. As it turned out, the system would still provide him with items. The body strengthening elixir suddenly materialized right next to his trunk and began to fall. It was a golden brown liquid reminiscent of rum, contained in a simple looking glass bottle. As the elixir descended toward the grass, Ashlock instinctively caught it with telekinesis, relieved that he did, as Kaida would have been crushed. I wonder if Kaida would like to drink some of this. Ashlock pondered. He knew that dogs on earth couldn't consume certain human foods. Was the same true for an infant grass snake in a cultivation world? Look, Kaida, if you can't even handle a little body strengthening elixir, your path to godhood will be nothing more than a pipe dream. Ashlock communicated through the tether, and the little snake opened its tiny eyes, glancing around as if puzzled. Kaida then looked up and saw a glass bottle many times his size looming over him, which appeared to frighten the poor snake. Ashlock carefully used telekinesis to unscrew the cap and drizzle a small amount of the elixir onto the snake's head and decided to save the rest for the girls. Nothing happened for a long while. Kaida now had sticky elixir all over his serpentine body and furiously flicked his tongue at Ashlock. Sorry, buddy, that's my bad, Ashlock apologized and lifted the snake with telekinesis. He then moved Kaida over the courtyard wall to dip him into the pond to wash off the sticky elixir. 
Finally, after dunking the snake a few times, he brought the tiny reptile back to the lush purple grass and set him down. Better. Ashlock asked, worried he had hurt the snake somehow. Kaida, meanwhile, just seemed bewildered. Little guy must not be used to flying. Finally, Ashlock realized the problem and decided the best thing to do was to leave the snake alone. He clearly sucked at taking care of baby snakes. Maybe one of the girls can raise Kaida up into a strong snake. Ashlock left the poor snake alone and focused on the small pile of demonic chicken corpses slowly being digested by his black vines. Since he couldn't store any more items, he consumed them all at once, did one more draw, and hoped for a new skill. Plus 103. Sign in successful, 103 credits consumed. Unlocked a C-grade mutation, blood sap. Suddenly, Ashlock felt as if his body was boiling hot, his bark crackled and swelled, and the air surrounding his trunk instantly turned to steam. Ah! <laughs> Ashlock screamed and attempted to violently thrash around. The mountain trembled, and his leaves rustled as his branches swayed slightly. Eventually, the pain became so intense that he lost consciousness, and everything faded to black. The horrific pain was replaced with the soulless feeling of great melancholy that Ashlock had once felt in a fleeting dream. He looked down at his vast body that spread throughout all of creation with a sense of impending doom. He was dying. Golden sap as pure as the heavens gushed out of his body and into the guts of greedy cultivators littering his branches throughout the vast cosmos. They carved into his flesh with weapons crafted from his very skin, and with joyous laughter that spread through eons, they wined and dined on his blood. Sap of immortality, they called it. Thought to be an endless supply by their puny minds, but anything so miraculous should be treasured rather than devoured. As they would soon learn. The chi in the lower realms diminished, transforming the area into a desolate wasteland teeming with hideous creatures that survived solely on the lingering demonic chi. Ashlock sensed the aridity and decay through his roots, and his body soon succumbed to the desolation. Ashlock experienced no pain as he observed his radiant golden bark shed away, unveiling the blackness of death and decay that hid beneath the dazzling facade. The immortals seated, their golden syrup torn from their grasp as they succumbed to the curse of death. If only the great tree could recall the consequences of its kindness toward humanity. All Ashlock desired was to flee from this nightmare. Ashlock awoke an hour later, and though the excruciating pain had subsided, he spent the next hour merely observing the sun's movement across the sky as he tried to mentally recover from such a harrowing ordeal. He noticed dark clouds forming on the horizon, perfectly mirroring his somber mood. Never before had he felt so confined within his body as during that mutation. He had not only yearned to run and leap into the nearby pond to alleviate the pain but also found himself deeply unnerved by the dream. Over the course of eons, the sensation of being devoured alive by thousands of ant-like humans instilled a profound terror within him. He felt wretched, but now that the agony had subsided and he'd had time to recuperate, he resolved to understand his latest mutation. Perhaps its effects would bring him some solace. All right, let's see. Ashlock pondered as he examined the details. A blend of dread and reprieve swept over him. So my sap has transformed into a fluid akin to blood. He inspected his trunk and roots, and there it was his sap, which had once been as viscous as glue and had made it nearly impossible to transport anything through his root tunnels was now a black liquid darker than the abyss. Rather than offering benefits like the golden blood from his dream, it carried a horrifying affliction. If someone were to consume his blood, they would gradually metamorphose into a tree. Ashlock was well aware that he was a demonic tree, and some of his abilities bore rather sinister consequences, such as devour or root puppet. However, most of his abilities possessed relatively neutral effects, and it was largely up to him how vicious they appeared, but this... His blood gradually corrupting people until they spent eternity as a tree, atoning for their sins? Now he truly began to feel wicked. He would have loved a moment to reflect and play with Kaida, but the darkening clouds on the horizon were becoming increasingly menacing. He hadn't paid much attention to it before, but those demonic chickens must have been fleeing from something. Could an approaching storm have driven them here? Ashlock took to the skies and, through the eye of the tree god, he discovered a disconcerting truth from his vast vantage point. This was no ordinary storm, after all, what sort of storm possessed eyes? A Deo storm is coming. Ashlock heard a Red Claw Elder shout from the walls. Everyone evacuate underground if you don't want to die. Children first. Someone inform the immortal. Ashlock hadn't realized the severity of this storm, but the Elder's subsequent words made him freeze in place. I will notify the Patriarch. Dark Light City and maybe even the entire Blood Lotus sect is doomed. 
Chapter 86, A Living Storm Upon observing the elder on the walls using a talisman to contact the Grand Elder, Ashlock shifted his view to the study inside the White Stone Palace, where the Grand Elder was slumped over a desk, murmuring the ancient language to himself. The Grand Elder's concentration on the parchments was interrupted when one of the many communication talismans hanging from hooks beneath plagues bearing the Elder's names on the far wall emitted a pale light. With a groan, the Grand Elder got up and walked over, removed the talisman from the wall, and listened as a distorted voice relayed the situation from the wall. A Deo storm is coming. The Grand Elder of House Red Claw hastened to the window of his study while gripping the talisman. Ashlock did not enjoy the look of total disbelief and despair on the aged man's face. It reminded Ashlock of a man that knew he was about to lose everything as if he were about to hurl the talisman to the ground and scream at the heavens in anguish. To think a Deo storm would arrive so soon, the Grand Elder murmured, clutching the talisman. We are running out of time. Despite the Grand Elder's doomsday demeanor, he maintained a composed voice, instructing through the talisman, get everyone off the walls and out of the mines. Have them all return here. The storm still seems a way out, so we have time to prepare. What about the mortals? Through the talisman, the voice of the elder stationed on the wall echoed in the room, and the ensuing stone-cold silence spoke volumes. Grand Elder? What are your orders? Leave them to die, the Grand Elder replied, retreating from the window and advancing toward the wall of talismans. I don't even know how to save my family, let alone some mortals fated to perish in the beast tide. But the ash fallen sect entrusted them to us. The Grand Elder paused, frowning as he gazed down at the talisman. The immortal, hey? With his assistance, perhaps salvation is possible. The man stroked his chin and began to grab and activate the talismans on the wall with haste. Elders, heed my command. The Grand Elder shouted at all the glowing talismans on the table. Assemble all the disciples of our esteemed Red Claw family and convene at the White Stone Palace. Those on the walls instruct the mortals to seek refuge in the old Ravenborn mine and offer a brief prayer for their souls. Ashlock was determined not to let the mortals perish, not only because of the moral implications of standing idly by while hundreds of lives were torn apart when he could have easily saved them but also because of the potential benefits to his Ash Fallen sect. With his resources, he could transform many of these mortals into cultivators, making their survival advantageous to him. A chorus of acknowledgments filled the room, but one question caught the Grand Elder off guard. Should we inform the Patriarch? Elder Brent, the Grand Elder responded sternly, we are under the protection of an immortal. How could the Patriarch possibly compare? Ashlock wasn't certain he shared the Grand Elder's optimism in his abilities, but he was grateful that the Patriarch wouldn't be summoned. In moments like these, he was glad he had extended a route to the White Stone Palace and infiltrated the Grand Elder's study. Now he finally understood the magnitude of the threat he faced. There were distant tremors as a literal wall of chaotic chi that resembled a storm advanced in a direct collision course with the mountain range. It was still far off into the distance, but Ashlock could feel its looming presence from a hundred miles away through his roots lurking below the surface of the wilderness. The oncoming storm appeared like a tsunami of dark clouds surging toward him, but upon closer inspection, a vaguely humanoid shape could be discerned at the storm's center. However, now was not the time for panic. As a tree, Ashlock could not flee, his only option was to confront the imminent catastrophe and attempt to mitigate the damage it might inflict on him, assuming he survived. Ashlock tugged on his tether of black chi to summon Larry back to the mountain and tried reaching out to Mabel. He also needed to consider how best to safeguard little Kai. Earlier, the Red Claw Grand Elder had mentioned that one way to survive a Deo storm was to seek shelter underground. Fortunately, Ashlock had just the space beneath his mountain for such a purpose. He had considered the mine as a potential refuge for Stella, Diana, and others during the Beast Tide, but he knew the Beast Tide was still years away. As a result, developing the mine into a proper shelter had been deprioritized in favor of other projects. Currently, the mine consisted of little more than abandoned homes carved into the stone. However, there were some root tunnels that could supply water and fresh air, and Ashlock could grow fruit and mushrooms if necessary. He simply didn't know what would happen when the Deo storm struck the mountain range so his mind raced with preparations. As the storm had not yet reached the edge of his roots sprawling into the wilderness, he decided to bring as many people as possible to safety while he still could. There was some merit in keeping the cave below him a secret, but his options were limited. His vision blurred as he activated the eye of the tree god, opening a portal within the white stone palace's courtyard that led directly to the cavern housing Bob the Slime. An elder standing in the white stone palace courtyard witnessed the sudden appearance of the portal. Startled, 
he leaped back, with wrathful fire springing from his fists, but quickly calmed down as he saw the distorted view of a cavern on the other side. The elder shouted orders through a talisman, and soon enough, the entire sect was gathering in the palace courtyard. Ashlock followed one of the Red Claws retreating from the walls down a forest path and saw the red-haired women pause in the village that should have that kid that Stella interacted with. Everyone in the village, you must flee underground to the mines. She shouted, a deo storm that will rip you to shreds is coming. The doors to the wooden houses opened, and villagers rushed out. They looked to the darkened skies with fear of the unknown. Esteemed cultivator, the mines are an hour's walk from here, and we have children. How can we escape in time? How am I supposed to know the cultivator's words were cut off as Ashlock opened a portal in the center of the village? Through the distorted image, they could see a dimly lit mine. The cultivator inspected the portal and, after confirming its legitimacy by poking her head through and spotting other sect members pouring out a second portal, she ordered the villagers to gather their stuff in preparation to leave. While keeping his attention somewhat on the mine, he quickly scoured the forest and opened a portal in the center of every village he could find. He felt like his brain was splitting in half while trying to upkeep and focus on so many portals. After a while, Ashlock returned to the original village he had opened a portal in and saw a gathering of terrified villagers clutching bundles of their belongings. Do they not have spatial rings? Ashlock mused as he saw the mother clutching that kid's hand. All right, let's go to safety. The cultivator spoke and gestured for the villagers to enter one by one. Fortunately, the villagers possessed the bare minimum amount of chi in their bodies to withstand the rapid change in climate as they stepped through the portal with uneasy steps. The female Red Claw decided to follow once she confirmed that all the villagers had escaped. Then after ensuring that the villagers were comfortable, she went over to join her fellow sect members on the other side of the cavern. They exchanged a few words and seemed confused about what a Deo storm entailed. Ashlock felt overwhelmed as he tried to manage and think about so many things simultaneously, so he left the mine and hoped the cultivators and mortals would get along. Suddenly, sharp pain and pressure surged down his roots, signaling that the storm had reached his roots that were within a few miles of the wall separating the forest and villages from the wilderness. Switching his view to look out into the wilderness, he noticed the storm suddenly slow down as it entered his realm of influence. Was the spatial chi from his roots messing with it? Without much more time to prepare to fight the storm, Ashlock did a final mental checklist of things he needed to protect. What about Stella and Diana? Ashlock cursed to himself. He had expanded his roots a little bit under Dark Light City, but the girls were heading very deep into the city in search of hires and would likely learn about the incoming storm when it was too late for him to teleport them out of there. That's when the seriousness of the situation set in. If he assumed this Deo storm was on another level compared to the highest category of a hurricane back from Earth, he didn't see how Dark Light City could survive the destruction even with its runic-enhanced buildings. He had to somehow stop the storm without involving the Patriarch, as Ashlock would be instantly exposed by the Red Claws running their mouth or the Patriarch noticing his star core realm. Would his selfishness to keep his identity hidden lead to the death of millions of people, including his closest allies and maybe even himself? Ashlock wasn't sure, but he vowed to try and stop the storm before it could wipe everyone out or die trying. Ashlock had to close the village's portals as the chi upkeep of that many portals was taking a strain on his star core that had only just been refilled and he couldn't split his control that far. Opening a dozen portals near the mountain range was possible, but keeping them open and then trying to fight a Deo storm many miles away was not within his realm of capabilities. If villagers had been left behind, they would just have to rush to the mine on foot. He then heard bells ringing in the distance from Dark Light City. Damn, this isn't good, Ashlock cursed as he saw the city devolve into chaos, with people running in every direction. He simply didn't have the capacity to help them all as the mine could perhaps accommodate a few thousand people at most, and there were millions residing in Dark Light City. Ashlock wondered if this was how the Blood Lotus sect would feel when the Beast Tide arrived, faced with the difficult decision of who lived and who died. Was this just a prelude to the chaos that would unfold in a few years? Ashlock felt somewhat responsible if anything terrible happened, as his presence as a phony immortal prevented the Patriarch from coming to their aid. So he decided that wasting even a single second worrying about Dark Light City was time he could spend devising ideas on how to combat the storm. But how does one even defeat a storm? His gaze returned to the eerily human-like silhouette at the heart of the tempest. Could it be that the Deo storm had a corporeal form? Was that the area he should target? As bells ringing reverberated throughout the valley, Ashlock shoved spatial chi through his roots toward the wilderness as the ambient spatial chi he released into the air seemed to slow it down. As the storm passed over the tip of his roots, 
he identified that the storm was made up of a mixture of water, wind, and lighting chi rotating in a violent vortex at speeds that uprooted trees or caused them to crack in half. Naturally, his first idea was to try and use spatial chi. The air crackled as portals materialized and then exploded at the edge of the storm. Holes momentarily appeared in the tempest, only to be swiftly filled in again. The tactic proved as futile as throwing punches in a steam-filled room. His next idea was to try and keep the portals open to move the storm elsewhere, but that idea was literally shredded to pieces as the storm ripped through the portals as if they were made from paper. System. Ashlock shouted in desperation and quickly looked through his list of skills to devise a solution. Demonic Demi-Divine Tree, H, 9. Star Core, Second Stage. Soul Type, Amethyst, Spatial. Mutations. Demonic IB. Blood Sap C. Summons. Ashen King, Larry A. Infant Grass Snake, Kaida F. Skills. Mystic Realm S locked until day, 3515. Eye of the Tree God A. Deep Roots A. Magic Mushroom Production A. Lightning Chi Barrier A. Chi Fruit Production A. Blooming Root Flower Production B. Language of the World B. Root Puppet B. Fire Chi Protection B. Transpiration of Heaven and Chaos B. Devour C. Hibernate C. Basic Poison Resistance F. None of his abilities jumped out to him as viable solutions. His production skills were about as useful as throwing pebbles at a tsunami, and he doubted his devour skill could do much, but it was worth a try. Portals opened up on the edge of the storm, and his black vines shot through, but as expected, they struggled to latch onto anything or inflict any damage even when he targeted that humanoid area of the storm. With his system-granted abilities proving useless and his chi doing little more than slowing down the looming destruction, Ashlock began to feel desperate. Where the fuck is Maple and Larry? Ashlock pulled on the tether and could see Larry rushing up the mountain and would arrive any moment. Maple, meanwhile, was elsewhere. He cast a portal and brought Larry to the courtyard. Master. Larry inquired in his gruff voice, What are your orders? Ashlock was at a loss. Was there anything the Ashen King could achieve besides turning the already violent storm into an ash cloud? The colossal storm, seemingly reaching for the heavens and casting a shadow over the entire valley, had arrived at the wall meant to shield the villagers from monstrous threats. What had once seemed an imposing stone wall now appeared no more formidable than a sand castle before the mighty Deo storm. Then the storm paused right beyond the wall as if stumped. Ashlock was confused. Surely a wall barely reaching a tenth of the storm's towering height couldn't stop it. The vague humanoid shape within the tempest began to sharpen in definition, and in the blink of an eye, Ashlock found himself gazing up at a titan of clouds, its visage marked by two eyes composed of pure wrathful lightning. The storm's colossal head turned and glared directly at Ashlock. Then, a hand composed of fingers kilometers long emerged from the cloud, and with golden lightning crackling between its fingers, it aimed straight at Ashlock. The world flashed white as lightning slammed into Ashlock with the force of a thousand suns. His bark shimmered with purple light as his lightning chi barrier absorbed the brunt of the damage, but it shattered instantly, leaving a smoldering hole in his bark. The sheer power of the attack made the courtyard crack as his roots reaching the depths of the mountain kept him from toppling. Master! Larry roared as he tried to blink away the blinding light. Once his vision recovered, he attempted to approach, but lightning continued to arc between Ashlock's branches preventing him from getting too close. Though Ashlock had survived the initial strike, it seemed his survival only served to further incite the Cloud Titan's wrath. Well fuck. Ashlock murmured as the Cloud Titan approached him, effortlessly gliding past the stone wall and into the forest between Red Vine Peak and the storm. Chapter 87, Cloud Titan's Wrath Ashlock observed in hushed stillness as the colossal Cloud Titan eradicated the forest with each stride. The Titan's foot, a swirling vortex of fierce gales, hovered just above the ground, not quite making contact. Yet, much like a brutal hurricane, trees in close proximity were wrenched from their roots and hurled into the raging storm, tearing them apart. A wall of clouds trailed behind the titan like a divine cape, furiously consuming the landscape in its wake as though it were a relentless combine harvester. Ashlock found himself utterly dumbstruck. Since entering this world, he had encountered numerous bizarre phenomena, towering ice golems, individuals soaring through the skies on swords, and cultivators exchanging blows faster than the eye could perceive. However, this sentient tempest, hurling lightning with the might of Zeus, was sheer madness. The natural wrath of storms had always been a source of great dread for humanity, 
but this, this was beyond comprehension. Ashlock felt his arrogance evaporate like water droplets on a summer day. Strongest in the region? Able to fend off the beast tide? It was always easy to let your ego cloud your judgment when you hear about something from those weaker than you. A small voice in the back of his mind had whispered that just because they had to flee didn't mean he had to. He was superior to those other cultivators his chi was pure, his star core immense, his realm of control expansive, and he possessed a system to compensate for his shortcomings. He was the chosen one, right? Despite the considerable distance, Ashlock's leaves began to rustle as the cloud titan that appeared hellbent on his destruction strode over. From the periphery of his vision, he noticed a solitary man flying toward the storm, standing confidently atop a sword wreathed in crimson flames. The man's scarlet hair danced in the wind, and his aged face displayed a stoic expression in the face of impending disaster. It was the Red Claw Grand Elder why was he still above ground and foolish enough to face down something he couldn't defeat? It wasn't logical. Ashlock couldn't understand. You disgrace the land of an immortal, wandering Deo Storm. The Grand Elder thundered as fiery phoenix wings, spanning a hundred meters, erupted from his arms. Your insatiable lust for Chi will be your undoing. With a flick of his hand, the Grand Elder sent a searing wing of fire arcing across the sky, scorching the air in its wake and leaving an ethereal trail of steam. The blazing appendage collided with the Cloud Titan, and to Ashlock's amazement, the creature recoiled. A massive plume of steam billowed from the point of impact. Ashlock was well aware that the Titan was an amalgamation of water and wind chi elements that should have counteracted the pure fire chi wielded by the Red Claws. Yet, against all odds, the Titan had faltered. For the briefest of moments, the fear that gripped Ashlock diminished, and a glimmer of hope, akin to a radiant sunrise, blossomed within him. Had the Grand Elder truly inflicted damage upon that monstrous force of nature? The wall of steam parted as a titanic hand of tempest reached forth as if trying to swat an annoying fly. Standing steadfast on his flaming sword, the Grand Elder unleashed a relentless barrage of attacks using his manifested phoenix wings. Yet, he was losing. From his aerial vantage point, Ashlock could see the vast storm trailing the Cloud Titan, funneling through its colossal form and replenishing the vaporized Storm Chi. It was an unwinnable battle of attrition, with the Grand Elder resembling a valiant ant attempting to combat a deity armed with a mere lighter. Despite the doom that crept back into Ashlock's mind, he found the Grand Elder's bravery broke him out of his rut. As the Cloud Titan drew nearer to his mountaintop sanctuary, Ashlock's strength grew. The closer the Titan came to his trunk, the more chi he had at his disposal and the greater the arsenal of abilities he could unleash. Determination surged within Ashlock, and he no longer held back. The air crackled as spatial chi surged forward under his command. His star core pulsed and glowed within his trunk as he cast aside the need for portals, hurling raw spatial chi in the form of blades at the advancing storm, carving slices into its tempestuous mass in hopes of striking something of importance. Though the storm filled in the gaps faster than he could make them, Ashlock persisted, slashing relentlessly. The Red Claw Grand Elder abandoned his slicing tactic and decided to join his hands together to unleash the most magnificent flamethrower Ashlock had ever witnessed. The roaring crimson flame burrowed deep into the Cloud Titan, finally diverting its attention from Ashlock. Golden lightning crackled within the Cloud Titan's body, converging within its eyes as its gaze shifted down to glare at the Grand Elder. Wasting no time, Ashlock created a portal directly behind the Grand Elder. The man expressed his gratitude as he leaped from his sword and plunged through the portal just in time to evade twin beams of lightning that obliterated his crimson blade and burrowed into the Red Claw mountainside. The intense beams left two smoldering holes tunneling into the rock for miles. Ashlock then used a portal to move Larry from the central courtyard as well and the two emerged from portals near the foot of the Cloud Titan simultaneously. Spirit Beast, the Grand Elder addressed Larry in the ancient tongue, his hands clasped together, we meet again. Ashlock was surprised the Grand Elder was already competent in the ancient tongue, so he spoke some words through his mental tether with Larry, and the spider acknowledged his commands. To speak the ancient tongue so fluently, I am impressed, human, Larry responded to the venerable Grand Elder. Ashlock observed the spider shifting his focus to the looming tempest. The immortal is preoccupied and can only provide a fraction of his true power. We must find a way to halt the storm before it lays waste to Dark Light City. The Grand Elder smiled weakly, I only understood about a third of your words, Great Spirit Beast. The immortal must be testing my resolve and my ability to protect his domain in his stead. No, old man, Ashlock sighed. You've misunderstood completely, but whatever, it works. Larry's crown of ash that encircled his head like a halo around his horns pulsed. 
a torrent of ash rushed into the base of the Cloud Titan, accompanied by a stream of superheated flame from the Grand Elder. The ash ignited within the inferno, glowing like fireflies as it pierced the Cloud Titan, inflicting substantial damage. Unlike the Grand Elder's fire chi which was quickly diminished due to the dense water chi in the storm, the burning ash retained its heat much longer. Soon enough, the Cloud Titan bellowed in agony as its leg blazed with fire and steam. How a storm even gained enough sentience to howl with pain was beyond Ashlock, but he knew it involved some Dao bullshit. Why it had come here and seemed to specifically target him was also a cause for concern. Was it attracted by Chi, like the Grand Elder had hinted at earlier, or had it come after something else? Ashlock had to shove these concerns aside as he joined in on the assault by pumping more Chi into his roots and causing space to ripple with power. The storm fragmented as if restrained by an invisible spider web. Yet, Despite their combined efforts, the storm proved too immense. The Cloud Titan continued its relentless advance, even as it was scorched by fire and ash or cleaved by warp space. How could one even hope to defeat this entity? Ashlock began to grasp the Red Claw Elder's sentiment that perhaps the entire Blood Lotus sect was doomed. He continued repositioning the Grand Elder and Larry using portals, but the distance between the mountain range and the Cloud Titan rapidly dwindled. In mere minutes, it would reach Ashlock. The crown of ash encircling Larry's horns grew sparse, reminiscent of the rings orbiting Saturn. The Grand Elder was drenched in sweat, and his crimson wings of flame had dwindled to a mere whisper of their former brilliance. Together, they stood with their backs to the mountain range, prepared to make a last stand, but it seemed futile. Ashlock knew they couldn't hold out much longer, so before the Cloud Titan could crush them beneath its tempestuous winds, he transported them to the safety of the underground mine. The Red Claw Elders hurried to support their Grand Elder, with one of them offering an arm to steady the exhausted man. Concern filled their faces, and the villagers huddled in the cavern's corner screamed as Larry crawled through the portal. Ashlock didn't have the time or energy to waste on observing those sheltering below and returned his sights to the situation above ground. Little Kai seemed distraught as the purple grass swayed and Ashlock's leaves began to violently rustle. Go join Larry, Ashlock said to Little Kai, perhaps for the last time. Their shared journey may have been brief, but Ashlock had high hopes for the adorable little noodle. He will take care of you, maybe. Using telekinesis, Ashlock lifted the small black snake and dropped it through a tiny portal, which deposited Kaida onto Larry's furry back. The little snake nestled among the fur, likely finding it quite warm. Due to his minuscule size compared to Larry, the spider didn't seem to even notice Kai. Larry focused instead on observing the villagers, deriving some amusement from their distress. While Ashlock busied himself with relocating his allies underground, the Cloud Titan's foot had made contact with the base of the mountain range. The many miles of rock separating them seemed futile as the Cloud Titan effortlessly surged up the mountainside. Ashlock metaphorically gulped as the Cloud Titan's lightning eyes peered over the pavilion's walls. Ashlock opened his trunk like an accursed maw and revealed his demonic eye in a vain attempt to win the staring contest. The Cloud Titan appeared entirely unfazed by his gaze. Instead, its eyes glowed with power, and Ashlock raised his lightning chi barrier just in time as two beams of lightning slammed into him once more. Charred splinters flew, and his leaves burned to a crisp, but the A-grade barrier held strong. Compared to the heavenly lightning he had endured during his ascension to the Star Core Realm, the Cloud Titan's lightning could not obliterate his defenses. Yet again, his refusal to succumb to the lightning infuriated the Cloud Titan. Why are you even targeting me, you bastard? Ashlock shouted in rage. It didn't make any sense to him, a city of people lay behind him, but the Cloud Titan seemed hell-bent on his destruction. Do you just hate trees? Are you Triest? Ashlock accused the Deo Storm, and whether it hurt him or not was hard to tell. It seemed to be in a constant state of anger. The sky darkened even further as a column of storm resembling a fist rose up over the pavilion walls and loomed over Ashlock's branches. Naturally, Ashlock did everything in his power to fight back. Vines surged up from the ground as he cast Devour with as much chi as his dwindling star core could muster. The spatial coated vines rose like tendrils to meet the titan's fury. He also attacked the column of storm with spatial bombs. The air shuddered as explosions echoed, and vacuums formed from the collapsing portals. He poured everything into the attacks, but the arm that appeared determined to crush him continued to descend, fueled by the immense storm system behind it. Maybe if I had an entire sect of star core disciples, I could fend off this monstrosity, but alone? I am just one tree. Ashlock screamed. His thorn-coated vines passed harmlessly through the arm, but Ashlock wasn't finished. 
he also sent up his roots once the storm got close enough and cast Root Puppet in a futile attempt to take control of the Cloud Titan, the chaotic winds severed the thin hair roots that fanned out from the root tips instantly. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Ashlock couldn't believe it. Was this truly the end of his life here on this planet? A tree with infinite potential, fated to die at the hands of a wandering Deo storm? Yet, Ashlock still clung to the hope that he could regrow from scratch as long as his roots entrenched in the mountain survived. But all his progress. His cultivation. What about the divine fragment Senior Lee had gifted him? Would the Deo storm rip it from his chard and split stump? His star core was at its limit, trying to keep this lowering fist of storm from crushing him. Just the atmospheric pressure alone made his branches quiver. Of course, Ashlock muttered in defeat as the Deo Storm brought up a second arm that descended from the opposite side of the first. He had nothing left to ward it off. He almost felt like closing his eyes and saying a final prayer, but the void rippled. The Cloud Titan seemed to hesitate briefly as Mabel stepped out of another dimension and appeared on his roots. Mabel! Ashlock shouted, Where have you been? Help me! The Cloud Titan's eyes burned like two suns going supernova, and the entire central courtyard was bathed in ferocious lightning. Ashlock felt his bark cracking from the force as his lightning chi barrier once again took the brunt of the attack. His spiritual sight was overwhelmed with lightning chi, so he had no way to see if Mabel managed to survive. A sudden roar echoed through the air, not of a beast but of a howling wind. Blinking away his temporary blindness, Ashlock saw that the Cloud Titan had been cleaved in two as if a massive claw had sliced right through it. Mabel stood defiantly on the tip of his branch, his tiny claw still raised. He was panting, and as a minute passed, he became seemingly fatigued and struggled to stand. Whatever devastating attack the small squirrel had unleashed, it had drained him of all his strength. In response, Ashlock opened a portal, using the last remnants of Chi in his star core to deposit Mabel's limp body beside little Kai on Larry's back. Rest well, buddy. Ashlock said as he returned to the central courtyard and was surprised to feel the warmth from the sun on his bark. Through the demolished pavilion wall, Ashlock saw a wonderful scene. Between the mile-wide gap in the chaotic storm caused by Mabel's attack, Ashlock saw rolling green hills bathed in the golden light of a beautiful sunset. It may have been a brief moment, as the cloud titan soon knit itself back together, but for a second, Ashlock knew peace. With his allies sparse and his body barely holding up, Ashlock stood tall about as tall as any tree could in the face of its uprooting. The Cloud Titan wasted no time in resuming its attack. It didn't bother to raise its arms, instead surging directly into the courtyard and engulfing the entire mountain in its chaotic vortex. Ashlock screamed in his soul as his entire body cracked under immense force. His burned leaves were the first to be ripped from him, and then his weaker branches snapped in two, flying away into the storm. He couldn't even see anything as the torrent sped around him. Is this what death felt like? But then Ashlock noticed dashes of liquid darker than night mixed with the vortex around him. Due to the situation, it took him a second, but as the liquid flew out of his split branches and spread throughout the storm, he was sure of it. A hint of hope remained, and it lay in the cursed blood of a demonic tree. Chapter 88, Golden Springs and Black Rain The late afternoon sun bathed the noble district of Dark Light City in warmth. Through idle conversation with Diana, as they walked, Stella learned that Dark Light City was primarily governed by mortals. They had a governing body and influential mortal families that managed various industries, often with the assistance of rogue cultivators. The group strolled down a picturesque street lined with grand pavilions that seemed out of place in such a large and dense city. Stella observed several groups of noble mortals walking about. They were easily recognizable by their luxurious, free-flowing robes crafted from the finest silk and adorned with jewels. However, what truly identified them as nobles was the presence of a mid-rank chi cultivator attending to them like a servant a concept Stella struggled to grasp, even as Diana whispered an explanation. She just couldn't understand why a cultivator would service the weak mortals. I thought all cultivators had to be part of noble families. Stella murmured as they passed a noble mortal couple laughing with their hands interlocked while a robed man trailed a step behind, displaying his first stage soul fire realm prowess with dark blue flames flickering across his skin. No. You've misunderstood, Diana replied as they turned a street corner. Being part of a noble cultivation family is a privilege, not a right. I'm not sure if you witnessed this in your own family, but those who are wastrels or lack the talent for cultivation are expelled. Kicked out? From their own families? Stella found it hard to believe. Absolutely. Take the man we just passed, for example, 
Diana explained. He appeared to be in his mid-fifties, yet his cultivation was stuck at the first stage of the soul fire realm. Did you notice how impure his spirit root was? Stella recalled and agreed, his water chi was even darker than yours used to be. Was he a member of your family? No, Diana shook her head. He didn't have my family's distinctive features. He probably came from a mortal family and awakened a spirit root. Unfortunately, that's where his luck seemed to end. Not only was his spirit root impure, making cultivation more time-consuming, but his talent must be lacking if it took him fifty years to surpass the Soul Forge realm and create his soul core. Stella contemplated Diana's words before asking, I still don't understand. Couldn't he attend the academy or join your family since he has water affinity? Stella, you can be so naive sometimes. You should know about Beast Corps after my, incident. There was a brief silence, and Stella was about to console Diana, but she continued without breaking her stride. Powerful cultivators must embark on month-long journeys into the wilderness to find areas with beasts strong enough to form their own cores that can be harvested. Stella could see where the conversation was headed but allowed Diana to complete her explanation as she hated to be interrupted. Only the strong survive out here in the demonic sex. That's why people blindly consume beast cores, even though they know it may ruin them later. They see their chances of surviving as weak cultivators to be completely up to chance as they can be killed at any moment. Diana let out a long sigh. Even one of the most powerful, like my father. Diana didn't finish her sentence, as the red claws were with them but Stella understood her point. Even the newly ascended nascent soul ravenborn Grand Elder had been slain at his doorstep. It doesn't help that beast cores are so expensive, either, Elder M.O. grumbled from the side. As families, we only have so many resources to allocate to each individual's cultivation, so those with a lack of talent are often sold for more resources or kicked out. It's not like we want to do it. Stella noticed the darkness in Elder Mo's expression, and Amber smiled wearily from the side. Either we are ruthless to ourselves, Elder M.O. continued, or the other families will do it for us. Anyway, enough of that. We're here, Diana said in a flat tone as she pointed to a small restaurant nestled between two taverns. A hooded man leaned against the wall of the nearby tavern, watching them as they approached but never making a move. Feeling uneasy, Stella followed Diana into a modest establishment with an ornate sign reading Golden Springs above its narrow door. An odd name considering it was a small noodle shop with a kindly old lady sitting behind the counter. However, Stella's suspicions that this wasn't an ordinary place peaked when the old lady seemed entirely unfazed by four cultivators entering her tiny restaurant, two of them wearing masks and the other two being members of Dark Light City's new ruling family, the Red Claws. Stella stood off to the side as Diana approached the counter and leaned on it. The elderly woman leaned in, exposing her ear, and Diana whispered, The bridge to the Golden Spring lies with Mr. Choi. The elderly woman offered a toothy smile that did little to flatter her wrinkled face and gestured for them to follow her behind the bar and into the kitchen. As Stella followed, she briefly locked eyes with the only other group in the restaurant. Initially, she had thought they were mortals enjoying a meal, but the bowls of noodles before them were cold and appeared days old by the murky water. Upon closer inspection, she realized they were no ordinary mortals. So, what were cultivators doing in a tiny shop like this? Even stranger than the restaurant's only customers, the kitchen was empty. No one seemed to work here, and a thin layer of dust covered all the cooking equipment. Mr. Choi will guide you along the hidden path, the elderly lady said, gesturing to a door at the end of the kitchen. With that, she disappeared into a side room, leaving the four cultivators alone. Ember and Elder M.O. exchanged glances, and Stella looked around nervously. Only Diana seemed unperturbed. Confidently, she strode forward and opened the flimsy door, revealing a wall of dirt. Unfazed by the obstacle, Diana walked forward, and to everyone's astonishment, the wall of dirt shifted away as she moved. What the? Stella muttered, and Diana glanced over her shoulder, her white mask concealing her face. Come on, Stella, it's never a good idea to keep Mr. Choi waiting. Stella had no idea who this mysterious Mr. Choi was, but why did hiring some mortals involve so much secrecy? She couldn't make sense of it but decided to trust Diana and followed her. Elder M.O. and Amber attempted to follow as well, but Diana waved them off. You two wait here for us. We'll be back soon. Amber appeared slightly annoyed, but Elder M.O. bowed deeply. As you wish, Mistress Diana. As they delved deeper into the seemingly endless dirt, Stella was engulfed in complete darkness when a rumble sounded, and the dirt tunnel closed behind them. 
Stella's chi surged to illuminate the dark space, and she prepared to cast a portal to escape being buried alive, but Diana's voice reassured her. Don't worry, that's supposed to happen. We just have to keep walking forward. Why did we leave the Red Claws behind? Stella asked over the rumbling dirt. She had been wondering about that. Was this Mr. Choi so trustworthy that they would leave their escorts behind? Especially Elder Emmo, who was on PAR with both of them in strength. There was a brief silence before Diana answered in a whisper that was difficult to hear over the rumbling earth. They would only get in the way of our conversation. It's hard to maintain our mysterious persona in front of them. Especially for me with Mr. Choi. Just stay quiet for now, I want this to be a surprise, and the walls have ears. Stella fell quiet for a moment as they continued down the ever-changing tunnel. At times, it shifted direction like a labyrinth, and Stella concluded it was a way for travelers to remain unaware of the tunnel's end in relation to the Golden Springs Noodle Restaurant. Before Stella could ask more, the dirt tunnel collapsed, and dim sunlight illuminated Diana's figure as she stepped out of the ground, with Stella following closely. Strangely, the first thing she noticed was the sudden change in weather. They shouldn't have gone far, and it had been sunny when they entered the noodle shop, but now dark skies and a chilly breeze prevailed indicating they were outside. Diana strode forward unperturbed, but Stella couldn't help but hesitate to take in the surroundings as they found themselves in a beautiful garden enclosed by high walls. A cobbled path led them to a wooden bridge that crossed a small stream, flanked by people standing on either side. They all wore identical black cloaks with a golden koi fish embroidered on the lowered hood. None of them displayed their cultivation, which made guessing their realm and affinity difficult, but they were undoubtedly cultivators. More rogue cultivators, Stella surmised as she quickly followed Diana. She wasn't thrilled about having to rely on and follow Diana here, but Diana had been the scion of the family that had ruled this city for decades. The cultivators stood motionless as they passed, resembling living statues. Soon enough, they were crossing the well-maintained wooden bridge, and that was when Stella saw the potential boss of this place. Ladies. Welcome to the Golden Springs Pavilion. The absolutely massive man greeted them with a shark-toothed grin. Towering over the stone table he sat behind, which displayed a mud model of a building, his purple silk robe embroidered with golden koi did little to conceal his bulging muscles, and his shiny bald head was hard to ignore. If a mountain could become a man, then this was the result. Mr. Choi, Diana said respectfully as she stopped a step away from the stone table in the center of the clearing. I'm eternally grateful you could make time for us today. Stella was grateful her mask hid her wandering eyes because she found it difficult to resist looking around in awe at the wondrous piece of paradise this place was and the mountain of a man who dominated the area with his presence. They were on a small island surrounded by the rushing stream and bamboo shoots, providing privacy from the entrance area. Mr. Choi returned a grin to Diana. My doors are always open to those working with the ruling family and especially to those who know the secret code. He then cracked his neck, rolled his shoulders, and flexed a bit of his cultivation. Now, who are you? Stella's eyes widened. The man was a ninth stage soul fire realm cultivator like her, with an earth affinity, but his spirit root was very impure. Since those in the Qi realm can live up to 150 years old, and this man is at the peak of the next realm up while still looking in his thirties, he could be a few hundred years old, Stella mused as she tried to act casual in the face of the blatant display of power. No need to act so hostile, Diana said, reaching up to remove her mask and revealing a smirk. Long time no see, Mr. Choi. The man blinked, too shocked to speak, until he abruptly stood up, his stone chair crashing behind him. It's really you, Diana? Oh, the Nine Realms are truly kind to this old man. You survived the slaughter. What followed was a joyous reunion that left Stella baffled as she stood off to the side. They didn't look related, but she picked up the general gist of the matter through snippets of conversation. Mr. Choi had been the main provider of high-quality mortal servants to the Ravenborn family. In return, he had received vast resources for a rogue cultivator, which he had used to advance his cultivation to the ninth stage of the Soul Fire Realm. Due to Mr. Choi's relationship with the Ravenborn family, he often met at their peak and exchanged conversations with Diana when they ran into one another. Diana was also sometimes sent here on behalf of her father. Stella guessed from context clues during the conversation that rogue cultivators who became that strong were hunted down or forced to join the ruling family as a subordinate. So, Mr. Choi had hidden away, maintaining a low profile as the city changed ownership several times. Few knew of his existence or strength since he preferred to run his business empire from the shadows. 
so he explained how he had been surprised when a masked woman appeared at his front door with red claw cultivators in tow, knowing the secret code taught to all the higher UPS in the Ravenborn family who wished to do business with him. After catching up, Diana introduced Stella to Mr. Choi. She tensed slightly as the man's massive hand engulfed hers in a handshake. He seemed friendly enough, but his fierce appearance and similar cultivation level made Stella uneasy. The rest of the meeting was a blur as she sat there, gazing up at the foreboding sky. Listening to the contract terms the other two exchanged, Stella became even more determined to let Diana handle the more bothersome tasks in the future. Dot. She could admit that she hadn't been formally educated past an early age and lacked much knowledge a sect leader should possess. Rather than make a fool of herself, she let Diana take care of it sitting quietly and twiddling her thumbs. So, just to reiterate, Mr. Choi said seriously, reading from a mud tablet created with his chi and covered in text. You want to hire five rogue cultivators, all proficient in earth affinity, to be builders, and you also want to hire cultivators to be maids, and simple mortal servants or builders won't suffice. Diana nodded. Mr. Choi groaned as if annoyed. And not only do you want me to find seven rogue cultivators with specific affinity requirements, but you also want them to swear an oath of loyalty and live with you on Red Vine Peak? Do you have any idea how incredibly expensive this request is? Those were the terms, yes, Diana replied, unfazed. Expensive is the wrong word here. The man set the mud tablet aside and rested his bald head in his enormous hand. Some things simply can't be bought with money, and this is one of them. What do I need to do then? Diana asked. Well, very few rogue cultivators are that desperate for mortal currency or even spirit stones. The main issue with your request is the oath part. Cultivators are too prideful to agree to such a thing unless their life is threatened. Stella couldn't help but think back to the Red Claws, who had surrendered and sworn an oath after facing down Larry. I can try to convince them, Mr. Choi continued as he sat back up and rubbed the back of his bald head. Can you give me any more details that would make people more eager to sign up? Anything special you can offer? Stella wanted to blurt out all the amazing things Tree could do, but she wisely remained silent as Diana simply replied, Tell them this, after the end of this month, they will beg to join us, and we will have to turn them down then. It's first come, first serve. This is an offer of a lifetime. Bold words, Mr. Choi snorted, standing up and holding out his large hand. A thousand dragon crowns per person as a finder's fee, and then you must win them over yourself. Once I have any news, I will send a runner from my establishment to Red Vine Peak. Diana hesitated for a moment at the mention of Red Vine Peak but eventually reached out and shook Mr. Choi's outstretched hand. Those terms are acceptable. If that is all, we shall be on our way. As they turned to leave, Stella saw Mr. Choi lean over the strange model on the table, and with a rush of earth chi from Mr. Choi, one of its walls dropped down. There was a brief rumble, and Stella stared to her left as the wall collapsed, revealing a tunnel leading back to the noodle shop. It seemed the model mimicked real life. Looks like it's going to rain soon, Diana commented as she walked toward the exit. We should hurry home. I'm exhausted. Stella couldn't agree more. She felt the sudden change in weather was rather foreboding. That's when the bells began to ring. Stella and Diana dashed down the street with the red claws in tow. Using movement techniques in the city was usually frowned upon as they could lead to accidental deaths, but the roads were clear. Everyone had taken shelter inside as ominous bells chimed through the sudden rain shower. It was hard to see through the heavy rain, but a terrible feeling brewed in Stella's stomach as they charged down the central street and got closer to the walls. This was no normal storm. Those bells only go off when the city is under attack, Diana shouted over the gale. Stella nodded and looked to the distant red vine peak shrouded in a dense storm. From afar, it had looked like a simple storm cloud, but now Stella wasn't so sure. The tempest seemed to rotate a bit too violently for a casual storm. And then the dark clouds shrouding Red Vine Peak lit up like a small star, bathing the entire valley in bright light. Stella felt her heart stop and her chest tree had been in the center of that. Stella cried and charged forward. Lightning Deo crackled along her legs, empowering her speed. Tree. No. Her life seemed to flash before her eyes as the dark clouds dimmed and then lit up with lightning a second time. Faster, faster faster. She needed to get there and help Tree somehow. The violent storm suddenly began to coil upwards while awful howls filled the valley. Stella didn't care, she kept increasing her speed as the world blurred around her, and her soul core glowed and hummed within her. 
Stella didn't know how far or for how long she had been running, but she was only halfway through the city when the storm concentrated around the top of Red Vine Peak began to fan out. With her enhanced eyesight, she saw the clouds dissipate higher, and something strange happened. Pieces of black bark rained from the sky like hail. Stella skidded to a stop, creating a deep ravine in the street, and paused to watch the black rain as the clouds made their way over to Dark Light City. It looked like the clouds were filled with corruption as they bled onto the city below. Near Stella's feet, a piece of black bark fell and lodged itself into the ravine she had just created. To her surprise, it drew in all the chaotic chi in the surroundings, especially the water chi from the rain, and began to grow, into a tree. Very, very quickly Stella had to stumble back to avoid being catapulted by its expanding branches. Before Stella knew it, trees were popping up everywhere, on the road and buildings. Within moments, Dark Light City had become a forest. Stella wanted to stay and inspect these trees further, but with the storm that had been ravaging Red Vine Peak gone, there was nothing standing between her and tree. So she ran faster than ever before. She had to know. Would she find her best friend and the only thing she considered family as nothing more than a smoldering pile of lumber, or had he survived? Tree, please be alive. She shouted as she charged up the mountainside, trying to ignore the thousands of new trees covering the mountain. Chapter 89, A Cold Death Ashlock found himself in a silent void no matter where he looked, complete darkness surrounded him. There was no light or shadows, just cold blackness in every direction. He couldn't grasp the size of this space nor his own appearance within it. How could he remain alive after the Deo storm ripped him apart? System. Ashlock shouted into the void, but it remained unresponsive. It was strange for something that had always occupied his headspace and answered him to suddenly vanish it only made the silence louder. Had he died in the Deo storm? Was this the afterlife, where he would spend eternity as a soul destined to wander the eternal darkness alone? Despite the severity of the situation, his mind felt numb and cold at the thought of his death. Ashlock simply felt it was unfortunate to have died so soon. Life as a tree had been surprisingly pleasant now that he reflected. Although his human mind and tree body never fully merged, he had felt more comfortable in his bark than he ever had in human skin. Sure, there were numerous drawbacks to life as a tree, but the many positives in his new existence had compensated for them. But perhaps the most unfortunate aspect of his premature death, assuming this was indeed the afterlife, was those he would leave behind. He had been so concerned about keeping his loved ones with him for eternity. Who would have thought I would leave first? Ashlock sighed, I hope Stella can forgive me for leaving her so soon. She must be devastated and feeling lost right now. Time passed. Naturally, with nothing else to do, Ashlock reviewed his life in his mind. Had he made a wrong decision at some point, which led to this premature death? What if he had saved his credits instead of spending them on low-grade items, or if he hadn't become so greedy and aimed for that S-grade summon so early on? Should he have been more ruthless and consumed all the villagers and citizens of Dark Light City for credits? Had his softness caused his demise? Or, conversely, had he been too eager to grow quickly? Had accepting that divine fragment from Senior Lee attracted the Deo Storm? Or was it just bad luck, with the Deo Storm targeting him because he had the most chi in the area? Should he have delayed his cultivation in that case? These thoughts are pointless, Ashlock mused, floating in the endless void as his thoughts spiraled. He had entered this world without any information, able to see only a few meters around him and knowing no one. He had been nothing but a lone sapling on a mountaintop. Yet, in just a single decade, he had ascended to the Star Core realm, acquired many high-grade skills, and formed relationships with those around him despite being unable to even talk with them. Bleh, Ashlock felt disgusted with himself for prioritizing his cultivation realm above everything else in his list of life accomplishments. Advancing my cultivation had been my primary focus the entire time, and now it seems so, meaningless. Would a wealthy person care for their vast fortune as they lay lifeless in a coffin with no one to send them off? He had felt so powerful on his throne at Red Vine Peak, ruling over the local populace after slaughtering the Evergreens and Winter Wraths and then manipulating the new family. He had been responsible for the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of lives both cultivators with hopes and dreams of their own and irrational monsters. Yet, it wasn't this vast power he had amassed that accompanied him into this void all he had were memories. Helping that terrified girl kill the servants when her back was against his bark, gifting her the earrings that allowed her to survive those tournaments when no one else could guide her. Dropping fruit on her head when she talked too much but still listening to her ramblings about life. 
watching her grow up through the changing seasons and leave with Mabel to the wilderness for a year without him. Then Diana entered his life, filling the silence Stella had left. Initially, he resisted her presence, but the gloomy woman grew on him over time. He then observed as Stella returned and overcame her past by making her first human friend out of an enemy. He then spent many warm summer days watching them train and grow together as individuals. Ironically, they had left him for an entire year to learn the ancient language to communicate with him, making him feel lonelier than ever. But even being alone like that was better than floating here in this void, without even the birds to pester him. Darn, I miss the outside world already. Even that rascal Mabel, who never helped, or Larry the oversized spider, had provided him with plenty of laughter as he sat in the same courtyard, watching the sun rise and set day after day, season after season. While everything changed around him, he remained still. All Ashlock could hope for was that they wouldn't forget him as his soul moved on. Just as they lived in his memory, he hoped they would cherish the fun times they shared, despite the chaos of their situation that led to some dark times he was sure Stella kept bottled up in the back of her mind. Considering how difficult her life had been, it was a miracle she wasn't completely unhinged. Well, she does talk to a tree. Maybe she is a bit insane, Ashlock sadly chuckled to himself, trying to fill the silence. As more time passed, Ashlock's dulled emotions eroded away, and his dismissive stance on his death morphed into one of unacceptance. The more he thought about it, the more he loathed the idea of leaving so soon. Not just for Stella or the others he was leaving behind, but there was a whole world out there and hundreds of years of memories to be made, yet they had been ripped from his smoldering branches by some freak event of nature. In a way, it was rather absurd for him to condemn the world as unfair for his sudden demise. Just as the Deo storm had appeared out of nowhere and killed him, he had sent Larry to slaughter people, mortals included, without a second thought. He had even killed cultivators solely for their affiliation with a specific family, even though they could be wonderful people like Diana. He didn't regret his decisions now that he thought about it more. A person was the sum of their past choices, and he was content with his life. The deaths of others had been necessary for him to grow and protect those around him from harm. It had been a brutal world out there and only the strongest survived, it's just now Ashlock had gotten a taste of what it felt like to die such an unfortunate death to something far stronger. He felt bitter, as if a bad aftertaste lingered in his mouth. He had spent so much time complaining about his life as a tree, and it was only now, as he floated in the void, that he realized just how incredible his new life had been. I'm sorry, Ashlock spoke into the darkness. He didn't know exactly who or what he was apologizing to, but it felt right. He didn't know the origins of the system or why he had ended up as a tree, but whoever was responsible, he felt he had let them down. Another long, drawn-out silence passed, and just as Ashlock felt his mind becoming heavy, as if he was on the verge of entering a deep slumber he might never awaken from, he heard something. A voice. It was quiet as a whisper, almost easy to miss, but as he looked toward the voice, Ashlock saw two handprints outlined with purple flame floating in the void. He drifted closer and the voice grew louder. Tree, don't you dare leave me. I will get you anything you want. I can slaughter the entire city for your sake. Just tell me. Here, have some food, eat up like you always do. It was Stella, without a doubt. He rarely heard her swear, and he could hear her voice trembling as if she was crying. She also spoke of food, but he couldn't even see anything, let alone use his devour skill, since his system was offline. Don't cry. Stella, Ashlock replied, but she still couldn't hear him. He was sad. Even in his final moments, he couldn't share a single word with the one person he considered family. Stella, don't be sad, please. His mind felt sluggish, and Stella's voice became harder to hear, drowsiness consumed his thoughts, and he felt himself drifting off to sleep like he had on those cold winter nights when he was nothing but a young sapling. Tree, you said we were family, Stella cried and Ashlock sensed her hands striking the void with splashes of spatial chi, first, my parents died, and now you? I refuse. I don't accept it. Stella, we are family, but sometimes those you love must move on. So sleepy. Despite his words, Ashlock didn't want to leave, but he felt it was time. The darkness felt comfortable, like an inviting bed on a cold winter night. I can feel the flickering of your soul, Stella said through her sniffles, ceasing her pounding on his trunk. She leaned against the void, and he saw the outline of her back. Can you hear me, Ash? The tree I knew wouldn't die from something so pathetic, so please, come back. 
It was pathetic, wasn't it? If only he had been stronger, this wouldn't have happened. I should have fucking murdered everyone. Ashlock cursed to himself over Stella's sobs. Remember when we were both small? You were only the size of a person, and a dagger was the size of my arm. Stella murmured, you would sleep through the winters, leaving me all alone. It's one of the many reasons I hate and fear winter. Don't you think that's a silly reason? That's, not, silly. Stella, Ashlock managed to say, struggling to stay awake. I, hate, winter, too. Hey, Ash. If you leave. Will it always be winter? Will I never experience the joy of summer again? The purple outline of Stella's head leaned against the void as if she were looking up at the sky, it's a lovely warm day now that the storm has passed. You should come enjoy the sunshine with me. Just one more time. Ashlock yearned to feel the sunshine again, the warmth on his rustling leaves during a summer breeze while birds sang their songs and nature blossomed all around. Stella stayed leaning against the void, and her quiet sobs kept Ashlock from falling asleep due to the guilt that plagued his mind. This was fucked up, and he hated it. As Stella breathed in and out, tiny pulses of spatial chi drifted into the void. At first, Ashlock hadn't paid much attention, as it seemed like nothing more than fog drifting with him in the void. That was until he noticed the fog moving downward toward a specific point. Despite the sleepiness gnawing at his mind, attempting to drag him into an eternal slumber, he resisted and followed the fog with curiosity. He was astonished by what he found. It had been impossible to see before, but with the purple chi bringing a tiny bit of light to the darkness, he saw it. His star core. What had once been a radiant ball of fire with enough power to flood the entire mountain in spatial chi and launch an assault on a Deo storm was now a tiny black dwarf, so dim it was easy to overlook. But the purple chi from Stella was drawn to it and slowly gathered around the dimmed star. Tree, if you must go. I will search the nine realms for your soul. I promise. Stella's voice echoed through the void, and Ashlock looked up and saw the purple outline vanish. Stella had stepped away. Was that her final farewell? He then saw the purple outline of Stella's forehead and her two hands. It appeared she had shifted and was now hugging his trunk. Her silhouette flared up with power as Stella wailed. Ashlock found her cries and constant cursing hard to focus on, he knew his time was nearly up, but the immense amount of chi fog flowing into the void provided a glimmer of hope. He wanted to live. The streams of purple chi flowed past him toward the fading star. He feared it might be too late, but as the coldness of death enveloped him, he saw the dim star flicker. And then there was a ding followed by a message he couldn't have been happier to see floating in the void. System Rebooting the system he had thrown so much shade at for its unreliability, he had never been so glad to see its warming presence. Identified human ego and demonic tree body. Human ego wishes to be free and reborn? Yes slash no. Wait, what? Despite his groggy mind, he was startled by the notification. Was he being offered a chance to escape this tree body? If he had been asked a few years ago, he would have said yes without hesitation. But now? Fuck no. In fact, being called a human ego felt insulting. He wasn't a human. He was a tree through and through. Human ego and demonic tree body compatibility, 98%. There is a 2% chance of failure and permanent death. Also, elements of the human ego will be eroded away with time due to demonic tree body. Does the user still wish to be merged? Was this even a question? Before, he had been a human mind trapped in a tree body, but this way, he would become fully tree. He also felt confident in his ability to retain that little bit that made him human, even with his new biology. Acknowledged. Chi reserves below the minimum threshold for the merge. User is too damaged to receive full system manifestation. Damage calculated at 91%. Stored energy insufficient for repairs. Ashlock thought 91% damage sounded quite serious. Was there even a piece of his trunk remaining? Activating hibernation until the minimum threshold is reached and merge can be completed. Ashlock didn't resist the sleepiness this time as he felt safe in the system's capable hands. He just hoped his sleep wouldn't be for too long. Stella, I will see you soon, Ashlock murmured as he blacked out. Stella's eyes burned from the tears, and her throat felt raw from shouting. She didn't even feel like moving when she felt a hand clasp her shoulder. Hey, you look ugly when you cry. Diana said in her monotone voice as she patted her back. And you're covering the patriarch in your snot and tears. Stella sniffled and took her forehead away from the charred bark. Diana, 
you're terrible at consoling people. I know, but watching you howl and hug Ashlock's chard remains so tightly can't be good for his regrowth. Diana leaned over and wiped a smudge of ash from her forehead with her thumb. Give the tree some breathing room, okay? Stella reluctantly took her hands off and stood up. The small bit of tree that remained was only about as high as her head and just wide enough for her to wrap her hands around. Compared to the towering tree that had symbolized stability in her life, seeing Ash reduced to such a small and helpless state filled her with grief. I should have stayed by his side. Tears blurred her vision as she stood there with drooping shoulders. She was Tree's greatest believer, but even she doubted Ash could recover from this. She closed her eyes and let her head hang in misery. A while passed, and Stella felt a chilled breeze pick up. See, what did I tell you? Diana's flat voice reached her ears, the patriarch will always rise from the ashes. Stella had no idea what Diana was talking about, but as she raised her head and opened her eyes, she could see a faint light through the tears. Hey! Bringing up her sleeve, she wiped away the tears and feasted her eyes on Ashlock's star core that had emerged from his body once more. Then Stella saw the most dazzling display as the turbulent chi left over from the monstrous Deo storm funneled toward the dim star core, which pulsed with power. But the sudden tug she felt on her own soul core warmed her heart. She was sure that Ash's star core was asking for her assistance. You should have just asked earlier, Tree. We are family, after all. Raising her hand, she put her all into transferring her chi to the floating star core, which only glowed brighter and brighter. Meanwhile, Diana watched from the side with a smile as the charred bark encasing Ashlock cracked and fell to the side, and a single branch began to grow rapidly from the stump toward the heavens. Within seconds, the tree had grown twice its size and kept going. Stella cried tears of joy as a single stem sprouted from the tip of the new branch, with a red leaf that basked in the glorious sunlight. It seems we both returned from death after facing the lightning, Stella said with a smile as her soul core hummed happily in her chest. Now, I hope you grow taller than ever before. You have a lot of children to care for now. Through the tears, Stella looked into the distance. Her view of the surroundings wasn't blocked by walls, as the storm destroyed the pavilion. Not even the rubble remained just a lone stump on a mountain. Surrounding her on all sides was a mountain covered in beautiful red-leaved trees as far as the eye could see, bathed in the warm light of the setting sun. Chapter 90, A Chance at Rebirth End of Book 1 Ashlock awoke to the golden radiance of a summer day the sky was crystal clear, extending to the horizon without a hint of cloud or storm. It was perfect almost too perfect. You were supposed to die. Startled. Ashlock looked down at the source of the voice and saw a majestic young man wearing simple white robes sipping from a steaming teacup. Senior Lee. Ashlock wondered. He still remembered the old man's distinctive jawline and stature, and despite this man's youthful appearance, he matched the memory of the old man in his mind. Why was I supposed to die? The man didn't reply, taking another long sip of his tea before placing the teacup beside him on the bench. In your moment of death, who gave you life? Senior Lee asked calmly as he gazed at the horizon beyond the thousands of stunning red-leaved trees that Ashlock had never seen before. Ashlock pondered Senior Lee's words. Stella's chi had given him hope in that all-consuming darkness and perhaps helped revive his dying star core. Stella saved me, he answered with a touch of pride. No wonder the heavens were so angry on that fateful day when I saved her, Senior Lee chuckled. If she had perished, so would you. So perhaps your fates are more intertwined than I first thought. Our fates are tied. Ashlock glanced around but couldn't find Stella anywhere, or anything for that matter. It was eerily silent. There wasn't even the sound of a gentle breeze or distant cries of birds. The universe works in mysterious ways like that sometimes. Senior Lee smiled as he continued to look into the distance, nobody gets to the peak of creation alone whether they create a mountain of corpses to reach the apex or nurture those around them into dependable allies and tackle heaven's trials together, there's no right way to the top. There was a brief silence as Ashlock considered Senior Lee's profound words, but something had been bothering him. Senior Lee, why are you so youthful? Last time we met, you looked on the verge of death. You are still naive to be blinded by outward appearances. Our bodies are nothing more than vessels for our souls. Senior Lee leaned back on the bench and crossed his legs. I just happened to be feeling youthful today, especially after seeing your rebirth. Rebirth. Senior Lee gazed up at the rustling canopy despite the absence of sound. Rebirth is nothing to fear, as it's a way to reshape our vessel to match our soul. When we first met, I could tell your soul was trapped rather than merged. 
how a human soul is even bound to a tree still baffles me. So I gave that fragment to you, hoping it would save you. Ashlock looked inside himself and noticed that the fragment was gone. I don't have that fragment anymore. I think it was taken by the Deo Storm. Senior Lee shook his head. It's now a part of you rather than an add-on. You are now a real spirit tree with a soul that is no longer trapped. Go, take a look inside yourself and verify my words. Ashlock complied, and sure enough, Senior Lee was correct. There was no floating blue cloud representing his consciousness. The fragment was also no longer necessary to connect his star core to the heavens, as even his star core was gone. Now his entire trunk pulsed with power as if it were a furnace of the gods. Unlike humans, the heart of a true spirit tree is its trunk as the trunk lies between the branches that reach for heaven and the roots that delve into the darkest depths of hell. Senior Lee laughed. There's a reason why it takes spirit trees so long to cultivate, and only one can reach the peak of creation by absorbing everything. The sheer amount of chi you need to develop your cultivation when your soul is the size of your trunk is tremendous. Ashlock pondered Senior Lee's words and didn't like the idea that it would take him so much effort to cultivate. Senior Lee then became serious. Ashlock, listen to me. You might be the key to breaking this world's cycle and saving us all from heaven's wrath. The Nine Realms have been in a state of collapse ever since the fall of the last world tree. Fragments from those dreams depicting a possible world tree's death made Ashlock uneasy about Senior Lee's words. Do you want me to grow so I can be devoured by greedy cultivators or so my bark can be harvested for weapons? Senior Lee blinked, and a massive grin formed. Good, good. That is exactly what we want to avoid. When I first stumbled upon you, I saw a glimmer of hope. What about me gave you a glimmer of hope? Ashlock hated it, but he was naturally suspicious of Senior Lee and his motives. The old man had randomly appeared one day, handed him a fragment of some divine thing, and possibly caused a Deo storm to appear that nearly ended his life. What happens when a world tree dies? Do you know from those dreams? Senior Lee inquired. Ashlock thought really hard, but the details of those dreams were fleeting. All they left was a vague instinct, like a bad feeling of what could happen to him, and hazy potential scenarios that could lead to his death. The cycle of life, Senior Lee explained when the silence lingered, a world tree sprouts from a divine seed in the ninth realm, then cultivates for thousands of years until it reaches the monarch realm, the highest possible realm attainable due to the scarce amount of chi down here. Senior Lee pointed to the sky, once it develops its world tree domain at the peak of the monarch realm, it uses its unlimited cultivation potential, inherited from its divine ancestry, to transcend to the eighth realm of creation. We call this the Era of Ascension. Era of Ascension? Why is it called that? Ashlock asked. Because Chi from the higher realm floods the lower realm, enabling everyone to cultivate to the monarch realm much faster than before and invade the higher realm. Ashlock didn't understand. Why does any of this matter? Are you saying I'm the world tree? Do you want me to not cultivate to the next realm? Senior Lee chuckled and shook his head, No, you are merely a demonic tree with a human ego. A world tree is already born from the divine seed in this realm. It resides in the center of the celestial empire and is the sole reason that bastion of humanity has withstood the vicious beast tides. Wait. Ashlock couldn't believe it. There's another powerful spirit tree down here with me. Senior Lee nodded, and only one of you can ascend to the next realm. Why? You know that fragment I gave you? I was supposed to give it to the world tree in the celestial empire, but I encountered you on the way and decided to give it to you instead. Quite the twist of fate, don't you agree? Ashlock recalled that when he merged with the fragment, the system had informed him that he now possessed unlimited cultivation potential. Is the world tree trapped down here because it doesn't have unlimited cultivation potential? You catch on quickly, Senior Lee observed, the spirit tree has already reached the peak of the monarch realm, and if I had given it the fragment, it would have broken through the realm and initiated the era of ascension. With you as the inheritor of the divine fragment, it will remain here indefinitely unless it consumes you. So there is a monarch realm spirit tree that wants to consume me, can it speak? Almost, Senior Lee rubbed his chin, I spoke with it a few times. It's not as adept as you, but it can harness its emotions to convey complex thoughts. That was quite intriguing. Ashlock wanted to meet this tree and engage in a lengthy conversation about tree life, but something bothered him. Why can't we both ascend? There are nine realms and nine fragments. Absorbing just one unlocks your cultivation potential to that of a demi-divine, but you need all nine to surpass the heavens and become a true divine being. 
Even if the world tree somehow stumbles upon another fragment, it will never reach the heavens as you have one of the nine fragments. Ashlock listened to Senior Lee's words. He would have been thrilled if he had learned about the path to becoming a divine being before his rebirth, but now he felt a sense of melancholy about the entire situation. Why would I want to ascend and become a divine being? Can't I become the strongest and remain in the lowest realm of creation for all eternity as an immortal? Senior Lee stood up from the bench. His long white hair fluttered in the silent breeze as he clasped his hands behind his back. A moment of silence passed as his eyes lingered on something in the distance. What is immortality? Senior Lee seemingly asked the heavens. Agelessness? A mountain does not age, yet it can be split in two. A tree does not age, yet it can be consumed by hellfire. If one can be reduced to dust, are they truly immortal? Senior Lee then turned to gaze intently at Ashlock's trunk. His eyes appeared as infinite galaxies. What uses strength in a lower realm when someone like me could descend and obliterate you with a mere thought? When an insect crawls on the ground, do you even notice when you accidentally crush it underfoot? Did you not feel helpless when the Deo storm tore you apart? A sense of helplessness washed over Ashlock as Senior Lee stared him down. After a moment, Ashlock blurted out, What's the purpose of cultivating if there's always something stronger that can kill me like an insect? Or a random Deo storm can come along and snatch my life away. Senior Lee closed his eyes and the immense pressure Ashlock had felt disappeared. He laughed softly and responded, As you cultivate and grow stronger, the number of threats to your life diminishes until, eventually, you sit at the apex as a divine being beyond the heavens, with nothing left to challenge your existence. Only then are you truly immortal. Is such a thing even possible? Ashlock asked as fleeting dreams played through his mind. Surely, if he were about to become the strongest, those at the top would suppress him. Senior Lee slowly opened his eyes and nodded. Indeed, it is. Otherwise, how would I have reached there? Does a mortal human care if an ant conquers their garden? Do they go out of their way to hunt down the king of the ants and extinguish them if they aren't a bother? Only the ants that invade a human's home, eat their food, and sting their foot earn the human's godlike wrath. So if I don't anger or draw unnecessary attention from those above, it's possible to reach the top. Ashlock asked. In a way, it made sense. He didn't go out of his way to kill mortal humans, as their deaths were meaningless to him. He didn't see them as threats, and their corpses wouldn't provide any credits. Was that how those lofty cultivators of higher realms thought? Was he just an insignificant twig to them? Senior Lee nodded. Grow slowly so as not to attract attention, raise those around you to be equally strong, and when it comes time to ascend, you will be able to with their help. That is why I believe you can break the cycle this universe has been trapped in. How so? You have the greedy ego of a human with the ability to think and scheme for your continued survival rather than the naive and nurturing ego of a world tree. Senior Lee grinned, it's that quality that leads me to believe you could become the first tree to bridge the gap between the highest realm and heaven. Only then can we launch an assault on heaven and free ourselves from this prison. Senior Lee then turned and began to walk away with his white robes and hair flying in the turbulent breeze, Ashlock, my time has come to an end, so I must go. I will see you at the top, my friend. And before Ashlock could reply, Senior Lee's body dissipated in the wind like smoke, and the world shattered like glass, suddenly becoming loud with noise. Chi reserves above the minimum threshold. Merge, complete. Sleep mode deactivated. The sun seemed to teleport through the sky indicating that it was late afternoon rather than midday, with a few clouds dotting the blue expanse. Ashlock glanced down at the bench and saw Stella fast asleep where Senior Lee had been sitting, yet the steaming cup of tea remained where the man had left it. So it wasn't a dream, Ashlock murmured to himself, gazing out at the horizon over the sea of red trees. The view was so foreign to him. If not for Stella lying on the bench, he might have believed he had been reincarnated on another planet. Where had the pavilion he called home gone? Had the Deo storm wiped it out? Also, why are there so many demonic trees? Ashlock wondered. Automatically established mycelium network with nearby trees. Ashlock felt a sudden influx of chi entering his body. Only now did he have a chance to examine himself, and he was horrified to see how small he had become. But in real time, he could feel his wood cracking as he rapidly grew upward with the chi from thousands of trees pouring into him. Estimated time until full recovery, seven days. System will remain in low power mode to maximize recovery speed. Hey, system. Can I use credits to speed up the repairs? Ashlock wondered, 
and the prompt silenced him. Estimated credits for full recovery, 7,260, insufficient balance. All right, never mind. I can spend a week planning what I want to do next. Everything was happening quickly, and he had much to contemplate. Senior Lee had provided him with a new perspective and long-term goals to strive for, such as a supposed monarch realm world tree in the Celestial Empire that wanted to devour him. So first I have to get as strong as the Patriarch, then survive the beast tide that wipes out entire demonic sex, and finally fend off a monarch realm tree at the heart of the Celestial Empire that wants to eat me so it can transcend this place and initiate the Era of Ascension. Ashlock took a deep breath and felt the air flow into his leaves, bringing peace to his mind. He was finally a spirit tree with limitless potential. The world was bleak and out to kill him, but somehow he felt optimistic about the future. He looked down at the bench and saw how the gentle breeze played with Stella's hair. It was easy to get caught up in long-term goals that might take eons, but for now, he would focus on and cherish each and every day as if it were his last. While lost in his thoughts, Ashlock was surprised when Diana crested the mountainside with a man in tow. Stella! Wake up! Diana shouted. Mr. Choi found us a rogue cultivator adept at construction. Stella stirred from her sleep and looked around in confusion. Didn't I fall asleep while leaning on Ash? How did the bench come back? She then pushed herself up and eyed the cup of tea while furrowing her brows. And who left tea here? While Stella was puzzled, Diana spoke with the man. Douglas, this is the Ash Fallen Sect, your new home. The large man with golden brown hair and muscles fit for a miner surveyed the mountain peak devoid of anything other than a rapidly growing tree and a single bench with a half-asleep girl sitting on it. You can't be serious, Douglas grumbled. What kind of sect is this? There's nothing here but a fucking tree. Diana replied in the flattest tone, exactly, that's why you are here to build what we lack. Eh, Douglas replied as he scratched his head, where the hell is your leader? I want to speak with them. Diana walked forward and bowed before Ashlock. Patriarch, I see you are still recovering, but can you grace us with your presence? Ashlock wanted to remain silent until he fully recovered, but since Diana asked so nicely, he felt it was only right that he took a look at his sex latest recruit. Douglas snapped his mouth shut as the rapidly growing tree split open, and an eldritch eye gazed upon his soul. He then shakily knelt down and lowered his head. Bloody hell, why in the Nine Realms is a tree glaring at me? Is this your patriarch? A tree. Ashlock hummed to himself. The man was a little rough around the edges, but with some training, he could serve the Ash Fallen sect well. The Deo Storm might have wiped out his pavilion and torn him apart, but in its wake, it had given him purpose and a chance at rebirth. A rebirth he planned to live out to the fullest by reaching for the stars and protecting those closest to him from harm. Chapter 91, Ash Fallen Sect's New Member Start of Book 2 the rebirth gave Ashlock an opportunity to retake control of his life as throughout his life in this new world, he had constantly felt forced into situations and compelled to react to threats as they arose. Naturally, such a lack of independence was expected from a human mind abruptly torn from the modern world and thrust into a tree with no warning or guidance and expected to flourish in an ancient world of cultivators where impulsive youths could imbue their weapons with the fire of their souls and attack him for the slightest grievance. It had been overwhelming and challenging, with each day feeling like a battle for survival. But experiencing the chill of death and having Senior Lee appear to explain his situation made him appreciate life more deeply. Although his system being temporarily offline for the next week and his cultivation rapidly recovering to its previous strength should have made him uneasy, Ashlock only felt relief as he finally felt in control. It might have been merely an illusion of choice provided by the system, but his mindset had significantly improved since fully becoming a tree. It was immensely satisfying to be asked if he wished to be free and to resolutely say no. This was now a life he had chosen and was ecstatic to have. As the late afternoon sun shone on his leaves and filled him with warmth and life, Ashlock tried to push aside the many threats and goals Senior Lee had laid out in his mind. The Patriarch, Beast Tide, and Monarch Realm World Tree in the Celestial Empire that wanted to eat him could wait as right now he was just a half-grown tree on a desolate mountaintop. The Deo Storm may have given him a rebirth of both body and mind, but it had also stripped away the pavilion he had called home for the last decade and he felt naked and exposed without those white walls and red vines surrounding him on all sides. This vulnerability was somewhat alleviated by the thousands of demonic trees encircling him, offering a fraction of their chi through the mycelium network. Each tree contributed a tiny amount, but combined, he could sense his chi intake was at least five times faster than when he had done it alone, and he knew that as the demonic trees evolved into spirit trees and grew his chi intake would only increase. 
Thanks for the help, Ashlock muttered. I'll pay you guys back once I have some chi to spare, but for now, keep helping Dad grow big and strong to protect you all, okay? A faint wave of happiness emanated through the network from the few demonic trees scattered throughout the vast forest that had been nurtured from his demonic seeds directly and were old enough to have developed a spirit. With the new demonic forest addressed, it was time to refocus on the humans. Since his system was offline, Ashlock had no way to check how much time had passed for him to complete his soul merge, so he didn't know the situation with the alchemy tournament as it was supposed to start a week or so from when the Deo storm struck, but that wasn't important for now. First, he needed to get his Ash Fallen sect in order. As Senior Lee had mentioned, the human ego that allowed him to form connections with the humans and raise them into dependable allies placed him above the other world trees that had been taken advantage of and ultimately perished. He planned to use this advantage to its fullest. The Ash Fallen sect was his sanctuary for nurturing and raising dependable allies, and in a world of egotistical cultivators fond of displaying wealth, first impressions were crucial. The rogue cultivator Diana had led up the mountain said some harsh words that hurt to hear but were true. There really was nothing up here except a tree on a desolate mountain. Not much for a supposed sect that had made some big claims and was running the entire region from the shadows. Despite the truth in rogue cultivator Douglas's words, Ashlock still had to assert his authority, so upon Diana's request, he demonstrated his presence by staring down the sect's newest member through his demonic eye. The muscular man with golden brown hair and some of the most chiseled muscles Ashlock had ever seen instantly knelt under his gaze and trembled like a leaf. Strangely, this scene reminded Ashlock of Senior Lee's comment that bodies were merely vessels for a person's soul. Back on Earth, Douglas could have been a world-class fighter that no one would dare confront due to his tall stature and formidable presence unless they were heavily armed. Yet, here in a cultivation world, he knelt from a mere glance from a superior being. Since Ashlock was already using his demonic eye to showcase his presence, he decided to examine Douglas's soul core, as that was one of the primary advantages of observing someone through his demonic eye. Douglas clenched his teeth as Ashlock's gaze intensified. Ashlock could see the man's quivering soul core desperately attempting to keep the turbulent earth chi within his body under control. Third stage of the soul fire realm with an impure spirit root, Ashlock mused as he slowly closed his bark to conceal his eye, feeling pity for Douglas. A bit too weak for combat, but should be suitable for construction with his earth affinity. Ashlock mused while closing his demonic eye. Of course, if Douglas impressed him with his efforts, Ashlock would be generous and send the man to the mystic realm for training, and if he truly amazed him, some truffles might find their way to him. However, that was for the future when Douglas had proven himself to be a reliable ally worth investing in, as, for now, Douglas was far from being fully integrated into the Ash Fallen sect. Ashlock had been lucky with Stella, as they had been together from the beginning, and Diana had spent over a year getting accustomed to how Ashlock did things before Stella showed up and formally introduced her to him. Though Douglas was about to get a crash course on the life and his position within the Ash Fallen sect, Ashlock almost felt bad for the man. Douglas's ranting and cursing about being glared at by a tree had angered the awakened Stella, and she was looking at the man with a gaze that could kill. I asked to see your leader, not be glared at by some cursed tree. Douglas yelled into the mountain as his hands continued to tremble on the stone. Sweat dripped from his hair, and his breathing was erratic. I was told my cousin would introduce me to a rebel sect. I expected it to be somewhat shabby, but this is absurd. Stop messing around, and let me see your leader. Intimidating me like this will get us nowhere. That was unexpected. Ashlock was curious about the sales pitch the girls had used to persuade people to come work here. He had anticipated mortals or maybe late chi stage cultivators to arrive, but a third stage earth affinity cultivator exceeded his expectations. Diana stood calmly beside Douglas. Her hand was slightly shaking, but she seemed to have mostly resisted his demonic glare. Nonetheless, her dull grey eyes observed the man and a faint frown appeared on her face. Patriarch, Diana spoke flatly, please forgive the man for his crude words. Douglas is a cousin of Mr. Choi, an old friend and was the only rogue cultivator willing to join our sect on such short notice. This was the second time Ashlock had heard the phrase, rogue cultivator. What made a cultivator rogue? Was the man a criminal or something? Regardless, Ashlock was sure he would find out soon. His cultivation was still recovering, so he didn't want to waste chi on telekinesis to communicate, so he flashed a single leaf once to say yes. I thank the patriarch for your kindness, Diana said and then she turned to Douglas, who was slowly rising on his wobbly legs. Introduce yourself and then take the oath to join the Ash Fallen section. 
The man was a mess, but he finally found his balance. He took a deep breath and said, My name is Douglas Terraforge, and no, I won't take the oath. A brief silence passed, and Diana scowled. Either recite the oath or die. Now, just rein in your fucking temper for a moment, miss. I think we got off on the wrong foot here. Douglas took another shaky breath and continued. Please understand that signing an oath is close to a bloody slave contract. I only followed you up this damnable mountain with expectations that haven't been met. What did you expect? Stella said coldly from the bench while leaning on its armrest. Where is this fucking hostility coming from? Douglas replied, I apologize if I offended your patriarch. But cut me some slack, okay? It's just the first time I have seen people taking orders from a fucking tree before. Stella frowned and glanced back at Ashlock he could feel the brief warmth in her eyes, which then transitioned back to cold when she looked back at Douglas. This tree, as you call it, is our patriarch. He is currently recovering after defending against the Deo storm that nearly destroyed Dark Light City, but at his peak strength, he is in the Star Core realm. She then gestured around. I'm sure you saw the ferocity of the Deo storm from the streets of Dark Light City? Such a storm naturally wiped out the beautiful pavilion left behind by my family. That is why there is nothing here except us and a rapidly regrowing tree. Douglas nodded. I see, so the ash fallen sect consists of you two rude women and a tree. Diana reached over, gripped his shoulder, and said in a low, threatening tone, We are fine with sharing our secrets only after you recite the oath and stop insulting us. Douglas shrugged. The way I see it, I'm dead either way. You two are clearly far stronger than me since I can't guess your cultivation stage, and that spirit tree made me quiver with just a glance. I'm simply asking for some clarification on what I'm even swearing a fucking oath for. Honestly, the man was more confrontational than Ashlock assumed most were used to in this world, as most just bowed to the strong without question, but he liked the guy's attitude. So he flashed his leaf and groaned when he saw the timer in the corner of his interface add another half an hour to his recovery time. Diana saw his flashing leaf and removed her grasp from the man's shoulder. Fine. Stella can explain things to you. Perfect, Douglas said. I just need to know some surface-level details. I understand the pavilion was taken away in the storm, so it's just you three. I can't believe I'm including a tree as a person. Well, you better get used to it. Stella crossed her arms under her chest. The Ash Fallen sect is the true ruler of this land. Douglas seemed confused, isn't that the Red Claws? The Red Claws answer to us and have already recited oaths of loyalty, Stella snapped back, silencing Douglas. With just us three, we fended off and eradicated the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families and ruled the entire region from the shadows. As some random schmuck, you have been brought here to construct a place befitting of us. With what? Douglas replied. What? Stella stopped her ramblings and glared at Douglas clearly infuriated at how he didn't care about everything she had just claimed. You want some majestic palace to show off your big egos, right? So what do you plan to build it from? Hopes and dreams. Douglas continued as Stella furrowed her brows, do you have an architect? What about a budget for the materials? Or mortals to furnish the place? Ashlock felt a little foolish. Although he had left the girls to handle the job, he had seen how the Whitestone Palace had been constructed. Hundreds of mortals had streamed up and down the mountainside like worker ants. To expect a single cultivator to do the entire thing himself was unreasonable. Douglas continued to rant. As some random schmuck, did you expect me to build an entire palace at a wave of my hands? Should I also keep the place clean for you once it's built? Should I dress up in a maid outfit and sing a song for you fine ladies? Shut up, Stella shouted, and some of her immaturity leaked through her confident facade. Before Douglas could retort, Diana stepped in and lectured the man with as much enthusiasm as a dead fish. Douglas, we have many people to rely on. Even if you can't see them, they're here. We have connections in the city, including Mr. Choi. We can mobilize the Red Claws to secure as many mortal servants as needed, and there's an abundance of building materials all around. If that's not enough, we have thousands of dragon crowns on hand to purchase anything. Diana's rant reminded Ashlock that he needed to get the Red Claws back to work. Sadly, they were buried deep in the mine, under thousands of meters of rock, waiting out the Deo storm, and he didn't want to add another day to his recovery time to portal them out. Fine, Douglas crossed his arms. If what you say about the resources at your oh-so-powerful sex disposal is true, I don't mind reciting the oath. 
but let's be clear, constructing a palace with a wave of my hand is beyond my abilities. However, I could carve some rooms into the mountain right now. For some reason, Ashlock had been far too focused on getting that sense of safety that being surrounded by pavilion walls gave him. When the actual logical solution all along had been to build the Ash Fallen sect inside the mountain. Now that Douglas brought up the idea, it seemed almost too perfect for many reasons. First, building a giant shiny palace atop a mountain was an ideal way to blow their cover and attract the attention of others when the Red Claw's White Palace was supposed to draw everyone's attention. Second, it wasn't certain if the Beast Tide included monsters capable of burrowing through rock, but the Deo Storm had taught him that above-ground structures were futile against cataclysmic events unless they were runically enchanted. Finally, his hollowed-out roots could serve as tunnels to connect the rooms. He should have Douglas start in the mine and work his way up from there. Ashlock decided to use a little bit of chi to manipulate a rock and write out his plan on the ground, which earned a rather funny yelp from Douglas as a rock floated past his head. His plan? Have Douglas take a ride down his route with the help of Diana and then dig a tunnel to get everyone out of the mine. His only hope was Larry wouldn't try and eat the new guy. Chapter 92, A Bizarre Sect Douglas tried to ignore the awkward tension in the air as he finally felt the shivers that ran through his body subside. It was difficult, but he pushed the terrifying truths he had seen in the spirit tree's ageless gaze to the back of his mind. He had come here at the request of his cousin, Mr. Choi, to whom he owed a lot after fleeing the Terra Forge family in his youth. However, although he greatly respected his cousin, he never expected to be deceived like this. His cousin had made this elusive ash fallen sex sound like the place of his dreams, where he would finally be recognized as a valuable member and be surrounded by people capable of fighting against the Blood Lotus sect and the cruel noble families he had come to despise so much over the years. Yet, there was far less here than he had been promised. Even taking a step back and overlooking the lack of a pavilion due to recent events, there were only two members of the sect, and neither were in the Star Core realm. Of course, they claimed they were taking orders from this enigmatic tree, which was shedding its bark as it grew upward at an alarming rate. But even if the tree was as powerful as they claimed, everyone knowledgeable about spirit trees understood that they weren't much different from ordinary trees, except for producing slightly better fruit or having bark imbued with chi, making it more valuable. But a spirit tree smart enough to even talk? Order around humans? It was inconceivable and he wasn't seeing it a rock flew too close to his head with enough speed to make a whooshing sound past his ear that woke him from his inner stupor. Douglas immediately looked toward Stella as the culprit, as he had felt a hint of spatial chi leaking from her when she had thrown that brief tantrum earlier. Foolish child trying to take my head off when I wasn't looking, Douglas cursed to himself but was surprised when Stella followed the rock and watched it scrape against the ground. Had it not been her? The patriarch is conversing with us, Diana said confidently, as if that made any sense. Douglas knew trees couldn't control rocks, nor were they literate. Curious, he walked over and was surprised that Diana made no move to stop him. Even Stella didn't pay any attention, her full focus on the squiggles on the ground. Douglas squinted hard at the etchings but couldn't make sense of their meaning. Are they pulling my leg? This is just a load of random squiggles. Although they do look a little similar to the runic language I know. He honestly half believed this entire situation was one massive joke set up by his cousin. His suspension of disbelief could only be stretched so far before he threw his hands up and demanded to be let in on the joke. Stella was busy murmuring to herself, and Douglas could see the seriousness on her face through the gaps in her blonde hair. She wasn't really his type, but he could appreciate a beauty when he saw one, and seeing her reading some squiggles for an elaborate joke was rather endearing, he had to admit. Okay, I got it. Stella straightened her back and turned to him. Once you say the oath and pledge your loyalty to the Patriarch of the Ash Fallen Sect, we can continue. Did your tree tell you that? Douglas carefully held back his smirk when he saw the coldness in Stella's eyes. Whoa, all right, fine. Truthfully, he had planned to say the oath from the beginning. He had been unable to find any employment back in Dark Light City due to his less than stellar track record and lackluster skills. So when his cousin contacted him for this job, he was thrilled. Even if these girls wanted to pretend and live in their delusions, it was fine by him as long as he got paid. Being a cultivator wasn't cheap, and he had a mountain of debt to clear off sooner rather than later. Life as a rogue cultivator was hit or miss with job offers, and he had an addiction to beast cores that needed to be satisfied. Not only would he go insane if he let the heart demons win, but if his cultivation remained stagnant at the third stage of the soul fire realm, his enemies would soon surpass him and come knocking. 
Douglas looked at Stella's serious face before shaking his head and heading to the tree. You want me to pledge loyalty to the tree, right? Loyalty to the Ash Fallen sect, which the tree is the patriarch of, so yes, Stella confirmed with a nod. Douglas looked at the tree's cracking and warping trunk as it rapidly grew upwards. It was a marvel to witness, and his hand still shivered slightly from the memories of that gaze. Undoubtedly, this tree was special, and he was curious to learn more about it. The things I do for a paycheck, Douglas cursed as he wet his lips, closed his eyes, and made his link with heaven through meditation. He brought his hand up to his chest and rested it near his soul core as a sign of respect, even if he thought they didn't deserve it. I bet this oath won't even work. There's no way heaven acknowledges this ash fallen sect as a real thing, Douglas thought as the world's energies swirled around him. I, Douglas Terra Forge, pledge my loyalty to the ash fallen section. Douglas tensed up as he felt tremendous pressure descend upon him. It was as if an eye of heaven was glaring down at him and recording his every word with intense scrutiny. Holy shit, the ash fallen sect is recognized? Douglas couldn't believe it. Fools did fake oaths all the time. Heck, he had done a few throughout his life, but he had never felt heaven's interest in an oath this intensely before. Gulping and keeping his eyes closed, Douglas continued with the standard pledge of loyalty. If my loyalty is to falter, may my cultivation be forever crippled and my heart demons unleashed upon my unfaithful soul. And he truly meant it. To heck with the ash fallen sect being two girls playing the most well-crafted joke this was serious business. As those final words left his mouth, he felt a chain of heaven's intent wrapping around his soul core. It was cold, and he almost wanted to clench his chest from the chill, but he kept his hand steady. He could tell the phantom chain led out his body toward the spirit tree before him. He instinctively knew that any betrayal to the ash fallen sect would result in the chains fading away and allowing the heart demons to devour his soul core. Most curious was how he had sworn loyalty to the ash fallen sect, yet the chain linked to the tree rather than to an abstract concept of community that dictated most sects. It was as if the tree was the ash fallen sect, and he could tell that his oath would be voided if the tree perished. A sect entirely run under the canopy of a spirit tree, Douglas murmured as he opened his eyes and saw the tree in a new light. For a tree to earn the direct interest of heaven was a feat that he could only marvel at. Perhaps the tree was responsible for far more than it was letting on. A clap from Stella across the empty mountain peak drew his attention. All right, Douglas. Stella smiled, but it was cold and almost scary as if she knew something he didn't. You will be going with Diana down into the mines. Douglas felt his mind freeze. Dark memories of him taking on work in the mines for meager pay during his darkest hours made him break out in a cold sweat. That one memory of him running out of chi in the middle of a mine collapse and being buried for two days because there was no air to waste on circulating his breathing technique to recover his chi made him shiver. Mines. He blurted out, I thought you hired me for fucking construction. Not to crawl around on my hands and knees in the dark for some darn spirit stones. Hire some mortals for that shit. Stella glared at him with a look that could kill. Douglas, you schmuck, stop interrupting me and let me finish. Maybe then we can actually get something done today. That was fair. Douglas had been a little confrontational since arriving here, but it wasn't his fault. Everything had been so far from expectations, and everyone here was so unreasonable. Stella huffed, and then, after seeing Douglas remaining quiet, she continued, as I was saying before being so rudely interrupted. You will join Diana down in the mines. Your first task will be building a tunnel from the mine to the outside so the people trapped there can escape. What people? Douglas asked, why are they trapped down there? Stella waved him off, don't worry about that. Just take this. She held her arm out, and a black cloak materialized in her hand out of thin air. There was no flash of gold from the many spatial rings decorating her fingers, nor any whiff of spatial chi. How had she done that? Douglas had to admit he was impressed and eyed the cloak with a hint of awe as Stella approached and shoved it into his hand. Wear this cloak. As the newest member of the Ash Fallen sect, we need to keep your identity well hidden. This is a cloak of concealment. It comes with a big hood to hide your face. That's it. Douglas had to admit the cloak was made of decently soft and durable material, and it was equipped with a massive hood he would expect cultists to wear, but did such a cloak with that name really do nothing impressive? Yeah, that's it. Stella shrugged, Diana will also give you a mask. Just keep your mouth shut down there and follow Diana's orders. Don't interact with anyone if possible. What Douglas tried to ask more questions but was interrupted as something was shoved into his other hand. A mask. 
he mumbled, inspecting the black wooden mask. Put it on, a slightly distorted voice he recognized as Diana said. Looking up, he saw the black-haired girl wearing an almost identical mask to his, but it was bone white. All right, all right, Douglas grumbled as he fastened the mask to his face, put his arms through the cloak, and tightened it around himself. He couldn't see himself, but he guessed he looked rather menacing. Looking good, Diana said flatly as she gestured for him to follow her. We'll take the fast route down. Fast route? Diana nodded. Yeah, it's right down here. Walking over and following her gaze, he saw a dark hole in the ground that seemed to lead to a tunnel of some kind upon closer inspection, he noticed it looked like the inside of a tree root. You want me to go down here? How far is it? Douglas felt at ease when surrounded by rock, but a thick tree root wall between him and the mountain rock would isolate him from his environmental strength. Diana was already climbing into the hole with water from the air liquefying around her hands. Don't worry, just follow me and keep your head facing upwards if you don't want to drown. It was impossible to tell if she was joking or serious, with the creepy white mask obscuring her facial features and her flat tone. However, the strange woman had already vanished into the hole, and he could barely see the tip of her head at this point, so he reluctantly began to climb down into the tunnel. Not coming. He asked Stella, who had returned to the bench and was lying lazily under the tree's canopy with a smile on her face, and her eyes looked suspiciously full of endearment at the rapidly growing tree. She tilted her head toward him at his words and scowled. Just leave Tree and me alone. Oh okay. He felt like scratching the back of his head in confusion but couldn't take the girl's wrathful glare that hinted at her peak stage cultivation realm. Why was nobody in this sect normal? What had his foolish cousin roped him into? With a sigh, he allowed the dampness of the tree root to engulf him, and he began to fall, and fall. Faster and faster. Concern rose quickly in his chest as the wind howled past his ears and he plummeted through the mountain. Was this an elaborate way to assassinate him? He was confident that he would survive the fall with his sturdy body, but he would need a few moments to heal with a pill. Was Diana waiting at the base with a dagger, ready to slit his throat? His heart pounded in his chest, and his soul core hummed as the earth chi he had stored up in his body rushed to reinforce his legs to brace for the incoming impact. He felt his entire body tense up, and just as he sensed the ground drawing near, he hit a wall of freezing water. Ugh Douglas choked as water smacked him in the face and rushed into his mouth and nose. Diana's advice of keeping his head up echoed in his mind as he plunged through the water and landed on a floor with far less speed than before. Coughing up a lungful of water while crumpled on the ground, Douglas rolled over to see Diana standing there, looking down at him with her hands on her hips. You didn't listen to my instruction about keeping your head up, did you? Douglas groaned in response as he tried to push himself up and walk on his shaky legs. I did listen. No, you didn't, Diana snapped back. Now you're wasting my time, being pathetic because your brain is too full of useless thoughts. Douglas then felt all the freezing water weighing down his clothes, being pulled away by a mystical force and gathering in a ball above Diana's open palm. Today has been the worst, Douglas thought as he finally got to his feet and towered over Diana. However, she had already turned her back on him and begun making her way down the mushroom-lit tunnel. It was at this moment he truly felt like a lackey. Sighing, he trudged behind the woman and marveled at the luminescent mushrooms. Then when there was a fork in the tunnel, a black root he hadn't even noticed on the floor suddenly lit up with lilac flames. The patriarch is guiding us to his people, Diana said flatly as she followed the flames down the widest tunnel, these mushrooms are also his creation. Douglas remained quiet, but he had to admit the tree continued to impress him. He had spent his fair share of time in the mines, and lighting was always an issue, yet he had never seen such a simple solution. The mushrooms that emitted a blue glow were a great idea. After a while, Douglas could hear the echoes of chatter emanating from deeper within the tunnels. Before they rounded a corner, Diana stopped and looked him up and down. Douglas, don't speak a single word unless I give you permission. Understand. Her voice was a whisper imbued with chi, but it reached his ears with unsettling wetness. We have a facade to maintain that ensures loyalty around here and I don't need your loud mouth ruining things. Douglas could feel the threat of instant death dripping from every word, so he resolutely nodded without saying anything luckily, that seemed to appease the woman. Good follow me. Diana turned and rounded the corner. Douglas obediently followed and marveled at the expansive cavern he was greeted with. However, the cavern didn't impress him so much as the number of people. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, 
were gathered around a seemingly artificial stream running through the cavern's center. There was a strong smell of food wafting from the far embankment of the river, where he saw many mortals gathered around small mountains of belongings and quietly chatting among themselves over bowls of food. Meanwhile, on the closer side, Douglas noticed many cultivators sitting in stone-cold silence. An awkward tension existed between the two groups, but their arrival quickly drew the cultivators' attention first, likely due to their use of spiritual sense. A sudden burst of flames appeared a step before them, vanishing a second later and leaving behind an aged man with sharp eyes and crimson hair. To Douglas's surprise, the man, whose heavy presence indicated he was in the Star Core realm, gave a deep bow to Diana despite her being an entire realm below him. Grand Elder of House Red Claw humbly greets the Ash Fallen sect. The Grand Elder spoke calmly, and within moments, many other elders from the Red Claw sect rushed over to bow alongside him. Raise your heads. Diana barely paid the Red Claw's attention and walked between them, surveying the cavern for something. Mistress, if you will forgive the question. The Grand Elder wore a worried expression. Diana tilted her head over her shoulder, what? Our peak. Dark Light City the Blood Lotus sect. The Grand Elder chose his words carefully, his shaky voice betraying his true thoughts, does anything remain after the fearsome Deo storm has ravaged the lands? Diana chuckled and waved the Grand Elder off as she ventured deeper into the cavern, the immortal handled it there's no problem. That is truly unfortunate wait, what? The Grand Elder caught himself mid-sentence, his jaw hanging open. Your lack of faith in the Ash Fallen sect displeases me. Diana was now near the stream, and Douglas felt the urge to hurry over and join her as she casually strolled about like she owned the place. I. I. The Grand Elder was at a loss for words, I will repent. Forgive me. Don't bother. Diana replied coldly, just gather everyone near the river's source. This oaf over here will dig a tunnel to get you guys out, and you can see the situation yourself. Although I will mention it's a different world out there. Quite a few more, trees. Douglas wanted to retort the insult since it made him feel foolish in front of many powerful cultivators and one of the noble family's grand elders. But he let it slide and quietly followed Diana alongside a large group of cultivators and curious mortals, making sure to keep his hood down. Once they approached the wall at the far end of the cavern, Douglas could see the hollowed-out tip of a black tree root poking through rock, with crystal-clear water gushing out. All right. Diana pointed to the wall beside the pipe on the cultivator's side, under Lord. If you follow this pipe, you will create a tunnel to the outside, eventually. Underlord? Was that his secret name? Not wanting to get scolded for asking questions, he went along with the context clues and placed his hands on the stone wall to begin his technique, but Diana interrupted him. You need to make it very wide. Douglas just grunted in response. What did she mean by wide? He spread his arms out as if indicating how wide she wanted it, and the masked woman shook her head make it wide enough for ten people across and five people tall. Hey? Did she understand how much chi such a feat would require him to use? Seeing his confusion, Diana helpfully added, it needs to be wide enough for Larry to get out. Anything smaller simply won't do. Deepening his voice as much as possible to mask his identity, Douglas replied, who's Larry? His curiosity got the better of him, and he also wanted to know because he believed Diana was mistaken. Who could be ten people wide? Diana's hand twitched as a blade to slice his throat appeared in a flash of gold between her fingers, but she relaxed at his simple question. Take a look for yourself. There was a commotion behind him. Turning with apprehension, Douglas saw the crowd of mortals and cultivators part as a shadow loomed over them. He stumbled back a step and felt the cold stone against his back as a monstrous creature loomed into view. The most enormous spider he had ever laid witness to stared him down with scarlet eyes that seemed to glow in the dull blue light of the mushrooms filling the cavern. Diana walked over without fear and patted the monster's leg, which looked like a tree beside her. This is Larry, the patriarch's pet. Douglas paled. That thing's a pet? Wait, who is this little guy? Diana said as a small black snake smoothly made its way down her arm and carefully coiled around her neck like an exotic necklace. The little snake's pink tongue poked out and licked Diana's neck with curious affection. Douglas just stood there frozen. What in all the nine realms was going on? Chapter 93, The Infamous Oaf Ashlock observed the entire scene through his spiritual sight, facilitated by his roots that covered nearly every inch of the cavern. He hadn't actually told Diana where to instruct Douglas to dig the tunnel, he had simply assumed the Earth Affinity Cultivator could peer through the rock or something and determine the optimal route. Her words, however, 
rang true. If Douglas created a tunnel beside the Black Route, they would find themselves a thousand meters up a mountain close enough to the ground, in his opinion. He had to admit that there was a certain satisfaction in watching an egotistical cultivator shiver against a wall while confronting something he considered nothing more than a pet. Once again, he hadn't instructed Diana to tell Douglas to make the tunnel wide enough for Larry, but she had taken his pet into account and even sought out the spirit beast when she entered the mine. Now little Kai has taken a liking to her, Ashlock mused as he observed the tiny F-rank grass snake coil around her neck. He felt happy when all his sect members, including his pets, got along. Regrettably, he knew this harmony was only temporary. Eventually, he would need to expand the Ash Fallen sect, as he couldn't tackle every issue alone. Having Stella and Diana around had already saved him from death on numerous occasions, and both his pets were also contributing to his continued survival. Hopefully, little Kai can advance to S grade soon. That way, I can have Larry protect me, Maple watch over Stella, and finally, little Kai take care of Diana. Ashlock was aware that it would require a significant amount of time and many hunting trips to elevate Little Kai to such a level, but with his mystic realm and the ability to teleport people within his sphere of influence, once he extended his roots far enough into the wilderness, he could send Diana and Kai on missions. Reigning in his wandering thoughts, Ashlock shifted his focus back to the cavern and saw that Douglas had begun working. The solid rock appeared to morph around him and then crumble to dust as he advanced. Due to Diana's request to widen the tunnel, he had to move sideways more often than forward to enlarge it. This continued until he paused and approached Diana, who was conversing with the Red Claws. What do you want? Diana inquired over her shoulder. When Douglas didn't reply with gestures, she summoned a dagger to her hand again and tilted her masked head, speak, oaf. What is it? Can I make the tunnel through the mountain and then expand it afterward for that thing air, I mean Larry? Douglas spoke gruffly through the mask, my chi reserves are running low so I need to take a break soon to recover. Ashlock was almost taken aback by how polite he sounded, although his accent remained rather rough. Diana slowly nodded, that does make sense. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Douglas wandered back to the tunnel and resumed his work. Ashlock had given the man the E-grade cloak of minor concealment he had received from the sign-in spree he had conducted before the Deo storm. With Douglas's large size, a cloak darker than night that didn't reflect light, and the black wooden mask, the man looked like some kind of undertaker who would patrol a misty cemetery with a metal shovel. After a few minutes, Ashlock grew bored of watching Douglas effortlessly tunnel through the rock and planned to return to the surface, but he caught a conversation between a Red Claw elder and a youth at the last moment. Is that big oaf really part of the Ash Fallen sect? He seems so weak compared to the others the youth began to ask the elder, and Ashlock was baffled by how swiftly the color in the elder's face drained away, as if he had seen a ghost. Hundreds of conversations occurred in the cavern, and just like when he was a human in a busy train station, it was all white noise until his brain latched onto certain keywords that interested him, such as his name or in this case, the Ash Fallen sect. Even as a mountain range spanning tree, his focus could only be on one thing in a single place at a time. However, he naturally honed in on this particular conversation because, unlike the one Diana was having with the Red Claw Grand Elder, which consisted of mere pleasantries and trivial talk, this one smelled of drama. And what else was a sick tree recovering from a near-death experience supposed to occupy his time with other than eavesdropping? Even his system had abandoned him for the next week. When those words left the youth's lips, the elder had already spun around and clamped a hand over the boy's mouth. Don't ever say such a thing. Why the boy started through the elder's hand but was silenced by a glare. The elder glanced around the cavern quickly and then spoke in a hushed whisper, if an immortal from the heavens above descended and called the Blood Lotus Patriarch a dog do you dare refer to the Patriarch in the same manner? Words are relative. An oath to the Ash Fallen sect is an existence that rivals our Grand Elder's authority to us. The boy's eyes widened at his Elder's words. You see that cloak he's wearing? The Elder said, and the boy slowly nodded. It's of perfect quality. I saw it up close. Every stitch seemed as if the gods themselves crafted it. If something appears mundane in this world, Look closely at the fine details, and the truth will be revealed. Do you believe an oaf of our level could wear such a thing? The elder took his hand from the boy's mouth, and the obedient youth kept his yapper clamped shut. Those who flaunt their wealth or cultivation are fools true masters lurk in the shadows and conceal their true power until the final moment since those who flaunt are the first to perish. The elder offered a genuine smile and ruffled the boy's hair, so if you don't want to die, don't go around calling a grunt worker from the sect above us an oaf. All right. 
the boy nodded vigorously and then ran off to the other youths, likely to spread the news. Ashlock felt that the elder had taught a valuable lesson, even if he did find it amusing that they thought he cared that much about Douglas. Perhaps in the future, he might care, but for now, he had only known the rude man for a few hours, and his first impressions had been subpar at best. In truth, he had sent the man down into the mines to get him away from Stella, as she wasn't in a good mood right now, and he was being confrontational. Douglas was already learning his place within the sect after only a few hours, but it would take a bit longer for him to mature and for Stella to mentally recover from seeing Ashlock's charred stump. He could have wasted a day's worth of chi to form a portal to get everyone out or widen the hollowed-out route that provided the cavern with water and let people escape that way. Both options would slow his recovery, but getting them out as soon as possible was necessary the surface needed the red claws. Just from a quick glance after he returned to the surface with his eye of the tree god, he could see that Dark Light City was now overrun with demonic trees, and people were out in the streets trying to chop them down. I hope none of the homeless kids try to fill their bellies with poisonous berries. Ashlock cursed at the thought. He needed to get back to his full power to regain control over his surroundings, but for now, he would have to rely on his subordinates to fill in for him, and for that, they needed to escape the cavern. Naturally, looking at the trees also led Ashlock to question the origin of these demonic trees. His best guess was the cursed blood he had unlocked just before the storm. The question now on his mind was whether he would have survived even without turning the storm into trees. His roots delved deep into the mountain, and even with such a small part of his trunk remaining, he had managed to survive. Maybe he would never know until another cataclysmic event came along to try and end his life. Hey, tree. Ashlock felt a small hand tapping on his trunk, so he returned to the courtyard and saw Stella still lying there, looking up at his canopy with a vacant expression. Ashlock flashed a leaf with Chi to show Stella he was listening and was happy to see it hardly added a few minutes to his recovery time. As his cultivation rapidly recovered, things got easier. If he had to guess, he would surpass the Chi realm within the next hour and then spend the next week shooting through the Soul Fire realm, and by the week's end, he would resume his previous state of cultivation. I really don't like that guy at all, Stella grumbled. One hand rested on his trunk, and her face was buried into her elbow. Although her expression was obscured, he could tell she was upset. Why did he expect me to know everything about his capabilities? I have never even met an Earth Affinity cultivator before. She then sniffled, was she holding back tears? That jerk then ranted at me about how to build things as if I'm an uneducated idiot. She then laughed sadly, I mean, I am uneducated, but that's not my fault. There was nobody there to teach me. Tree, what should I do? If every new person in the sect is smarter than me, they will think the Ash Fallen sect is run by idiots like me, and then you might look bad. Ashlock found it unfortunate that her insecurities were flaring up again. She was such a bright and capable person, but she failed to see it, as there was never anyone around her while she grew up to offer words of encouragement or advice. It pained him to see her so distraught. Without a mentor for cultivation, she was already touching the Star Core realm at 16 years old, and from what he had seen, that was unbelievably impressive. She'd also learned to translate an ancient runic language in a single year, and considering her somewhat lack of social experience, she had handled meetings with grand elders hundreds of years her senior with style. She was an exceptional person all around, and he was incredibly proud of her. So, to see her lying on the bench and feeling like a failure somewhat enraged him. But at the same time, he could understand her plight. He hated to admit it but she wasn't exactly the best person to be the face of the Ash Fallen sect due to her lacking education, especially in politics. It had worked out so far, but her immaturity sometimes snuck through, and she had yet to be confronted by someone she couldn't bully with her superior cultivation or with Larry backing her up. She needed time to grow up and learn the skills the other scions had. It was important to remember that she was years younger than both Diana and Douglas, so some inexperience was expected. The situation reminded Ashlock of those university graduate jobs that demanded years of work experience from someone who hadn't worked a day in their life. I should just let Diana handle everything, Stella grumbled as her arm fell to the side, and she looked up with red eyes at his canopy. Then I can stay here and protect you from harm while she handles all the annoying people. As endearing as that sounded, he didn't want a moody Stella hanging around him for the next week. He had a lot to plan and needed to focus on recovering. Looking within himself, he saw his dim star core slowly refilling with chi that funneled in from his leaves and the many demonic trees around him. Luckily, since he still had a star core, 
he could manipulate qi outside his body despite being limited to the peak stage of the qi realm. Because of this, he looked around the desolate mountain peak. The storm had destroyed almost everything. Even the badly damaged runic formation surrounding him had been ripped apart, and only shards remained here and there. Using telekinesis, he grabbed one of these shards with a pointed end to write on the stone nearby. Stella turned her head toward the sound and slowly read aloud what he had written. Just keep doing your best. That's all I will ever ask for. Stella held back a sniffle, that's so kind, tree. The scratching sound continued as Ashlock wrote out one last line. Now stop crying so I can sleep. Stella read and then laughed while she wiped her tears away. Okay, okay. Sorry, tree. I'll let you sleep and go cultivate. Stella wiped away the tears on her sleeve and got up from the bench. Then, after a long stretch and slapping her cheeks to wake herself up, she looked around the empty mountain with a frown, wait, where can I cultivate? There's no runic formation anymore. She wandered over to the approximate area where the last runic formation courtyard had been. She had to step over some piles of rubble, and there was still the general outline of where the pavilion had been as the foundations had survived the storm. Surprisingly, the runic formation was still there. Although it was just a husk of its former glory, as the silvery spirit stone lines hadn't survived the storm. Stella crossed her arms and hummed to herself as she wandered around, seemingly trying to think of a solution. Only then did Ashlock realize Stella had only ever cultivated within a runic formation. When she built that massive runic formation that had surrounded him while he was asleep all those years ago, he had felt the drastic change when he woke up. The formation had attracted and condensed all the chi in the nearby area around him, making cultivation easier. Stella began to grumble to herself as she kicked some random rocks, which ironically distracted him way more than she had while being moody. After a while, she gave up on her rock kicking and summoned some spirit stones to her hand from one of her spatial rings. The weird silvery metal reminded Ashlock of Mercury, and he watched as Stella inspected the rock, then looked at the runic formation, and then back at the rock. This continued for a while, and the frown on her face grew with every look. Eventually, she sat down on the runic formation and tried to jam the silvery rock into the grooves of the formation to little effect. It was obvious she had absolutely no idea what she was doing. Hadn't she claimed a few years ago that she had been the one to install the runic formation that surrounded him? No way she told me that just to sound more useful, Ashlock wondered. It was common for children to lie to their parents about their achievements. But the more he thought about it, he realized how silly he had been to assume a child could have constructed such a massive runic formation around him. She must have gotten some help from somebody. Ack, how can I fix this stupid thing? Stella cursed and stood up and began to walk toward Ashlock, maybe I should ask that schmuck Douglas how to do it. She paused mid-step from her own words and scowled, no, he will call me an idiot. I can figure this out. Ashlock sighed as he watched Stella march back to the runic formation with a newfound determination. She stood there with her eyes closed, and moments later, her golden spatial rings flashed with power, and a stack of books materialized. She sat down, picked a random one from the pile, and schemed the first page, nope, she said as she chucked it to the side and reached for the next one, nope, again. Leaving Stella to distract herself, Ashlock looked over the mountain with his eye of the tree god. From up above, he marveled at the beautiful sight. He didn't know how sustainable this mountain forest of demonic trees was, considering the lack of soil for nutrients, but he was sure he could work out a system of some kind to keep the forest alive. I could bring nutrients through my roots in the wilderness and exchange them with these demonic trees for chi, Ashlock mused as he debated the idea. Ascending a single stage in the star core realm had already been a tall order, but now that he was entirely a tree and his star core was the size of his trunk, he had a lot more chi to collect to ascend and he needed all the help he could get. He still couldn't believe a spirit tree was out there at the peak of the monarch realm. How long had it been cultivating to achieve such a level of power, or did it also have a system like him? Maybe he could ask the world tree if they ever met. He was sure he could grow his roots to meet theirs if given enough time, no matter how far apart they were. While Ashlock was observing the mountain range of demonic trees, he saw a streak of flame arching through the sky, and when he focused on it, he saw the Red Claw Grand Elder standing upon a sword of crimson as he zoomed toward the white stone palace that still stood after the Deo Storm. Oh, Douglas must have finished with the tunnel, Ashlock thought, glad his subordinates could finally return to work. But then he was distracted by a surge of chi through one of his roots. Switching views back to the mountain peak, Ashlock saw Douglas fly out of the hole in the ground that led to his hollowed-out route, 
followed by a water spout, and unceremoniously land on his face a few meters away. Diana, with little Kai wrapped around her neck, effortlessly followed and gracefully landed on her feet. She then looked around and spotted Stella surrounded by a mountain of books and furiously muttering to herself. Hey, Stella, Diana said flatly, what are you up to? Stella whipped her head around and scowled, learning about runic formations. Diana took off her mask and furrowed her brows, why? Just ask Douglas, it's one of the most common jobs of Earth Affinity cultivators, as only they can really turn the spirit stones into a liquid form unless you have an artifact. Why are you glaring at me like that? There was a tense moment, and then Stella hurled the book she was holding across the courtyard while huffing. Clearly annoyed at being told her efforts over the last hour had been futile and her only option was to ask Douglas to fix it. Ashlock seriously debated activating Hibernate and ignoring everyone for the next week. Chapter 94, Runic Formations Did someone mention Runic Formation? Douglas shouted, pushing himself out of the rubble he had fallen face first into. He was drenched, with a thick layer of dust from the wreckage covering him from head to toe. Even his brown hair had turned white from the grime. Diana casually walked over and effortlessly extracted the water and dust from Douglas's clothes, forming a ball above her palm that turned into a dusky snow globe. With a flick of her wrist, the water ball transformed into mist and was carried away by the wind. She then crossed her arms and lectured in a monotone voice, Stella, why are you in such a bad mood today? The Patriarch is recovering, and we have Douglas here to rebuild what was lost in the Deo storm. Stella scowled over her shoulder but then her eyes widened. Diana. Why is there a snake around your neck? MHM. Diana hummed until she remembered the tiny black snake. Oh, this little guy? Not entirely sure. He was sleeping on Larry's back and then took a liking to me. He's so cute. Stella ran over and extended her finger. The snake cautiously approached but reeled back and tried to hide behind Diana's neck. Hey, why is it scared of me? Maybe because you have a fat squirrel on your head. Diana rolled her eyes as Stella reached up and felt the soft white fur of Mabel. Ashlock witnessed how Mabel appeared out of nowhere and perched himself on top of Stella's head. Somehow, the squirrel seemed weightless, so Stella rarely noticed when he decided to sleep on her head. Mabel, when did you get here? Stella grumbled, and why do you keep running off? Where were you when the Deo storm hit? Ashlock was glad the squirrel didn't seem to mind people doubting him, as Mabel didn't react to Stella's words and continued to sleep likely recovering from the monstrous ability he had unleashed on the Deo Storm. He was still unsure of Mabel's full capabilities as that attack on the Deo Storm had been the closest to him actually getting a glimpse of what he could do. Ah, what a majestic squirrel. Stella grabbed Douglas's outstretched hand by the wrist, keeping it firmly in place. The giant man still wore his black wooden mask, so his expression was indiscernible, but the gasp of surprise told Ashlock that Douglas hadn't expected such a strong reaction to his innocent gesture. If you touch a single hair of Mabel's, Stella warned, don't blame your death on me. Mabel watched Douglas lower his hand to his side, and then seemingly satisfied, the squirrel closed his eye. Would Mabel have really killed Douglas? Hey, Mabel. I know you can hear me. I know Douglas and Diana aren't in the mutual pact, but please don't kill any of my sect members for small transgressions against you, okay? Their survival and growth directly benefit me. Mabel sprawled out on Stella's head with his limbs far apart but gave Ashlock a thumbs up. With the murderous squirrel under control, Ashlock realized that Larry was still missing. Expanding his spiritual sight, which now covered most of the mountain peak, he saw the massive spider crawling up the mountainside at a sluggish pace. The brute must be hungry, Ashlock mused. Larry had been confined to the cavern for some time and couldn't go hunting. Well, I need him to help translate for me up here as I don't want to waste chi while I'm recovering. He can go hunting after. Communicating with Larry required only a tiny bit of chi compared to controlling a slab of stone with telekinesis and accurately writing out a message. Douglas rubbed his wrist. Stella, I apologize for trying to touch your pet. No apology necessary. I should have warned you earlier since you two haven't been formally introduced. Stella pointed up at the dozing squirrel, this is Mabel. He emerged from a rift leading to a hellish dimension, where a monster with an eye many times the size of our patriarch lurked. He may appear cute, but he might be the strongest one here. Also, he is not my pet. Mabel, indifferent to both insults and praise, continued sleeping. Sometimes, Ashlock wondered if he had a pact with a mythical squirrel or if Mabel was actually a sloth in disguise. 
Douglas removed the black mask from his face and, taking Stella's warning seriously, examined Mabel as though he were a ticking time bomb. Stella shifted her focus from Douglas to Little Kai, the snake wrapped around Diana's neck. Have you named the snake yet? Diana hummed in thought, I don't think I should. It acts strangely friendly, like the patriarch's other pet, so it might already have a name. Just then, Larry crested the side of the mountain peak, and Ashlock informed him through the tether about the grass snake. Kaida, Larry declared gruffly, drawing the attention of the girls and Douglas. He is the newest guardian under Master's eternal guidance. Stella took a moment to translate the words in her head before gasping in understanding, so the snake is called Kaida, and is tree's pet like you. Larry slowly crawled closer and huffed a plume of ash from his mouth, Mistress, I'm far from a simple pet like that small snake that can do nothing but look cute. I am Master's faithful servant and part-time executioner. Sure you are, Stella rolled her eyes. Forgive my question, but you can understand the spider, ahem, I mean Larry. Douglas asked. The man tried to maintain his composure, but Ashlock could tell he was bewildered from watching the two speak in a language he couldn't understand. With pride, Stella practically stuck her nose in the air and switched back to the common tongue, of course, I can. The patriarch can only communicate via the ancient runic language, so I learned it. There was a brief pause as Douglas processed the information. He looked between the squirrel, Stella, and then Larry and eventually just shook his head. The ash fallen sect continues to surprise me. Douglas nervously chuckled as he rubbed the back of his neck, is there anything I can do to help? You mentioned something about a runic formation. Ah. Stella's joy instantly vanished, yes, our runic formations were destroyed in the Deo storm, and I tried to fix it myself. Formations. Douglas seemed surprised, you had two up here. Stella reluctantly nodded, there was a smaller personal one that my father used when he was still alive. It was constructed of high-quality stone and strengthened by runes to withstand stage ascensions up to the nascent soul realm. Douglas whistled in appreciation, that must have cost your family a small fortune to have built. Stella shrugged, no idea. It was here when I was born. Right. Douglas glanced around, and where was this other runic formation? Stella gestured with her chin toward Ashlock, I replaced the entire courtyard surrounding the patriarch with pre-made portable chi gathering arrays. Hey. Why did you do that? Douglas rubbed his chin. Well, long story short, there was an incident with lightning, the first of many, Stella smiled at the memory. Tree got knocked out, but I saw he was recovering slowly, so in desperation, I sold everything left in the pavilion of any worth and went to Dark Light City to buy those portable formations. Ashlock felt a mix of warmth and shock, knowing what Stella had done while he was asleep. The thought of such a young girl venturing into the city alone to sell items belonging to her family to create the chi gathering formation that had surrounded him broke his heart. Although it had been beneficial, he still cursed the lightning for causing such a situation. Douglas furrowed his brows, why didn't you just hire an earth cultivator to create one for you? I was about ten years old at the time and terrified everyone was out to kill me, Stella sighed. Also, it wasn't like I bought them all at once. I went down there and bought a few, brought them up here laid them around tree, and quickly realized I needed more. I only stopped once the old man at the shop started giving me an odd look, and I ran out of money. Douglas walked over and began inspecting the remnants of the central courtyard. Bloody hell, you filled this entire area with them? That must have cost a fortune. He then bent down and picked up a stone shard. And low-quality materials as well. No wonder it didn't survive the storm. Stella shrugged. Actually, that formation has been in disrepair for years. People kept coming here to fight, and they destroyed a bit of it each time. Honestly, I had been debating replacing it with something more proper, but I lacked the funds to do so Stella raised her fingers weighed down with golden rings. But now I have the wealth of hundreds of people stored in these rings. If there was one thing the Ash Fallen sect had, it was now a vast wealth. Of course, it wasn't sustainable income but it was a sizable bounty they acquired after slaughtering hundreds of evergreen and winter wrath cultivators. But if they wanted to hire many mortals and buy materials to create things, they would need a more reliable source of income, and Ashlock was still betting on alchemy to be the Ash Fallen sect's main export. That was why he wanted to keep pushing ahead for the alchemy tournament despite all the risk. Obtaining a top-tier alchemist, he could keep within the sect and have teach Stella or maybe Diana would be very beneficial. And who knows? Perhaps the Alchemist Tournament of Dark Light City could become a yearly event that brings in more wealth and talent to the city. 
Douglas's eyes lingered on the many golden spatial rings on Stella's finger and then grinned. Well, it just so happens I am for hire. We already hired you, Diana said flatly, petting little Kai's head. You belong to the Ash Fallen sect now. Ah. Douglas paused. Wait, we never discussed pay. Then he quickly added when Diana frowned, I won't demand any pay for spending a few hours building that tunnel, but if you want me to repair or build a runic formation, I will need at least a few dragon crowns for my efforts. Ashlock realized that Douglas's words were true. They had somewhat bullied the man into signing an oath without ever discussing the benefits or pay. Pay. Diana raised a brow interrupting Ashlock's musing. Why would a member of the Ash Fallen sect need payment? Douglas's expression darkened. I need payment. I have mountains of debt and beast cores to buy. Why else would I come and join your sect? Stella pulled one of the spatial rings free and tossed it to Douglas, who fumbled and almost dropped it. That should pay off your debts, and we will need to work on your beast core addiction, Stella said seriously, glancing briefly at Diana. Douglas put on the ring around his pinky finger and closed his eyes. A small glow of power emanated from the ring, and Ashlock could tell the man was searching its contents. Finally, his eyes snapped open, and he gasped, Is all this for me? Sure, Stella shrugged. I think it's rather pathetic you care so much about some wealth anyway when you are now a member of the Ash Fallen sect. Diana and I have grown tremendously in cultivating without needing dragon crowns or spirit stones although that might change soon now that our pavilion has been blown away. Ashlock suddenly got a terrible feeling that he had been spoiling Stella a little too much over the years with free cultivation resources and gifts. Had he acted like a rich parent and spoiled his child rotten? I don't know what to say, Douglas spoke slowly. This is more money than I have ever seen in my miserable life. How can I repay you? You want to repair the runic formation, right? I can do that right now. Seeing Douglas so appreciative of her gesture, Stella seemed to cheer up. That would be much appreciated, as trying to reach the Star Core realm without a runic gathering formation is a futile endeavor. Stella then crossed her arms. However, I want you to teach me about runic formations. Teach you. Douglas rubbed his chin. I can do that. What followed was Diana relaxing on a bench under his shade while Stella and Douglas stood over the runic formation that Stella used to use for cultivation before the silver lines were destroyed. Douglas got down on one knee placed a palm on the formation, and closed his eyes. I will return the runic formation to its original form first and then explain its function. Ashlock saw the hard stone covered in deeply engraved lines that were chipped and damaged seemingly morph into a watery, clay-like substance and then ripple as the engraved lines were wiped and redrawn. Once the runic formation looked new, Douglas opened his eyes. All right, the best place to start an explanation about runic formations is naturally the runes, also known as words of power. They are basic instructions that heaven understands. Depending on your goal for the formation, you will merge various arrays that are small collections of runes. Douglas then pointed toward the outer edge of the formation. Since this is a super basic chi gathering formation, it's simply one massive chi gathering array using the runic word for gather. However, most of the chi gathered by the array replaces the chi inside the spirit stone lines. Why would the chi be used by the array? Stella asked while Douglas brought out some spirit stones from the golden ring Stella had just given him. Well, you can't write words of power in the dirt with a stick heaven only recognizes instructions provided through intent, also known as chi, which the spirit stones contain. Douglas injected some of his own chi into the spirit stone, and it melted from a solid into a liquid, now resembling mercury. Although the formation could gather twice as much chi for you to use for cultivation, the spirit stones within the formation would need replacing regularly. So it's a cost versus performance thing. Slowly, Douglas brought out more spirit stones and filled all the grooves with the silver liquid. The grooves didn't look that deep, but Ashlock was surprised by how many spirit stones were needed to complete the formation. Such a small formation had gobbled up handfuls of spirit stones already, and it still wasn't complete. While Douglas was hard at work using his Earth Affinity Chi to transform the solid spirit stones into a viscous liquid, Stella was busy studying the runic words. Hey Douglas. What's the difference between this and the ancient runic language? Oh, that old language. Douglas mused. I am using a more streamlined version of that old language here. Fewer lines are needed to convey the same message to heaven, so it's cheaper, and runic formations using the new version can also be more compact. Does that mean I could make my own runic formations with the ancient language, then? Absolutely, those old runic masters are obsessed with it, Douglas replied. 
Runic formations that use the ancient language are ideal if you have a lot of wealth and room to work with, as they connect with heaven better and are therefore more efficient. But the language is mostly dead, and few bother to learn it, including me. Douglas then returned his focus to the chi-gathering formation full of spirit stones. Stella, come place your hands on the formation and activate it. All you have to do is direct heaven's will toward it to get the cycle going. Stella nodded and got down on her knees beside Douglas. She then placed her hands on the formation and closed her eyes. A moment later, the entire thing lit up with a silver glow, and through his spirit sight, Ashlock could feel the chi in the area gravitating toward the formation. And as he focused more, he could see that the silver lines absorbed around half the chi that gravitated toward the formation while the other half hung around within the formation's circumference as if there were an invisible bubble. Perfect, you can take your hands away now, Douglas directed Stella, and she complied by standing back up and looking at the active formation. Douglas then summoned an artifact from his spatial ring. It looked like a soldering gun with a hole in the top. Stella, this artifact lets you carve out lines in the stone, and then you put a spirit stone in the top, and the artifact converts it to liquid. The man then pushed the artifact into Stella's hand. Why don't you try it? You could rebuild whatever formation you want around the patriarch. I can direct you. Stella gripped the artifact in her hand and gave Douglas a weak smile. Thank you for this, Douglas. No, no, Douglas shook his head. Thank you for taking me in and helping me start a new life. The man tapped the golden ring on his pinky. The funds in here are more than enough to pay off all the debts that have been weighing on my mind for over a decade. Stella's smile grew a bit. That's nice. Then I hope you don't mind helping me cover every inch of this mountain in a chi gathering formation for tree. Air, that might be a bit much Douglas started. But he was swiftly silenced by Stella's excitement. Of course, that would just be the start. Can we create defense formations? Ideally, ones that can deflect lightning and pesky deo storms. Oh oh oh. How about one that increases the growth of trees? Is that possible? Douglas just let out a long sigh and pinched the bridge of his nose. Ashlock could feel the man's pain, but Stella raised some good ideas that he hoped they would implement over the next few days while he was out of action. It was going to be a hectic week Ashlock could already tell. Chapter 95, Tree Hates the Cold Night As the mountain was enveloped in the darkness of dusk, Ashlock observed Stella drawing lines on the ground with a paintbrush in one hand and a pot of black ink in her other. Ancient runic symbols painted by Stella surrounded him, which his language of the world skill seemed to automatically translate in his mind. As Stella went about her work of writing the ancient runic language onto the ground with the paintbrush, Douglas was watching from the sidelines and offering advice when Stella asked for it. However, his guidance proved disappointing. His initial lecture on runic formations had been helpful to Stella, but his knowledge beyond the basics was limited. It became clear that Douglas's expertise in runic formations was superficial at best, as though he had acquired the skill merely to pad his resume and secure higher paying jobs without actually being proficient. So you really know nothing about the ancient runic language? Stella inquired as she continued painting. Considering the size of the formation she wanted to create, Douglas had advised using his techniques to create the grooves rather than the handheld artifact he had given her. Douglas shook his head, as I said, those old fogies obsessed with runic formations learn it, but I've never been one to hole up in the library and study dusty books. All my runic knowledge was picked up here and there while working the trade. Stella grumbled to herself and Ashlock could tell the little bit of respect she had built up for Douglas this afternoon had vanished. Although Stella was uneducated due to her circumstances, she was a curious and bright girl who picked up things quickly. Because of her intellect, she did have the natural snobbish attitude studious people have toward muscle heads, which he could relate to. Back on Earth, he was the type of guy to spend most of his time glued to a chair playing games or studying. Perhaps that's why he reincarnated as a tree? It suited him, to be honest. Setting down the ink pot and brush, Stella stepped back and scrutinized her work. Are you sure there isn't a way to specialize this chi gathering formation for a tree? She asked her unhelpful assistant, and as expected, Douglas shrugged. Ashlock had concluded Douglas wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Diana, who had remained on the bench the entire time, gave her two cents, spirit trees cultivate with both their leaves and roots, right? Ashlock decided to confirm that with a flash of chi. Stella hummed to herself in thought, and then her eyes widened, I think I got it. So this runic formation just gathers chi and traps it within the area above the formation, right? Right. Douglas replied, 
clearly unsure of where Stella was going with this. So, is there any way to send the gathered chi into the stone below so Ash can absorb the chi with his roots too? Stella asked excitedly. Douglas rubbed his chin. It could work defensive formations make use of transfer arrays to channel the gathered chi to a storage array. In this case, you could just treat the tree's roots as the storage array and make use of several transfer arrays. Stella beamed. So, how should I do it? I will make the engraving super deep to reach the tree's roots and ensure the engraving is wide enough so there's room to add more engravings on the inside wall, which can be the transfer runes. You could also inlay it on top of the surface chi gathering runes, but it can muddle the meaning of the runic words and make them less efficient. Douglas then added gravely, but this formation will be extremely expensive. At least a hundred, if not a thousand times more spirit stones will be needed than what you used for your personal chi gathering formation. The sheer size of this endeavor is hard to fathom. Stella waved him off as she walked back to pick up the paintbrush. The patriarch's cultivation is priceless. He is the pillar of the ash fallen sect. If he had abundant chi to work with, the entire sect would prosper, and a few mere spirit stones are laughable in comparison. Amusingly, the first person to agree with Stella's assertion of Ashlock's importance was Larry, who had been quietly waiting off to the side of the mountain peak. The giant spider would have been crawling around his branches, but since he was ten times his original size, Ashlock doubted his branches could even support the colossal creature's weight. Master's recovery comes before anything else. Larry stated gruffly, and Stella nodded to the giant spider. See, Larry gets it. Diana and Douglas, both clueless about the ancient runic language, exchanged a puzzled glance. Douglas shrugged and walked closer to Stella. Are you done with the first layer of chi gathering runes? It's getting late, and I want to head to Darklight City to pay off my debts tonight. Oh. Stella turned her head, paintbrush still in hand. Are they even open this late? I thought most stores closed at dusk. Douglas blinked in confusion, then laughed. It began as a chuckle, but soon he was wiping tears from his eyes. Stella just stood there, pouting. What's so funny? She kept asking as Douglas tried to recover. Your innocence. Douglas started, but burst out laughing again. Sorry, sorry. Forgive me. He said between gasps, wiping his tears. Eventually, he caught his breath after much effort and tried to calmly explain, these debt collectors are people of the night. They don't run a store where I can just walk in. So it's more of a back alley situation. That's why I found it so funny, imagining those thugs running a store was hilarious. Back alley. Stella frowned. Doesn't sound like a great place to conduct business. You haven't run into debt before, have you? Douglas said bluntly, and Stella shook her head. Weirdly, Douglas suddenly had a warm smile on his face. He didn't say anything else, which seemed to irritate Stella even more, but they eventually returned to the matter at hand. Yes, I'm done with the outline. Stella placed the brush and ink pot into her spatial ring. You can do your part now. Sure thing. Douglas got on his knees, and within seconds of the man's hands touching the stone, Ashlock began to panic. It was as if he had been standing on solid concrete, and it suddenly transformed into mud underfoot. The solid stone ground he had felt so comfortable and liquefied and turned into viscous sludge. If not for his roots delving so deep into the mountain, Ashlock feared he would sink. In fact, his body did begin to sink slightly, and he felt his trunk being engulfed by the stone. Thankfully, the quicksand-like technique was finished within a minute, and Ashlock found himself surrounded by meter-wide and five-meter-deep engravings in the courtyard that followed Stella's paint. Through his spiritual sight via his roots, he could look up and see the sky through the gaps. Ashlock had never felt so exposed, as if he were naked, as ridiculous as that sounded. He then yelped as he felt Stella drop down into one of the gaps, which were barely wide enough for her to fit in. She then brought out the artifact that Douglas had given her and after inserting a spirit stone into the top, she began carving the ancient runic word for transfer into every available inch of rock. Make sure to use high-quality spirit stones for the transfer runes, Douglas shouted down into the hole. The spirit stone quality doesn't matter so much for the gathering runes, but for the transfer, quality is of utmost importance, otherwise, you will lose a lot of chi to the surrounding stone. Okay, Stella nonchalantly replied as she carefully carved out the runes. Before, she had just been painting with a paintbrush, so mistakes were more tolerable. However, it was clear from her determined face that carving into the rock was a more permanent affair requiring much more concentration. 
While Ashlock tried to get over the squirming feeling of someone walking on top of his roots, he watched Douglas walk off the mountain peak and begin to descend the mountainside. Although he had sworn loyalty to the Ash Fallen sect, Ashlock decided to keep tabs on the man to see what he would do. Larry, Ashlock said through the tether, tell Diana to tail Douglas. I want her to keep him safe. The spider huffed in acknowledgement and crawled over to where Stella was working. Ashlock wasn't only worried about betrayal, he also feared that Douglas would be taken advantage of. Stella was clueless about money, and Diana didn't seem to realize the implications of a man going to pay back a mountain of debt suddenly in full with a spatial ring full of wealth. The ignorance of rich kids. Debt collectors do want their money back eventually, but they prefer to keep their victims in eternal debt to keep the interest rate mounting up. Suddenly turning up one day and paying off all his debts would raise suspicion about where he got the money, and they might even rob him on the spot. Diana was in the eighth stage of the Soul Fire realm, making her far stronger than almost everyone else in the area, and Ashlock had witnessed her superior fighting abilities firsthand many times. Especially with her corruption-filled attacks, he was confident she could triumph even when outnumbered. Ashlock still didn't like the guy that much, but Douglas had shown some promise and seemed to be fitting in, so it would be annoying to lose him already to some thugs. Larry looked down into the hole and conveyed his message in the ancient tongue to Stella, who half listened to what the spider had to say as she concentrated on her craft. Diana, the patriarch wants you to tail Douglas, Stella spoke quietly over the sound of the artifact in her hand using her spatial chi to cut a deep groove into the rock as Douglas hadn't made it that far down the mountain yet. Keep a distance and only help if he gets into trouble. Diana stood up from the bench, her black modern style clothes blending into the darkness of dusk. A thin smile appeared on her face. A stealth mission from the patriarch? My favorite. She then scratched Kai's head. You should stay here, little guy. Where should I put you? The black snake curiously looked around, and its little pink tongue flickered out toward Larry. Kai's actions confirmed that all of Ashlock's pets inherited his language capabilities, and there was a strong chance that Kai would be able to hiss in the ancient tongue soon. Obeying the snake's choice of resting place, Diana deposited the tiny snake onto Larry's back, giving Kai a smile. I'll be back before dawn. See you soon. Diana then slowly walked toward the mountain edge, and before Ashlock knew it, she had vanished into the darkness. Ashlock would have tailed Douglas himself from the sky with the eye of the tree god, but he had discovered a problem he had outgrown in the past, fatigue when the sun set. A terrible sleepiness gnawed at his mind, and he struggled to stay conscious as the sun dipped beyond the horizon. Only moonlight kept him somewhat awake, but it wasn't enough to keep him awake much longer. He had awoken in the late afternoon, so it had only been a few hours since he experienced rebirth and became fully a tree. His roots now felt like his toes, and he could manipulate them freely without much thought or direction. His branches felt like fingers, and while they were still too sturdy to wave around like a hand, he believed he could direct their growth. And finally, his leaves, which he hadn't been able to chop off in the past with nothing but a thought, the stem released its hold, and a leaf fell to the stone below. He now had total control over his body, which came with the downsides of being a tree. He felt a natural urge to grow fruit to spread his seed and expand in all directions in search of nutrients and chi. He also felt terribly tired without sunlight and already dreaded the upcoming winter months. Maybe Stella can build me a greenhouse formation. Ashlock wondered. It was a good idea, as it would allow him to stay active during the winter months and maybe even stave off exhaustion during the cold, dark nights. Hey, Larry, ask Stella if she can make a heat trapping formation. The spider relayed his words, and Stella paused her engraving, looking up at the spider, clearly annoyed. Tree, stop being so demanding. Can't you see how much is already needed? And you want me to add even more features? And a heat trapping formation? Do I look like a runic master to you? I have no idea what I am doing here, and that Douglas Bastard is useless at teaching. That was fair, but Ashlock had half expected Stella to blindly agree. Since when did she say no to him? Was she in her rebellious teenage stage? She was 16 years old, so it was maybe a bit overdue. Whatever the reason, it was fine, winter wasn't for a few months anyway, so there was plenty of time to turn the entire mountain range into a greenhouse. Obviously, he didn't forget about his children, they needed to be warm during winter too. MHM, it might be good for the Red Claws as well. Ashlock wasn't sure how a heating array would work, but he assumed it would have something to do with fire chi. Ugh. I'll think about this tomorrow. If Ashlock could let off a minute-long yawn right now, he would. 
was there anything else that needed his immediate attention before he slept? Oh, yeah. Larry, do you need to eat? Ashlock spoke through the black chi tether, and the spider perked up. Yes, master, Larry spoke gruffly as he rotated to face him. I can sleep without food for centuries, but I used up a lot of energy during the Deo storm, so my hunger festers. That made sense. Much like human cultivators who could put off eating for a long time due to their cultivation, eventually, they too needed sustenance. While I sleep tonight, go out hunting. Take little Kai with you and feed him some scraps. I need him to get stronger and evolve like you. Larry gave an awkward bow and then crawled off with his usual eerie silence that didn't match his colossal size. With only Stella left, working diligently to build the most monstrous runic formation he had ever seen, Ashlock couldn't help but wonder how they planned to fill these massive grooves with spirit stones. Even all the spirit stone deposits he had encountered in this mountain wouldn't be enough. Alas, that was a question for tomorrow when the sun shone on his leaves and warmed him. With nothing else of note for him to worry about, Ashlock allowed exhaustion to consume him. Being a tree could be quite challenging at times. All he could hope was that Douglas would be fine and Diana wouldn't cause too much carnage in Dark Light City while he slept. Chapter 96, Hunter Becomes the Prey Diana felt the wind rush past her ears and ruffle her hair as she dashed between the branches of the dense demonic forest that sprawled between Red Vine Peak and Dark Light City. The place reeked of death and decay, emanating an eerie atmosphere that was difficult to describe. Once a haven of greenery, the area had transformed after the Deo storm. Diana refrained from questioning the Patriarch's abilities, but she couldn't help but wonder how Ashlock had survived the ferocious tempest, even managing to turn the storm into trees. Legends spoke of the monarch realm's capabilities, where individuals were believed capable of creating a miniature world within themselves, allowing them to contemplate and expand their understanding of the natural laws governing the world. After all, if a cultivator could create a world through sheer will, Who's to say they couldn't comprehend the greater world around them at a fundamental level and bend reality's laws to their whim? Diana believed that was what Ashlock had accomplished. Despite being in the Star Core realm, he had seemingly bent reality's laws and converted the violent water and wind chi of the Deo Storm into nature chi in the form of trees. She couldn't quite fathom if that even made sense, but then again, what about the Patriarch did make sense? The tree could materialize objects from thin air and tear rifts into other dimensions. Brushing aside her thoughts, Diana focused on her mission, nearly losing her footing while leaping between two demonic trees. In mere minutes, she had caught up to Douglas, who strolled leisurely down the forest path, whistling a pleasant tune. Although it was a relatively safe area devoid of beasts, a very thin sheen of brown earth chi surrounded the man's body, which was a common practice for cultivators traveling alone. It was better to slowly drain one's chi while maintaining a thin shield than to be caught off guard and lose one's life. Diana might not have been the most proficient assassin, but fortunately, her target was an earth affinity cultivator known for dull senses and poor awareness. So she didn't need to worry about creaking branches or rustling leaves as she trailed close behind. This was why Diana and Stella could converse when Douglas wasn't far away without fear of being overheard. As long as Diana kept her distance and never touched the ground, she was confident the man wouldn't detect her presence. However, if she were to land on the ground, he would instantly sense her as earth cultivators naturally detected vibrations through the earth, akin to a spider. Every affinity has its strengths and weaknesses. For earth cultivators, superior close combat skills set them apart from almost all other affinities. In the event of a war between the Blood Lotus sect and another demonic sect in the wilderness, the Terra Forge family would lead the charge with reckless vigor. Even outside of combat, their ability to alter terrain made them incredibly valuable for constructing buildings and runic formations, so the Terra Forge family and other Earth cultivators were some of the richest and especially made a lot of money whenever the sect had to relocate due to a beast tide. Compared to the Terra Forge family, Diana knew the Patriarch didn't care much for the Winter Wrath and Evergreen families as they were highly environment dependent, and they would only ever move the sect to a frozen area if there were no other options as keeping mortals alive in icy conditions was difficult. Cultivators always needed to consider the environment and surrounding chi. For instance, Diana's heightened senses and agility were enhanced by a thin veil of mist emanating from flowers growing on a few demonic trees throughout this eerie forest. The mist allowed Diana to tap into her powers and techniques without expending time and chi on creating water herself. For example, she could manipulate the mist into a violent cloud or powerful water jets capable of slicing through rock. This environmental advantage made natural affinities highly sought after. Many families within the Blood Lotus sect possessed exotic affinities, 
such as the Star Weavers with their cosmic affinity or the Skyrend family, known for conjuring multicolored lightning bolts, but they were considered specialists. Diana paused on a branch, feeling the rough wood beneath her palm as she rested. In the distance, Douglas reached the gate of Dark Light City. With no trees between her and the city, Diana had no choice but to wait, lest she risk Douglas discovering her pursuit. Dark Light City had changed a lot since Diana's last visit mere days ago. The entire city was enshrouded in darkness under a forest canopy as towering demonic trees engulfed most of the sky. The sound of axes chipping away at the wood reverberated throughout the city like a cacophonous chorus. Despite the city's infusion with nature creating a certain beauty, illuminated only by moonlight, Diana empathized with the people and understood why they were cutting the trees down. An almost sulfuric stench, characteristic of the soil surrounding demonic trees in the wild, permeated the air, and their bundles of poisonous berries threatened life here. In the short time since demonic trees had overrun Dark Light City, Diana was surprised to already notice numerous bird carcasses littering the streets, victims of the toxic berries, left unabsorbed by the trees due to the lack of soil. She even saw one of these carcasses rotting in a well that was supposed to supply the locals with fresh water. Yet despite the random trees in the road or growing out of the side of buildings, the entertainment district's streets buzzed with activity, which made tailing Douglas easy. The large man stood out in the crowd, and the ambient noise diminished any chance of him detecting her footsteps among the others. Whenever possible, she leaped between the city's demonic trees. However, she often had to walk through treeless patches where residents had chopped them down. In the forest abundant with water chi, she could have moved silently through the mist, but the city's scarcity of water chi put her at a disadvantage compared to Douglas, who could manipulate the earth beneath his feet. Luckily Diana didn't expect to fight Douglas tonight, instead, she worried about the debt collectors he had mentioned. Her privileged upbringing as the daughter of one of the sect's most powerful cultivators had left her uninformed about the underworld dealings of rogue cultivators. As Diana continued to follow Douglas, the area grew livelier, and the women on the street shed more clothing the deeper she got until they were nearly naked, beckoning passers-by outside shady establishments that reeked of musk. Diana may have been naive, but she recognized this as the pleasure district, where sin tempted many to indulge in nights of forbidden delight. Cultivators publicly frowned upon such activities, though some secretly partook behind closed doors. Uninterested in such matters, Diana focused on her mission. Eventually, Douglas stopped before a brothel and hesitated to enter. He fiddled with the spatial ring on his finger and steadied his breathing. While Douglas was preoccupied, Diana examined the building for entry and exit points. Once she confirmed Douglas had mustered the courage to confront his past and entered, she slipped through a hole caused by a demonic tree root growing through the brothel's roof. She filled the attic with mist to obscure herself from other cultivators' spiritual sight sitting cross-legged as she scoured the entire brothel for any sign of Douglas. Aside from the moans of mortals engaged in their nightly activities, which made her feel rather uncomfortable, she soon located a room emanating several chi auras. A weak runic array, riddled with gaps, surrounded the room. If you're going to pay for a runic array, at least do it properly, Diana grumbled. Her eighth soul fire spiritual sight had no trouble penetrating the feeble array. Now let's see how Douglas is doing. Inside the room, Douglas flaunted his third stage soul fire cultivation, facing a clearly drunk and irate man barely at the first stage. A few mid-stage chi realm goons stood behind the drunk man, evidently terrified of Douglas. A wooden table piled high with gold crowns and a few dragon crowns stood between them. The sheer amount of money on display made Diana gasp realizing why such a debt caused Douglas considerable mental stress. 10,000 gold crowns and 25 dragon crowns, Douglas grinned. Including the 35% yearly interest we agreed upon. Feel free to count. The man, his face flushed from alcohol, interrupted pleasure or sheer rage, glanced at the mountain of money and then back at Douglas. This isn't the amount we agreed upon. Douglas raised a brow. Oh? What would be the correct amount, Venick? I wouldn't want to scam such a good friend after all. Are you mocking me? Venick shouted, spittle spraying the floor. Who else would give someone kicked out of their own family money to cultivate? As a friend, I helped you. 35%, Douglas roared back, his booming chi empowered voice making the drunk man shrink. What kind of friend charges 35% interest, Venick? Douglas's massive hand shot over the table and gripped the drunk's throat, turning his face a shade of purple. T30S7P% Venick gasped. What? Douglas tightened his grip, and Diana noticed light grey flames coating Venick's neck, and a sudden gust filled the room. 
it seemed Venick was an air affinity cultivator, giving him no chance against Douglas inside an enclosed space. You owe me 37%. Venick screamed, attempting to pry Douglas's fingers from his neck. That's the number we agreed on after you missed last month's payment. Fine. Douglas tossed him to the ground like a wingless bird. His ring flashed with golden light, and a few more gold crowns joined the pile. As Venick lay gasping for air, Douglas crouched down and forced the man to meet his gaze. Our business is over. I never want to see your damn face again. Do you understand, you fucking bastard? Venick opened his mouth, but instead of words, an intense burst of wind shot forth, knocking Douglas back into the table stacked with coins. They tumbled onto him and the floor like a mini waterfall of gold. Unsurprisingly, Douglas was unscathed, his robust body immune to most attacks below his cultivation stage especially those from wind cultivators, known for their weak assaults at lower realms. Venick wasted no time stumbling past his line of goons, hoarsely shouting at them to hold Douglas off while he regained his footing. Douglas surveyed the mid-stage Chi Realm cultivators and shook his head, death slaves, right? Just stay back. Unfortunately, they didn't listen to his words. As they charged, Diana felt the floorboards tremble. Douglas grabbed one assailant and hurled him through a wall, filling the room with wood splinters and dust. Chaos erupted as the mortals discovered their beds weren't wobbling due to their passionate activities but because the unstable building burdened by a tree growing on its roof couldn't withstand people being thrown through its walls. Diana almost felt bad for those goons that died from being hurled through the walls until she saw Douglas grab a cultivator mid-roundhouse kick and rip the person in half, showering himself in blood. That final death seemed to instill enough fear in the remaining goons, who turned tail and fled, leaving a blood and dust covered Douglas alone in the room. Damn bastards! Douglas cursed. His spatial ring flashed with power, making the mountain of coins vanish. Why should I even pay those lowlifes back? Douglas grumbled to himself. Opting not to use the door, he punched a hole in the room's far wall and leaped into the alleyway below. Had he looked skyward, he might have caught a glimpse of Diana atop the crumbling building, observing his every move. This is troublesome, Diana muttered. The commotion would attract attention and Douglas wasn't doing a good job of concealing his involvement. As a member of the Ash Fallen sect, Diana could pull some strings to avoid punishment for Douglas, but that wasn't the main issue. Douglas was supposed to stay low-key, and if such a rogue cultivator managed to dodge persecution, people would start asking questions and investigating his background, which would be problematic. Should she help him slip out of the city stealthily or focus on silencing Venick, who had already made it several streets away using his air affinity? Diana hopped to the neighboring building while contemplating her options as the brothel completely collapsed, and the demonic tree slammed into the building across the street. Fortunately, her dilemma was resolved when Douglas, already donning his cloak of concealment, smartly fastened a black wooden mask to his face. The cobblestone alleyway split open, and Douglas sank into the ground a common method for earth affinity cultivators to move around by essentially swimming through the earth. Venick it is, then, Diana grinned summoning two black daggers and dashing after the man through the darkness of the night. The streets blurred beneath her as she rapidly closed the gap, never losing sight of the man who appeared like a firefly in her spiritual sight. As she approached, she abandoned her stealth at the last moment, her eighth-stage soul fire coating her dagger as she aimed for Venick's neck. The man turned around with white eyes and gasped, Selina. Diana experienced a brief moment of confusion over the man's dying words, wondering if he had mistaken her for someone else. However, she found her answer when a tendril of shadow lashed out and smacked her dagger from her hand, saving Venick at the last moment. Diana quickly glanced toward the source of the shadow tendril, then back at where Venick had been, only to find that the drunkard had vanished. Tisk, a nocturne, Diana cursed as she retreated while keeping her spiritual sight active. It was hard not to notice the darkness all around her shifting as if alive. Then, before she knew it, she found herself in a world of eternal darkness with only the blue flames of her soul providing light. Chapter 97, A Nocturne's Demise The darkness enveloping Diana shifted from an empty void to a dreamscape a world that seemed real but fell apart under scrutiny. The verdant meadow of lush grass lay still as if painted, and the horizon blurred, making the sky appear to be melting. Diana tried to steady her mind and recall her father's advice on handling nocturnes, rare but dangerous threats that sometimes appeared when dealing with demonic sex scions. Nocturnes also known as Dream Eaters, were abominations that shadowed their hosts like haunting spirits, doing anything to keep them alive and preserve their food source. Selina, was it? 
Diana called into the dream world, catching a glimpse of movement in this motionless landscape. She spun around to find the shadowy figure of a young girl. Diana knew the real body lay on the ground, where an eerie specter of a girl with similar features to Venick floated where a normal shadow should be. You were his sister, weren't you? Diana said solemnly. She had never met a nocturne, but knowing their origin made the scene before her horrifying. To create a nocturne, a sacrificial ritual was needed to bind a relative's soul to one's own, allowing them to consume the relative, often a sibling, for a surge in cultivation. This dark, secretive demonic practice also granted the added benefit of transforming the relative into a nocturne, like Selena for Venick, that would protect the host from the shadows. But there were severe consequences. Apart from brutally murdering a sibling, nocturnes had to be fed, consuming their host's dreams and sanity for sustenance. And if the host ever reached the nascent soul realm, the nocturne could take over the infant soul and be reborn. This fear search to keep their host alive for sustenance and the chance at a new life made nocturnes exceptionally loyal protectors. Diana now understood why Venick acted tough in front of Douglas, despite being a Wind Affinity user two soul fire stages below him. A guardian always lurked in the shadows, watching. A moment of silence passed as the shadow figure refused to answer, but the ghostly form trembling with grief betrayed understanding. I need to kill Venick, Diana declared, and the nocturne held. A chilling wail filled with anguish echoed as though pierced by countless needles. The dreamscape quivered, and hundreds of shadow tendrils shot forth but Diana swatted them away with ease. It was weak. The Nocturne faced a hopeless situation. If Diana killed Venick, the creature would perish without its food source. On the other hand, if they fought until sunrise, the dreamscape would shatter, and the Nocturne would burn under the sun's glare. As Diana deflected more tendrils, she pondered Venick's motivation for subjecting his sister to such a fate. Had his parents arranged it, or had he performed the ritual himself? When Diana was involved with other noble scions, she hadn't heard of a Wind Affinity Azure Crest child named Venick. If Venick had done it himself, the ritual would have been done out of desperation for the benefits, as his rate of cultivation would decrease drastically since the Nocturne siphoned Chi. And he would also be unable to sleep or meditate without feeling haunted, which would deeply affect his state of mind. Also, if Venick ever reached the nascent soul realm, the Nocturne would devour his new infant soul denying him the semi-immortality of being a nascent soul realm cultivator. All of that for a reliable bodyguard no stronger than the host suggested Venick couldn't leave his back to anyone other than his own sister's ghost. Venick must have been either insane or desperate for protection, either from family members vying for power or from numerous enemies he had made. Neither option sounded good. Venick was a tumor that needed to be culled, especially since, with the death of his nocturne, he would soon become consumed by heart demons just like how Diana had been before Ashlock saved her with those truffles. Diana continued slashing at the tendrils with her chi-covered blade while gradually filling the dreamscape with her haunted mist technique. She could shatter the dreamscape with her cultivation, but the nocturne would escape. She aimed to kill it first and then pursue Venick. Although the dreamscape looked like it stretched for many miles, it was only around the size of a large courtyard. Soon enough, she could lock down the location of the nocturne that was running around while its whales filled the entire space with her mist. There you are, Diana muttered as she dashed through the mist. Diana tore through the shadowy figure a moment later as if it were smoke and seized the nocturne's throat. She was about to tighten her chi-coated grip and kill the spectral abomination when she hesitated. The wailing ceased, and the young girl, no older than ten, gazed at Diana with eyes full of innocence. Was this some kind of trick to make her hesitate? Her father had only briefly mentioned this threat and simply said to kill the Nocturne to escape. Was there really no other way? Don't hurt Venick, the girl said in a distorted, eerie voice. He was my brother, and I still love him. Diana hadn't known Nocturnes could speak. Why? Diana frowned. He killed you and turned you into an abomination. How can you still love him? Was it some kind of mind magic that made the abomination loyal? The Nocturne's eyes grew dull as if recalling a painful memory. Venick had no choice. Our father forced this upon us. Father? Who's your father? Grand Elder of the Azure Crest family. He received an order from the Patriarch. The girl hesitated. Which was? Diana pressed, knowing that the Patriarch rarely gave direct orders. But as a true demonic cultivator with little regard for human life, anything he meddled in was bound to be twisted. He wanted more airships and, therefore, more pilots. Our family is the main provider of these pilots. But he wanted them within a year. 
that was enough for Diana to piece together the rest. Noble families were often vast, sometimes consisting of dozens of branch families and thousands of members in total. But not all family members were created equal. Out of those thousands, only a few hundred would reach the Soul Fire Realm, and only a tiny handful of those had the potential to reach the Star Core Realm. As the largest producer of Wind Affinity Cultivators, the Azure Crest family was invaluable to the sex continued existence, operating airships that enabled trade between cities and mass evacuations during inevitable beast tides. With every Azure Crest family member in the Soul Fire Realm already employed in the airship industry, if the Patriarch demanded a new batch of pilots to appear overnight, the Azure Crest Grand Elder likely resorted to something truly horrific to meet the quota. Your father forced everyone in the family to kill their siblings to turn them into nocturnes in order to increase their cultivation, didn't he? Diana asked, and the little girl's eyes widened before she nodded. So please don't kill Venick. I was the weaker of the two, and he promised to make me a new body in the future. Diana could barely stand the innocent belief in her eyes. Venick, a middle-aged man, had only reached the first stage of the Soul Fire Realm with the Ritual's boost. His chances of reaching the nascent Soul Realm before his lifespan ended were non-existent. The girl was being deceived. Diana suspected that Venick was aware of his slim chances and had resigned himself to his fate, abandoning the path of cultivation. His negligence was the reason he remained stagnant at the first stage in the realm for such a long time. Why did Venick charge Douglas such high interest? Do you know? Diana questioned the Nocturne, and the ghostly girl shuddered. He couldn't stand me, the girl replied. He spent all the money on alcohol, drugs, and women to drown me out. I kept urging him to cultivate but he claimed he couldn't. Diana suspected that he was simply lazy and unwilling to cultivate, but there was a genuine possibility that he couldn't. Possessing a nocturne made cultivation significantly more challenging, as it was nearly impossible to enter a state of deep cultivation. Diana tightened her grip around the ghost, and the girl cried out, Why? Why kill me? Let me go back to my brother. Then let me out of the dreamscape, Diana retorted, Maybe I can save you both. But the girl adamantly shook her head. I can see it in your eyes, the girl sobbed. The eyes of a killer. You will kill my brother if I let you go. I just know it. Diana had killed many people, including her own cousin, in front of Ashlock before her family was wiped out. Reflecting on it, that had been the last time she felt anything for taking a life. Since then, she had slain cultivators and Massey without any qualms. Had something broken inside her? Her father had used her as nothing but a tool, even threatening her life if she didn't go and kill Stella Crestfallen. But the situation was different this time. Ashlock had requested she followed Douglas, everything after that was her own decision. Now, with her hand around the neck of a technically innocent person she wasn't compelled or ordered to kill, a disquieting sensation welled up in her chest. This was unlike the other lives she had extinguished over the years, this was a mercy killing. The girl believed she had a chance at life but Diana knew that she would forever remain a nocturne, feeding off her brother's dreams and sanity while watching him squander his cultivation. Diana was fast, but Venick was still an air cultivator. Diana knew he would soon escape the maximum range of her spiritual sight and vanish forever into the darkness of Dark Light City, never to be seen again. I'm sorry, Diana murmured, and her eyes turned dull as she twisted her chi-coated hand and felt the nocturne's neck snap. Her chi flooded its spectral form, and the ghost wailed like a boiling kettle. The girl's body solidified and then crumbled to dust between Diana's fingers. The dreamscape shattered, and the bustling noise of the street overloaded her senses. A few passers-by gave Diana an odd look as she had likely appeared out of nowhere, but they soon walked on. Diana observed the dust scattered in the breeze. Mercy killings evoked a distinct sensation that she loathed, but she tried to convince herself it was for the best to end the nocturne's suffering. Empowering her legs, Diana leaped onto the roof of a nearby building and expanded her spiritual sight. At its edge, she could sense Venick's presence. She had almost been too late. Regrettably, the little girl had been right. Diana fully intended to kill Venick tonight. He knew too much about Douglas, and with the death of his nocturne, which had been holding off the heart demons like a dam, was now gone. He would lose all sanity by sunrise. Ashlock awoke to the crack of dawn the very moment the golden sun rays hit his leaves. He felt his entire biology slowly speed up under the sunlight's tender care. The sound of stone cracking accompanied the morning birds, and Ashlock soon located Stella, still laboring to create the enormous runic formation. However, 
he was delighted to notice a section of the runic formation had already been completed and seemingly activated, as he felt Qi being drawn to the spot, then transferred down through the rock and directly to his roots. Checking the countdown timer in the corner of his eye until his system was restored, he saw it had decreased significantly to only three days. Seeing that an increase in Qi intake drastically affected his recovery time made Ashlock very thankful for Stella's hard work and gave him an idea. What if he used hibernate since it increased his cultivation intake? He assumed now that he was fully tree that the experience wouldn't be quite so harrowing. But, even if it was, he could endure a few days if it helped him recover even a few hours faster. With his mind still awakening, he surveyed the rest of the mountain peak. He wanted to ensure everything was fine before hibernating for a few days to complete his recovery. As the sunlight bathed the mountaintop, Ashlock saw Douglas emerge from the rock as if stepping up a staircase shaking off the dust and rubble that clung to his shoulders. He was alone Diana was nowhere to be seen. Ashlock was relieved that Douglas appeared to have handled his debts without issue. It made sense if Diana was lagging a bit behind, but even when he used Eye of the Tree God and searched the surroundings, he couldn't find her anywhere. Oh, you're back. Stella said as she leaped out of the hole she had been carving ancient runes in and looked around. She was clearly concerned about Diana's absence but didn't want to ask Douglas. Douglas grumbled as he removed the mask, yeah, I'm back. There was a fight, and I ended up taking back the money. Stella raised a brow, what happened? Did they try to rob you or something? Kind of. Douglas scratched the back of his neck, to be fair, it was mostly my fault. In hindsight, I might have insulted that Venick bastard a little too much, but he deserved it. Venick. Stella asked, who's that? He pretended to be my friend loaned me money at my lowest point, and said I didn't have to pay him back until I got back on my feet. Douglas chuckled sadly, that was a lie. Once I got some work, he said there had been interest the whole time, and if I didn't pay it back, he'd have people smear my reputation, and then nobody would hire me. Stella nodded. Just to be clear, I gave you that ring filled with coins without expecting any interest. She then smiled sweetly, but if you betray Tree, then I will demand your soul as payment. Douglas chuckled to brush it off, but Ashlock could see the slight fear in his eyes, as he knew Stella was serious. I will take your words to heart, he mumbled, depositing the mask into his spatial ring. So what happened to this Venick fellow? You killed him, right? Stella then froze when Douglas shook his head. He surprised me and got away. As an Earth Affinity cultivator, there's no way I could catch up to someone from the Azure Crest family. But even then, why would I kill him? He was a bastard, sure, but he did help me in the past. Stella's glare made Douglas shrink back. Anything, and I mean anything, that could threaten to expose Tree's existence must be eradicated. That lack of bloodlust will come to bite you one day. We are in a demonic sect. Act like it. Do I make myself clear? Yes, Douglas answered quickly. But what should we do then? Stella looked at Dark Light City in the distance. I wouldn't worry. By the afternoon, Diana walked up the mountainside with a vacant expression. Did you get him? Stella asked. Diana nodded absent-mindedly her golden ring flashed with power, and a man's severed head appeared in her grasp. Douglas cheered. You really killed that bastard. You did a good job, Stella said, smiling and patting Diana's shoulder before pausing after seeing her face. What's wrong? Ashlock was also worried. Diana looked like someone who had just done something they deeply regretted. I... I don't know. Some circumstances around it don't sit right with me. Diana let out a long sigh. Ugh, I just can't tell if I did the right thing. Trust in yourself some more, Stella reassured her with a smile. Doubt only leads to festering heart demons. Right. You don't want to know the circumstances. Diana seemed bewildered. Only if you want to tell me. Stella withdrew her hand and turned to jump back down into the hole to continue her work. I trust in your judgment completely. Diana stood there for a while, her mouth never quite able to form words. Eventually, she just muttered thanks under her breath, and a thin smile appeared. Hey, she may trust you, Douglas spoke from the side, but I would love to know these circumstances if possible. Venick had been a good friend of mine at one point. Diana nodded and then explained about the Azure Crest family and the Nocturne that had been feasting off Venick's soul. Ashlock knew he lived in a demonic sect and had seen their ruthless culture and disregard for life. Still, 
he hadn't heard of many real demonic techniques or rituals outside the pill furnace that the Patriarch wanted Stella to become. He could see why Diana had been distraught about the murder, as the siblings had been forced into a rather unfortunate position by their father. Still, Venick did sound like a terrible person, and Ashlock found his care for human life outside the group he cared for to be fleeting. Did humans care when a forest was chopped down? When trees were burned to death for heat? Those pavilions were made out of the corpses of his fellow trees, and even right now, he could feel the waves of pain and despair through the mycelium network as the demonic trees in Dark Light City were chopped down. But with the mass murder of his fellow demonic trees aside, as he could do little to help them right now, the news of these nocturnes and the activities of the Azure Crest family were concerning. Douglas stood silently for a long while, staring at the decapitated head in Diana's hand. It all makes sense now, he eventually said. The sudden change in his personality, his insane desire to hide away from his family, and even his surprising jump in cultivation, which gave him the strength to run his brothel and order around those goons. A single tear rolled down Douglas's cheek. I had even met Selina a couple of times in the past. She had been such an adorable little sister to Venick. I can't imagine him doing something so horrible. Diana shook her head. Don't put all the blame on Venick. The patriarchs greed to, save more people from the beast tide. She paused, clearly conflicted. Ashlock concluded that this was a very messy situation where nobody was fully in the right. The Patriarch wanted more pilots for airships, which would mean more people could escape certain death. Venick had become a terrible person due to what his father had forced upon him, and Diana had essentially mercy killed them because they could threaten the Ash Fallen sect. I'm going to go cultivate and clear my mind, Diana said, shaking her head. I need to contemplate a few things. Can I use the personal formation, Stella? Stella popped her head over the hole's edge. Of course, all of us can use it. We are a sect now. This isn't just my home. Diana smiled and nodded in thanks. Stella then glared at Douglas. Don't just stand around being useless. Come help me with this formation, and I'll teach you some ancient runes. With everyone busy and the loose end of Venick seemingly dealt with, Ashlock activated Hibernate and set the timer for two days. He hoped the extra chi intake while he slept and the completion of the runic formation would shave an entire day off his recovery time. When he woke up, he expected to see his sign-in system back online, and then it would be time to get down to business. Unfortunately, the alchemy tournament would require a lot more work than he had initially anticipated, especially in light of recent events. Also, he would need to devise a plan to make the people of Dark Light City coexist with his new children and maybe even silently eat those that had hurt them. Sleep Mode Activated Chapter 98, Tree Talk Hibernation Mode Deactivated Tree Hey Tree, wake up! Ashlock was roused by a system chime and the sensation of a hand patting his trunk, accompanied by Stella's persistent voice. His mind felt even more sluggish than when waking from an ordinary slumber. He felt so slow and just wanted to go back to sleep. Tree Stella cheered, you woke up. I can sense it. Hey! Ashlock mumbled as his thoughts accelerated, woke up? When did I fall asleep? It was then that Ashlock realized something truly astonishing. Unlike the previous occasion when he had utilized hibernation and endured every passing second, this time, he had simply activated the skill, set a timer, and drifted off. Two days had elapsed without his awareness. Why couldn't he have had this skill back when he was a human? System. Ashlock inquired aloud. Are you operational? Idle Tree Daily Sign In System. Day, 3508. Daily Credit, 7. Sacrifice Credit, 0. Sign In. It was present, it was genuinely there. A tiny part of him had worried that by becoming a full fledged tree, he would lose his system. However, there it was in all its glory. He had managed to employ system skills like Hibernate and Eye of the Tree God, so the likelihood of it having completely abandoned him was slim. Still, Ashlock needed to witness its return to feel reassured. Letting out a sigh of relief, Ashlock felt much more awake now. But, to ensure his system was fully working, he summoned his status screen to check if his skills had changed. Demonic Demi Divine Tree, H, 9. Star Core, Second Stage. Soul Type, Amethyst, Spatial. Mutations. Demonic IB. Blood Sap C. Summons. Ashen King. Larry A. Infant Grass Snake, Kaida F. Skills. 
Mystic Realm S Locked Until Day, 3515. Eye of the Tree God A. Deep Roots A. Magic Mushroom Production A. Lightning Chi Barrier A. Chi Fruit Production A. Blooming Root Flower Production B. Language of the World B. Root Puppet B. Fire Chi Protection B. Transpiration of Heaven and Chaos B. Devour C. Hibernate C. Basic Poison Resistance F. Everything appeared precisely the same as before his rebirth. His race hadn't changed, nor had any of his skills. Does this mean the system was linked to my tree body rather than my human soul all along? Or did merging my human ego with the demonic tree body carry over the system? The more Ashlock tried to unravel the mysteries surrounding the system and its origin, the more he felt a headache coming on. It was easy to just turn a blind eye to it and accept its presence, but why did he have a system if one really thought about it? Why didn't anyone else in this world have systems? Were they unique to spirit trees? Or just him? What made him so special? Ugh. Ashlock groaned. These weren't questions to be contemplated immediately after waking from a pleasant two-day slumber. If his system was accurate, a week had passed since the Deo storm, meaning Dark Light City had been dealing with his new offspring for some time, and there might be news about the alchemy tournament scheduled to begin soon. Tree, stop ignoring me. Stella stood beneath his canopy with her hands on her hips. Ashlock went to flash his leaf with spatial chi to show he was listening when he realized something. His level of control over the chi on his trunk was perfect now, as the entire trunk was his star core. There's no way, right? Filled with immense anticipation, Ashlock effortlessly wrote the words good morning in lilac flame across his trunk like a whiteboard. Stella stumbled back in surprise, gawking at the words. Ashlock was equally astonished. Although his previous method of communication writing on the ground with telekinesis wasn't vastly different from this, it felt significantly more convenient. Is everything all right, Stella? Ashlock inscribed on his bark with the flames of his soul, and Stella nodded vigorously. Sorry for waking you. Did you sleep well? Stella asked with a radiant smile, I finally completed the chi gathering formation a few hours ago and wanted to check on you. Ashlock looked around him, and sure enough, the sheer volume of chi amassing around him was extraordinary. A single breath during his meditation technique brought in an incredible amount of chi, but compared to the size of his new star core thousands of times larger than his old one it was still a mere drop in the ocean. Nonetheless, a drop was better than an atom. The runic formation, combined with the chi he received through his roots from all the other demonic trees, made his cultivation rate faster despite his new colossal star core. Essentially, he was cultivating more rapidly than ever before and should reach the third stage in the star core realm soon. I had an amazing sleep, Ashlock wrote, and after Stella finished reading it aloud, he added, this runic formation is incredible, thank you. Ashlock tried his best to ignore Douglas, who stood off to the side, making amusing facial expressions that alternated between disbelief and amazement as he glanced between Stella and Ashlock's trunk. It seemed he still found the idea of a talking tree absurd. I need to learn to read that, Douglas finally spoke up from the side. How long did it take you to learn the language to this level, Stella? MHM. Stella shrugged, only about a year of studying day and night with endless love and devotion. Oh. Douglas seemed taken aback. Stella giggled. Diana gave up after just a week. It's really not easy to learn such a complex language. I can see why they created a far more streamlined version that you learned for runic formations. Yeah, the streamlined version is so different it might as well be another language, Douglas replied with a chuckle. While they chatted, Ashlock inspected the runic formation more closely and noticed that the large holes Stella had used to engrave the transfer runes had been filled with a mixture of rock and spirit stones. Do we have any spirit stones left? Ashlock wrote, and Stella shook her head. We used every last one. I either underestimated the spirit stone requirements for creating runic formations or overestimated our spirit stone reserves, Stella said, tapping her chin. We may need to start cracking down on the mine and demand more from it. I can see why it was so sought after now. These runic formations are essential for cultivation, and I haven't even started on runic formations with other uses, like defensive ones that can create chi barriers. Douglas nodded from the side. Why do you think runic formation masters are paid on PAR with beginner alchemists? It's a seriously lucrative business. Douglas's statement made Ashlock realize he didn't know much about alchemists. He knew they existed since someone had to be making the pills they were consuming, and when his chi fruit production skill upgraded to A grade, 
he was able to produce a cauldron fruit that facilitated alchemy which suggested the practice's existence. How rare are alchemists? Ashlock wrote, and Douglas answered his question after Stella read the words aloud. Very rare, there are just so many hurdles to overcome, Douglas said, counting off his fingers. First, you need a near-perfect spirit root, as the ingredients have to be combined within your soul fire, and you don't want any impurities, otherwise, you'll always be fated to create mediocre pills. Next, you need to reach the soul fire realm with an intense focus on soul fire manipulation and control. If those two hurdles weren't enough, you must spend countless years studying time that could have been spent pursuing cultivation and vast resources to practice with. Diana walked over, stretching her back with her arms behind her head, and added, don't forget the brutal exams. They are questioned about thousands of herbs and need to memorize every combination. My cousin tried to become an alchemist, but the examiner chewed out the poor boy. Ashlock was glad to see Diana seemed in a better mood, but he found that hard to believe. Why make the exam so hard? Couldn't the alchemists just memorize a few basic recipes and then work from there? Ashlock spelled out his question in flames, and Diana soon answered with Stella translating. Simple answer, those alchemists are way too prideful. But it's a bit more complicated than that, Diana said, lowering her arms and putting them in the pockets of her modern style hoodie. Alchemists only get paid so much because they are rare. If everyone could become a low-tier alchemist, then the prestige those bastards enjoy would soon vanish. Ashlock now understood the situation perfectly. Those old alchemists wanted to gatekeep the industry to keep it exclusive and maintain their high wages due to the lack of supply. It was smart, but Diana's words also gave Ashlock hope for his tournament's success. Many aspiring alchemists were likely to be in attendance that couldn't get approved as official alchemists. He only needed one semi-competent person to show him and his three sect members how to perform alchemy. Also, Hearing how valuable they were made Ashlock want to pursue the idea of turning the Ash Fallen sect into a well-known alchemy sect. That way, they could get enough money to buy spirit stones and build more formations by trading with the merchants. Ashlock's wandering thoughts were interrupted when a sudden wave of pain and fear shot through his roots. It was coming through the mycelium network near Dark Light City. His vision blurred as he switched views to the location of the pain, where he found someone trying to chop down a demonic tree that had his roots wrapped around it. This tree was located on the city wall, somewhere his roots could reach. It seemed that while he slept, his roots had naturally linked up and wrapped around this and many other demonic trees. The system mentioned something about automatically connecting with nearby demonic trees before my rebirth, Ashlock mused as another wave of pain washed over him, reminding him of the situation at hand. The mortal's iron axe cleaved into his root that wrapped around the helpless tree, barely making progress. Cutting through the root of a star core demonic tree as a mortal was a futile endeavor. Ashlock debated opening a portal and devouring the fool but realized that wouldn't solve the issue. He needed to come up with a realistic solution. Taking a figurative step back, he tried to identify why they were trying to chop down this particular tree. It was growing sideways out of the city wall, causing the wall to crumble around its roots. Upon closer inspection, he noticed damp cracks caused by water damage. Ah, the digestive fluids, Ashlock realized. That is indeed a problem. The wall appeared sturdy enough to survive an attack from demonic beasts, so a tree growing from it shouldn't be such a significant issue. However, even the strongest walls weren't immune to water or corrosive fluids designed to dissolve the hardest demonic beast corpses. Ashlock confirmed his roots were intertwined with the demonic tree and surrounding its trunk. With his full focus, he tried to project a message to the tree, calm down and relax. Stop trying to hunt let me take care of you. He accompanied the intent-filled message with a wave of chi and all the nutrients the tree could ever need via the mycelium network. To his surprise, the tree responded with a wave of happiness. Stop producing berries and corrosive fluid. I will provide for you. As far as he could tell, his connection to the tree wasn't much different from before he became a fully-fledged tree, but it seemed to understand him could he speak tree now? Through his roots, he felt the tree's roots gradually dry up over an hour. He could do things quickly for a tree and if one thought about it, the fact this tree could stop producing corrosive fluid in just an hour was impressive. Good kid, Ashlock sent over more chi and nutrients, attempting to train the tree like a puppy. Always rewarding it for a job well done. Ashlock confirmed he could communicate and train his children. If he repeated this process for all the trees in Dark Light City, they should all be spared. He could always have Douglas work to relocate those blocking roads or crushing buildings via his portals. All his children deserved to live and the more that survived, 
the more trees he had to siphon qi from. Since his roots grew around the trunks of the trees, he could also grow mushrooms or flowers to decorate them and make them more appealing to the locals. Ashlock set to work, making his roots tunnel under dark light city and creep up through pavement cracks to meet all the demonic trees in the city. He was baffled at how fast his roots grew. His new star core was like its own nuclear power station, surging an obscene amount of qi down his roots. With a plan in place, Ashlock had to leave the helpless demonic tree on the wall for now. He shifted his view back to Red Vine Peak and wrote a message on his trunk for Stella. It hurts. Stella practically tripped over her feet as she dashed up to him. What hurts, tree? Are you okay? They are slaughtering my children. It hurts, he wrote in lilac flames, and he had never seen Stella look so furious. The air around her crackled with golden lightning, and reality was distorted by the spatial chi leaking from her core. Tell me where to go. Who should I kill? Ashlock quickly outlined his plan, explaining that the demonic trees would stop producing corrosive fluid and emphasizing that the trees provided him with more chi, helping him grow faster. He had never seen Stella so motivated in his life. Portal me over to the Red Claws, tree. Stella said as she fastened the white mask to her face. Ashlock sighed in relief as Stella calmed down and no longer looked like she was about to commit genocide on the mortals of Dark Light City. Creating the most stable and impressive portal to date, Ashlock connected Stella to the White Stone Palace. As she stepped through, everyone in the palace courtyard wearing crimson robes instantly bowed to the arrival of the ash-fallen sex mistress. The Grand Elder rushed out of the palace within moments and gave a deep bow. Mistress, how may we serve? He raised his head and added. Preparations for the tournament have hit a few hurdles, so I sent out news of the tournament's delay to all the attending families. But the elusive Silver Spire family refused and said they were coming today. Silence, Stella said, raising her hand. I care not for some pathetic noble family. Why are you all standing around here when the Immortals' children are suffering? The Grand Elder blinked in confusion. Pardon. Chapter 99, Ashlock Relocating His Children Ashlock watched the scene unfold in horror. His relationship with the Red Claws had gone far beyond the point where Stella could mess up, and he could simply eliminate them without a second thought. They were too valuable to be disposed of now. So why had she mentioned something like that? Stella sighed at the Grand Elder's question and replied, the Immortal expended great effort to transform the Deo Storm into new life. Wouldn't you consider those beautiful red trees his children? The Grand Elder appeared bewildered, which was entirely understandable. Even Ashlock was somewhat confused by Stella's words, but fortunately, the Grand Elder dismissed her weird comments with a respectful bow. Mistress, please enlighten this old man with your request, as I am not sure I understand your profound words. Ashlock let out a long sigh of relief. Stella had salvaged it somehow. It's rather simple. My immortal ancestor came out of seclusion to deal with the Deo Storm. Stella then pointed off into the distance at the huge demonic tree that occupied Red Vine Peak and was easily visible without the surrounding pavilion. He was enraged when the storm dared to uproot the beloved demonic tree that he had nurtured for so long, so he bent the natural laws to turn the Deo Storm into a forest of trees, so his favorite demonic tree wouldn't feel alone anymore while he was in seclusion. I see. The Grand Elder slowly nodded, so the demonic tree holds great significance for the immortal. More than just significant, Stella replied, crossing her arms. That demonic tree is a spirit tree capable of basic thought, and it is connected to all these newly born demonic trees. A spirit tree, you say? The Red Claw Grand Elder stroked his chin as he observed the tree in the distance. Ashlock really didn't appreciate being gawked at as it made him feel naked, nor did he condone Stella saying he was only capable of basic thought. Was that a roundabout way to call him stupid or something? Stella nodded, not just any old spirit tree. It has a fragment of the immortal soul inside, so it could care for me and the ash fallen sect like a guardian in my ancestor's stead while he cultivates. You know, just like Larry. The Grand Elder's eyes widened as panic seemed to set in. Meanwhile, Ashlock found it astonishing that they would believe Stella's words, but in fairness, her explanation was more plausible than claiming he could communicate and had a sign-in system. Stella gestured to Ashlock in the distance, every time a demonic tree is cut down, the Guardian feels pain as does the immortal whose soul is linked to it. I understand now, the Grand Elder bowed deeply again, I should have foreseen such a consequence with all these trees appearing. I hope you can forgive this foolish old man, I can only beg for your mercy. Stella approached and placed a reassuring hand on the Grand Elder's shoulder, you have performed admirably so far, 
and the immortal is pleased with you. Don't dwell on this too much, but we must find a solution swiftly. The Grand Elder straightened and adopted a serious demeanor. We could impose the death penalty on anyone caught even touching the trees. My family is small, but we could work tirelessly to enforce this if the immortal wills it. No. Absolutely not. Ashlock wanted the trees to live for his own selfish reason of generating more chi. That was not a justification for taking people's lives so brutally. What if someone genuinely ignorant, like a playful child, touched a tree? Would the child be killed on the spot, no questions asked? Ashlock had been concerned that Stella might be somewhat psychopathic when she seriously asked if he needed her to wipe out Dark Light City, but now he wondered if they all shared this trait. Fortunately, Stella shook her head. Ashlock had never been more relieved that he had provided Stella with a pre-outlined plan before she left. Otherwise, he wouldn't be surprised if they went to commit mass murder. Although measures need to be taken, we still have to consider the lives of Dark Light City's people, Stella sighed. Those are words straight from the immortal. I personally would have agreed with you otherwise. I fucking knew it, Ashlock groaned. He really needed to rein in her misguided loyalty it was getting out of hand. So, what should we do? The Grand Elder questioned. The Immortal understands that some trees must be removed, such as those obstructing roads or crushing buildings. So, an Earth Affinity Cultivator from our sect, as well as any other Earth Affinity Cultivators seeking employment, can be hired to free the trees, which the Immortal can then transport away via portals. The Grand Elder nodded. That can be arranged, although it will be costly. I hope you have enough golden crowns on hand. Stella smiled removed two of her golden spatial rings, and placed them in the Grand Elder's hand. This should be enough for now. I broke the seals for you. Ashlock watched the transfer of money with a pained heart. Why was everything to do with cultivators so expensive? After inspecting the contents of the ring, the Grand Elder nodded. This is a generous amount. Should I proceed with fulfilling your orders? With a simple nod from Stella, the Grand Elder took to the skies, leaving a blazing trail of crimson flame as he rode his sword toward Dark Light City. With Stella now calmed, she approached the elders standing off to the side. How goes the tournament preparations? They exchanged glances, and eventually, a stern woman replied, To be honest, not great. We are a smaller family and don't have much influence within the Blood Lotus sect. As you may know, alchemists are rare and considered strategic resources hidden from prying eyes. So unless the rewards are truly extravagant, they'll likely show up with no one better than complete novices. I see. Stella drummed her fingers on her crossed arm. Ashlock could tell she was carefully crafting her words to avoid sounding foolish in front of the Red Claws. Elder Mo was next to speak up. That issue aside, we have secured the training grounds of the Academy as a venue to conduct the tests, but there's a slight problem. Actually, would you like to take a look? Sure, Stella agreed. Ashlock then opened a portal to transport them directly to the entrance of Dark Light City. This was another reason he wanted the trees to remain in the city, he could wrap his roots around them and use the trees inside the city as anchor points for portals. I hope you can see the other issue, Elder Mo said with a chuckle as the group stood in the stands of a building resembling a coliseum from ancient Rome. The primary issue Elder Mo referred to was that the place looked more like a zoo enclosure filled with demonic trees rather than a suitable location for a tournament. Indeed, Elder Mo. This won't do at all, Stella agreed. We should be able to remove these trees within the next few days. When is the event scheduled to start? Elder Brent, the Elder Ashlock had seen on the wall that first spotted the approaching Deo storm, spoke up. I can answer that. We sent out a notice of delay a few days ago to everyone who had shown interest in participating. Some met the news with sneers, others with annoyance. For them, the event will start in a month. Only one family completely ignored our notice, though. The Silver Spire family that the Grand Elder mentioned earlier. Stella guessed. Elder Brent nodded in confirmation. I never really dabbled in Blood Lotus politics. So what are they known for? Wealth derived from creating spatial rings and being self-entitled arrogant bastards, Elder M.O. grumbled. They created these. Stella looked at her golden spatial rings. Elder M.O. glared at them with annoyance. Unfortunately. Their spatial rings are one of the largest exports of the Blood Lotus sect, so they naturally receive special treatment from the Patriarch. A brief pause in the conversation led Ashlock to realize how certain affinities seemed more valuable than others. For example, what could the Red Claws really provide the sect other than firepower? 
which families agreed to participate in the tournament. Stella wondered aloud while looking at the horizon. The stern woman known as Elder Margaret replied, Participate is a strong word. They're essentially just sending inexperienced alchemists as a ploy to check out our presence here in Dark Light City and see if they can seize a piece or the entire city from our hands. But to answer your question, Elder Margaret continued, counting on her fingers, of the seven remaining families excluding us and the ones that have been wiped out, five showed interest. Oh. Stella raised a brow. Who isn't coming? The Night Rose and Silver Spire families. Ashlock was confused as he had never heard of this Night Rose family, and hadn't the Grand Elder said the Silver Spire family was on their way? Stella mirrored his concern to the Elder, who helpfully replied, the Silver Spire family doesn't have soul fire they have liquid metal cores that aren't suitable for alchemy. I assume they're coming to find a way to profit from this event rather than participate, as they hate being left out. As for the Night Rose family, I'm surprised you haven't heard of them, considering they're the Patriarch's family. They're very mysterious and prefer to hide their powers, so their refusal was expected. That was a lot of information to take in. Ashlock finally learned the name of the Patriarch's family. I wonder what type of affinity the Night Rose family has? I should ask Stella when she returns to the mountain, Ashlock mused. It was also interesting to learn that some affinities didn't have a soul fire. Did they follow a different cultivation system than everyone else? He was now even more intrigued to see these Silver Spire people who were apparently on their way despite being told to wait. Elder Margaret added, those sending someone of importance are the Void Mind, Star Weaver, Terra Forge, Skyrend, and Azure Crest families. Ashlock hadn't encountered most of those yet, but the Terra Forge family rang a bell as they were mentioned in regard to Douglas and, finally, the Azure Crest family. After hearing from Diana what happened to Venick and his sister, he had a bone to pick with them. Stella nodded sagely, but Ashlock suspected she didn't know about those families either. Are they only sending their own family alchemists? Stella inquired, make sure the tournament is open to everyone who wants to participate. You sure? Elder Margaret questioned the quality of alchemists that haven't passed the exam could be detrimental. Then they won't win. Stella snapped back, this is a tournament that only lets the best win, right? Why should we care what those snobbish alchemists think? There could be talent out there being wrongfully ignored. Stella then lowered her voice and added, also, we will only have a few people show up if we keep the entry requirements so high. Ah. Elder Margaret blinked in realization and then scribbled something down on a piece of parchment. That is a good idea. I will allow rogues to participate. It's good that we delayed the tournament by a month to give them time to head over here and prepare. The group continued to converse for a while, and after an hour or so, the skies became filled with noise. Airships floated over the demonic forest-covered city, and a few low-rank cultivators empowered their voices with chi and shouted to the streets below from the platforms. By orders of the Noble Red Claws and the Mortal Council, those found harming the demonic trees will be fined a silver crown as they are now deemed a protected species by the city. If you wish to remove a demonic tree from your home or street, you can pay 10 copper crowns and inquire at the nearest guild building for an earth affinity cultivator to remove it. Ashlock was surprised at how quickly the Grand Elder had put his plan into motion, which made things a little awkward as the city was enormous, and his roots didn't even cover a fifth of it. Fortunately, only the nearest half of the city was affected by the demonic trees, as the further one got from Red Vine Peak, the fewer demonic trees were present. After a while, the city buzzed with people rushing toward guilds and requesting demonic tree removal. Ashlock was sure many of them would regret their decision once he decorated the demonic trees with beautiful flowers and magical mushrooms. Something he planned to do overnight. Dark Light City would wake up in the morning to a city they could hardly recognize. But while the sun was still up, he wanted to test out moving these demonic trees in the Colosseum via his portals. Back on Red Vine Peak, Ashlock opened a portal next to Douglas, who had been meticulously checking that the runic formation surrounding him was working properly. The man made eye contact with Stella through the portal, who gestured him through. Once he stepped through and saw the Colosseum filled with demonic trees, and a portal opened next to one of the trees that led to a random spot in the wilderness, Douglas seemed to understand his task. Jumping down, Douglas landed in a cloud of dust and got to work. The ground turned into the same weird viscous state Ashlock had experienced two days ago, and he slowly pushed the tree up from the ground, roots and all. Almost effortlessly, Ashlock used telekinesis through the root coiled around the demonic tree, guided it through the portal, and set it down on the lush grass of the wilderness. Kid, dig your roots deep into the ground to stabilize yourself. His root was naturally cut off when the portal snapped closed, 
but he had roots just below the surface of the wilderness, so he used them to help the demonic tree stay upright while it found its footing, rooting. This is going to be a tiring process, isn't it? Ashlock sighed as he returned and worked alongside Douglas to move another one. Honestly, the fact he could lift trees with his mind was baffling, and it seemed to entertain the Red Claw elders as well, as they stood watching with immense interest as trees many meters tall were uprooted and then floated through portals. The Immortal is doing all this while cultivating two mountains away. Elder Emma whistled in awe, and Stella grinned proudly from the side, he sure is. Things were going smoothly until late evening when Ashlock noticed something on the horizon approaching. Due to its size, he thought it was a giant cloud, but he was soon proven wrong when an airship that looked vast enough to be a floating city cast a looming shadow on Dark Light City. Tisk, Elder M.O. put his hands behind his back and grumbled, the Silver Spires are here. We should prepare to meet them they hate tardiness and will raise a fuss that we can't afford right now. Stella nodded and gestured for the elders to lead the way. Just looking at how large and majestic the Silver Spire's airship was made Ashlock realize how small the Red Claw family was compared to the true powerhouses of the Blood Lotus sect. All he could hope was they didn't eradicate the Red Claws and seize Dark Light City for themselves because if they did, he would be shooting his roots through portals and popping that pompously big balloon. Chapter 100, Riker Von Silver Spire Stella stood beside the Red Claw Grand Elder, her stomach churning with nerves. Despite her efforts to steady her breathing, the flashy display of wealth and power from the Silver Spires, along with her limited knowledge about them, eroded the confidence she had been carefully building over the past few weeks, particularly through her frequent interactions with Douglas, who often challenged her on various subjects. Looking up, she saw the Silver Spire airship, a weirdly ring-shaped contraption comprised of a metal tube suspended by hundreds of white balloons hovering above the White Stone Palace. The airship dwarfed the mountain prompting Stella to wonder how many Azure Crest cultivators were employed to keep it airborne. They refused to elaborate on the reason for their visit, whispered the Red Claw Grand Elder, his voice laced with fiery chi. Nor did they disclose who is coming. We can only hope it isn't one of the Silver Spire Grand Elder's children. They are absolute nightmares to deal with. Stella nodded, her gaze fixed on the gradually descending airship. It seemed destined to encircle the White Stone Palace like a ring. As time passed, Stella could only see the metal tube presumably the living quarters for the airship's inhabitants and the white balloons as they encapsulated her entire vision. A bridge made of metal slabs, connected by chains, shot out and anchored itself into the rock near the White Stone Palace's gate, its two large hooks digging deep into the mountain. Once this spectacle concluded, a hiss echoed as two sliding doors at the top of the bridge parted. A short child dressed in a white suit appeared, followed by a man who announced, Please welcome the seventh son of the Silver Spire Grand Elder. Riker von Silverspire. The Red Claw Grand Elder emitted a quiet groan, which Stella detected only because she stood beside him. His fears had materialized a son of the Silverspire Grand Elder had arrived. However, as Stella observed the child in the pristine white suit struggle to walk down the bridge, she couldn't help but think he was rather small. Was he merely five years old? What could he possibly be doing here? Everyone except Stella and the Red Claw Grand Elder offered the young Silverspire a modest bow as he passed. Eventually, the child and a weary-looking butler stood before them. Up close, Stella could appreciate their distinctive appearances. For instance, Riker's hair resembled iron threads, while the butler's hair looked like pure silver, accompanied by a stream of liquid silver orbiting around him. Please forgive my rudeness and unexpected arrival, Riker enunciated as clearly as a young child could, his voice betraying his youth with a lisp and high pitch. The Grand Elder gave the child a nod and turned to the butler clearly demanding an explanation with his gaze. Although the Silver Spire family was evidently far superior, Stella appreciated that they still showed some respect for the Red Claws on their own turf. There were certain circumstances that we hope you will understand after further discussion away from prying ears, the butler said, his expression grave. Would you please show us inside so we may discuss this further? Or would you prefer to board our airship and converse there? Inside is fine. Please, follow me the Grand Elder replied before leading the way into the White Stone Palace. Everyone bowed deeply as he passed. The butler gave Stella an odd look, which she felt was warranted, considering she was wearing a mask and had blonde hair that didn't match the rest of the Red Claws, but she still took issue with his attitude nonetheless. She is a trusted outsider, the Grand Elder explained as they traversed the empty hallways devoid of anything lavish. Big Sister, what's your name? Riker asked stumbling forward as he tried to keep up with the adult's brisk pace. Mine is Riker Vaughn. Yes, 
I heard the first time, Stella replied. My name is Stella. 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 Riker repeated her name a few times, seemingly committing it to memory. I like that name. Reminds me of the twinkling stars. Unsure of how to respond to such a compliment from a child, Stella remained silent. So. The Grand Elder inquired with his arms crossed. They all sat in a grand yet rather empty reception room. The Grand Elder's cultivation surrounded them, ensuring that no wandering spiritual sights below the Star Core realm could eavesdrop on their conversation. As previously mentioned, this is Riker von Silverspire, the seventh and youngest son of the Silverspire Grand Elder, the butler began. And my name is Sebastian Silverspire. I am from a branch family and have been entrusted with the young lord's safety. Stella glanced at Riker, who sat quietly on an ornate wooden chair beside Sebastian, swinging his short legs as he stared at the floor. Sebastian paused before leaning forward and continuing. As you may know, our family follows a similar but different cultivation path from many other families here in the Blood Lotus sect. We have to absorb the chi from metals matching our current realm. Do I need to explain more? Stella absent-mindedly nodded without thinking, as she really did want to know, so the man continued. Quick explanation then. Our soul cores are metal, and to upgrade to the next realm, we must condense our metal cores and transition them into a higher element. Copper represents the Qi realm, iron the soul fire realm, silver the star core realm, gold the nascent soul realm, and finally, platinum the monarch realm. However, that is just a speculative guess, as we haven't had someone manage to cultivate that far. Anyway, I digress. Sebastian gestured toward Riker. As you can see, the young lord resides in the lower stages of the Iron Core realm, or in your terms, the Soul Fire realm. As for myself, I am in the first stage of the Star Core realm, or in our terms, the Silver Core realm. Stella managed to conceal her surprise. She had been used to encountering families with one or perhaps two Star Core realm experts at most. But for the Silver Spire family to employ Star Core realm experts as bodyguards, they must have far more Star Core experts than the Red Claws, Evergreens, Winter Wraths, and Raveborns combined. To be in the Soul Fire realm at such a young age, the Grand Elder must be very pleased with Riker's performance thus far, the Red Claw Grand Elder mused, frowning. But I still don't see why you two invited yourselves here to Dark Light City, despite our informing you that the tournament has been postponed. Father is going golden. Riker announced, clenching his chubby fists. I must fight my scary brothers and sisters for the leftover silver. The Red Claw Grand Elder's eyes widened, but Stella had to admit she wasn't following the conversation at all. It's as you suspect, Grand Elder, Sebastian confirmed. Our beloved Grand Elder has entered seclusion in hopes of emerging triumphant and entering the nascent soul realm, or as we call it, the Golden Core realm. So this fight between siblings. The Grand Elder asked hurriedly. What does that refer to? If the Grand Elder is to succeed in his ascension to the Golden Core, instead of creating an infant soul, he will create a silver core that can be passed down to the next generation, Sebastian said, his expression darkening. Before going into seclusion, the Grand Elder declared he would pledge his newly created core to whichever of his children could generate the most profit for the Silver Spire family while he was in seclusion. If one of his children were to absorb this core, their cultivation would soar. The Red Claw Grand Elder leaned back in his seat next to Stella, letting out a long, drawn-out sigh that seemed to drain all his energy. So let me guess, Riker von Silverspire has come here in search of great profits. Sebastian nodded. All the children fought over which city they would conduct business in, and Riker drew the short straw at him, I mean, he was fortunate to draw Dark Light City, so here we are. I thought you said there was nothing here, Sebastian. Riker asked with childlike innocence. And you said on the airship that it was being run by a useless group of fire cultivators. Silence, Riker, before I take you back home, Sebastian glared at his young lord, causing the little boy to shrink back in his seat. Excuse him, Sebastian offered a weary smile. Some things are best left behind closed doors, don't you agree? The Red Claw Grand Elder's eye twitched from the words, but he quickly composed himself and asked seriously, So now that you're here, what do you plan to do? You know you can't just come and set up a business here on our land without our permission and paying taxes to us. I don't even know what any of that means, Riker grumbled as he crossed his arms. Mother thinks I'm a genius, but I only like to cultivate. What do I know about selling stuff? Sebastian reached over and patted the boy on his back. You may not win, 
but your mother believed this was an excellent opportunity to see the wider world and broaden your horizons. What kind of five-year-old should spend all day sitting on a mountain of chirich iron and cultivating? Stella decided to interject into the conversation with some questions of her own. Riker, besides the airship and Sebastian here, did you come with anything else? Maybe some starting capital or an idea of what business you want to do. Air. Riker twiddled his thumbs. Mother gave me some starting funds, which I'm pretty sure is against the rules, but all my siblings already had some money, and I had nothing, so it should be fine, right, Sebastian? Riker's mother gave him a thousand high-grade spirit stones and fifty thousand dragon crowns, Sebastian frowned. I do feel his mother was a little too enthusiastic about this contest, but it should be fine. So he's a rich fool that's more money than the ash-fallen head with all the stolen wealth combined, Stella thought to herself as she analyzed the boy. She was no business guru herself, but even she had some ideas for businesses. However, this kid seemed clueless. Could she somehow extract those spirit stones from his hands to create more runic formations for tree? So you came here with nothing but funds and the hopes of beating your well-established and richer older siblings. The Red Claw Grand Elder asked and groaned in despair a little when Riker nodded enthusiastically. The little boy then raised his hand. I did have one idea actually that my sister gave me when I drew this city. Oh. Sebastian asked, clearly intrigued. What is it? Alchemy. Riker exclaimed. I hate spending my allowance on expensive pills, so wouldn't it be awesome if I had my own alchemist? Also, my sister said those with the fire affinity make excellent alchemists. Sebastian's face darkened. Young lord, I'm not supposed to offer too much advice, but please remember your sister may love you very much, but she will still try to feed you bad information to win. Alchemy is, resource intensive, to say the least. Riker naively tilted his head. Does that mean it's expensive? I have a lot of money, though. And aren't you people having a tournament to find one? Can I, Air, hire the winner from the tournament? No, you can't, Stella snapped. The best alchemist is for us. You could hire the others that compete in the tournament, though. But I want the best one, Riker crossed his arms angrily as if someone had stolen his favorite toy. Stella took a breath to calm her thoughts before she accidentally revealed too much. What do you know about alchemy? Nothing. Riker grumbled. So how do you plan to train these alchemists or source the materials they need to perform alchemy? Stella inquired. As I said, I just like to cultivate all day. I have no idea about this stuff. The brat then looked at her with sparkling eyes. Big sister wearing the cool mask, what do you do? Well, I... Stella hesitated, unsure how to answer his childlike wonder. She wanted to head back to Red Vine Peak and ask Tree about his opinions on this. She saw an opportunity, but there were also massive risks. If the Silver Spire family came to know about Ash and his capabilities, it could be disastrous. Sebastian added, I'll be honest here. If you two can take Riker under your watchful eye and help him set up a profitable business, you will have gained great favor with a future elder of our family. If not its next leader. Stella found that hard to believe, looking at the little brat. And those were empty words to her as she planned to remain here through the beast tied with tree, so having a connection with a family planning to abandon this place was nearly useless. And if we refuse? The Red Claw Grand Elder asked, and Sebastian frowned. Then we will leave. We understand he is young and inexperienced, and to force him upon you would be impolite. Although, we still plan to set up a business here and pay the required tax. That sounds perfect. Hold on, Stella interrupted the Grand Elder. Let me go check with someone about this. I will be right back. As if on cue, a rift materialized in the middle of the Red Claw Grand Elder's protection field, as if it weren't even there. Through the portal was the view of the setting sun from atop a mountain and a weird mist. Under the confused gaze of both Sebastian and Riker, Stella stood up and gracefully walked through the portal, which collapsed behind her with a pop. Who is she? Sebastian asked, his gaze lingering on where the portal had been. Someone with an even more frightening background than your young lord, the Red Claw Grand Elder chuckled. Don't worry. She will be back with an answer that I'm sure will satisfy you both.